Good morning. My name is Jay Kurtzer. I'm director and senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies Humanitarian Agenda. I would like, on behalf of CSAS, to welcome everyone joining us today in person and virtually for our conference, Humanitarian Innovation in Action. I'd like to especially recognize uh, USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance uh, for making this conference possible through their generous support to CSAS. I also want to uh, thank my colleagues on the Humanitarian Agenda team, Jude Larnard, Harim Odella, Fiona Joseph, and Sierra Ballard, along with all the colleagues at CSAS who enable us to produce important conversations and discussions such as we're having today. Lastly, I want to extend gratitude to our panelists and keynote speakers who are joining us from Washington and elsewhere around the world. Before we begin our program, I want to share with you uh, some building safety precautions, take safety seriously at CSAS and in the humanitarian sector. Uh, in case of any sort of emergency, follow my instructions and take note of the emergency exits, like a flight attendant on my left, on my right, <laughs> and out that way. Uh, <laughs> today's conference focuses on exploring the effective, innovative, and scalable solutions to respond to, and more importantly, to hopefully prevent the most urgent humanitarian crises. Innovation is baked into the humanitarian sector since its inception as a formal, uh, as a formal sector. The concept of organized humanitarian assistance was in and of itself something of an innovation and in thought. And humanitarian actors have always sought ways to improve the delivery of aid to affected communities long before innovation emerged as a central theme at the World Humanitarian Summit. The innovation is now a key focus, and yet there remains to some degree a lack of consensus about what innovation entails, who's doing it, uh, there are misconceptions about who engages in innovation, where and how innovative ventures are lost. And for me, incredibly importantly, there is not really consensus about the ethical or principle frameworks that govern new ventures, new actors, new tools and techniques when they become engaged in the service of providing humanitarian assistance to at-risk populations. So at a time when the global needs are increasing substantially, the humanitarian innovation agenda, the project stakeholders' visions of improvement uh, can play a central role and a sustainable role in addressing humanitarian needs, but it requires additional thought. So that thought needs to identify what exactly the actors in the humanitarian sector expect innovation to deliver, how they deliver it, and to talk through why it matters. It's equally also important to examine the gaps and limitations of innovation and the potential challenges posed by the rapid institutionalization of this field. Additionally, we know that stakeholders within affected communities within the humanitarian sector and beyond also are expressing a growing recognition that local national actors should be at the forefront of humanitarian efforts writ large and the innovation agenda uh, more specifically. Local actors are the first to respond, have access to hard to reach areas in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, and their intimate access gives them unique insight into the most appropriate and needed innovative solutions. So today we're very lucky to be joined by speakers from Washington and around the world as far as Uganda, the United Kingdom, and Pakistan, who will share their expertise and insights on advancing the humanitarian innovation agenda. Our first panel, Transformation Through Humanitarian Innovation and Through Private Sector Engagement, will provide a broad overview of where progress has been made thus far and ways to further the agenda. The following panels will assess the role humanitarian innovation plays in uh, concepts like elevating women's leadership in humanitarian response, enhancing transparency in data and information management, one of the key issues today, and finally, in improving responses to forced displacement. And we'll have closing remarks by David Miliband, CEO of the International Rescue Committee, and uh, Dr. Abdi Razak uh, from the Federal Ministry of Health in Somalia. Today's panels will explore new concepts, ideas, and approaches. We do need to acknowledge the context that they're happening in. Humanitarian needs are rising rapidly uh, because of protracted conflicts in Afghanistan, Yemen, the Sahel, and elsewhere. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has created a devastating crisis with knock-on effects for global food security, and of course, the food security and climate crisis in the Horn of Africa is top of mind for us. So I want to acknowledge also the announcement of an additional $1.3 billion made by Administrator Power from the stage yesterday uh, to respond to that food security crisis, but to connect the dots and say it's the money at this point is not enough. We also need to think through the new, innovative, scalable solutions to that challenge. Before I turn to our keynote speaker, I also want to acknowledge the uh, support of some USAID colleagues that we've worked with to put the, today's event. And specifically, I want to flag uh, Lily Rosen uh, in the back corner here, who is really interested for you all to um, take time to speak with her 
Um, reflect on the ideas shared at this conference and your own ideas and use this opportunity to help build a network for innovation in Washington, D.C. And so our hope today is to explore the ways in which we can channel the financial and brain resources we have. And so without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Sarah Charles, Assistant to the Administrator at the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance to provide our opening remarks. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, <clears throat> excuse me. Good morning, it's an honor to join you to open up today's Humanitarian Innovation, Innovations in Action Conference. Thank you to CSIS for hosting us for this timely event and just on a personal note, thank you Jake. I know that you're um, moving out to Tanzania in the next few weeks, but uh, just you've been a phenomenal partner to USAID, to the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, um, and an important voice in the humanitarian community, um, certainly driving a conversation here in Washington and beyond around um, ways that we need to uh, press the, uh, the humanitarian system forward to be more accountable to effective populations and to innovate, which we'll be talking about today. So just on a personal note, all the best in your next, um, next phase. We've really, really valued the partnership here. Um, as Jake mentioned, this has been an incredibly challenging year globally. Just yesterday, I was here at CSIS with Administrator Power as she laid out the severe and far-reaching effects of Russia's war in Ukraine, coming on the heels of the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, long-term complex emergencies, multi-season droughts, and other climatic shocks have pushed the world into a global food security crisis. The numbers are staggering. Up to 40 million people could be thrust into poverty and food insecurity in 2022 as a result of the war, and 75 to 95 million more people could be propelled into extreme poverty by the combined effects of the war, pandemic, inflation, and beyond. The humanitarian crises we face today are protracted and complex. They live at the intersection of seemingly intractable political, social, economic, and environmental challenges. The global humanitarian system has incredible breadth and depth. But today's crises reveal the profound challenges that societies face and the limits and constraints of humanitarian assistance alone in meeting people's needs. There are no quick fixes to today's challenges. Innovation is not going to solve protracted crises, aid obstruction, or repeated climate shocks. But it can help us solve the dysfunctions in the system born of our own systems, processes, and mindsets. So at USAID's Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, even as we respond to crises every day, we're seeking to help build the future of humanitarian aid. We're doing this through ambitious commitments and new approaches to localization, climate adaptation and disaster risk reduction, protection, and critically, our increasing focus as an agency to support progress, not just programs. Innovation plays a critical role in this endeavor. It welcomes new thinking, approaches, and partners. It can enhance the effectiveness of assistance, enabling us to achieve greater outcomes and scale. We see innovation as a response to complex problems, problems that require us to learn and adapt so that we can deliver the most effective response possible for people living through crises. While we embrace new technologies, we don't see innovation as synonymous with technology. In fact, sometimes the most powerful innovation is the simplest one. One only need to look at humanitarian context to see some of the most incredible examples of human ingenuity, resilience, and creativity. But it matters who defines and prioritizes humanitarian problems and who's designing solutions. In our work with the MIT D-Lab and local NGO, the Youth Social Advocacy Team in South Sudan, conflict-affected people set their priorities and design their solutions in Jonglei State. Results show that when people design their own solutions, adoption of those solutions significantly increase. Out of the 11 tools for economic resilience designed in the program, nine are actively now on the market. When we design humanitarian services, how we listen and learn is also critical. Solutions have to be compatible with the material reality, preferences, and contextual challenges of conflict-affected populations. That's why BHA supports the development, testing, and adaptation of innovations so that they're well-suited to the environment. Through our work with accelerators, like Creating Hope in Conflict, a Humanitarian Grand Challenge, 
When the white helmets were funded to establish the first local manufacturing center for PPE equipment in Syria at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, adaptive design resulted in face masks and shields designed for healthcare workers who wear the hijab. Some of the most innovative, even simple solutions in the humanitarian sector have come from listening and learning, multi-purpose cash being king among them. We started supporting cash because people told us they wanted to be able to get what they need, when and where they want it, and because they demonstrated that beneficiaries themselves can be the best stewards of aid dollars. Today, cash is an essential tool in the humanitarian toolkit and a key part of our response to the global food security crisis, including a key part of the 1.2 billion in new funding for the Horn of Africa that Administrator Power announced today and that Jake mentioned earlier. Yesterday, Administrator Power also announced a new $200 million contribution to UNICEF to supercharge the ready-to-use therapeutic food, or RUTF, pipeline. Two decades ago, RUTF was an innovation that rocked the humanitarian world, a therapeutic paste made of simple and nutritious shelf-stable ingredients that, if delivered correctly, would save the lives of 90% of severely malnourished children that receive treatment. The next innovation we need now is not necessarily new products, but rather new ways of reaching the one in four severely malnourished children that are currently not in treatment. <clears throat> Approaches that respond to the lived experience and constraints of the parents of malnourished children and the community health workers that solve the, serve them. Of course, it's not enough just to listen and learn. Conflict and disaster affected people must also see positive change from the innovations that we deploy. This is among the reasons we fund research to evaluate the effectiveness of new approaches in humanitarian work. With climate change increasing and intensifying natural disasters, we believe that the growing field of anticipatory action is critical for effective and cost-effective response. Moving from pilot to scale involves not just investment in data or new financial tools, although these are both critical, but also looking at how people experience these innovations. Our partners at Tufts University are working with six universities around the world to undertake rigorous impact evaluations of anticipatory action, which include hearing from the people that rely on early warning systems. This kind of research provides us with the empirical evidence about whether our investment in a new way of working is actually improving lives. We also seek to innovate how we measure the progress of our efforts to improve the humanitarian system. In partnership with the World Food Program's Innovation Hub in East Africa, We've deplo deployed new monitoring and evaluation measures to better support entrepreneurs who are part of WFP's Ignite Food System Challenge. Instead of measuring success as how well we move along the standard work plan, we measure how many changes were made to program design based on feedback from partners and how program design evolved to better serve the needs of local entrepreneurs and women-led innovation teams. Innovating requires us to view failures as opportunities to adapt and find new ways to measure and define success. Changing the way we work can also mean adopting tools and technologies that enable more effective operations and assistance. The Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs Digital Strategy Action Plan is our roadmap for leveraging digital technology to help us transform humanitarian assistance. Digital technologies allow us to collect information, connect, and communicate at a scale and pace that was previously unimaginable. These technologies have transformed the experience of crisis for impacted communities who increasingly rely on digital channels for life-saving information, much of it user-generated, to connect with family and friends, and to make decisions after displacement and disaster. I saw this firsthand in the Philippines and Indonesia last month, where we've invested in digital platforms that crowdsource data and deliver real-time information ahead of, during, and after typhoons, earthquakes, and flooding. Investment in real-time data analytics can inform rapid and flexible program design, allow us to listen to those we serve, and even provide a way to deliver assistance digitally. Meanwhile, we have to constantly adopt, adapt to enhance data privacy protocols and safeguard affected populations. The complexity of challenges faced by crisis-affected people today cannot be overstated. Russia's war in Ukraine has revealed the incredible power of non-state actors, digital technologies, and cyber intervention in warfare and humanitarian relief. And as drought ravages East Africa and climate change affects communities and economies worldwide, we'll need to rethink agricultural patterns and practices, supply chains, and trade policy. To effectively meet the challenges of an uncertain and deeply interconnected world, we need to engage the whole system. 
We're exploring what it looks like to convene the whole system around solving some of these humanitarian challenges. Take Bangladesh, for example, which is facing three overlapping challenges. The Rohingya crisis, climate-related vulnerability, and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. A traditional humanitarian response to these challenges will never be sufficient. That's why our work with the Global Knowledge Initiative in Bangladesh looks not at specific innovators or innovations, but at an enabling environment for innovation to thrive. Rather than humanitarian actors alone devising more effective responses, GKI is convening humanitarian organizations, civil society, local, regional, and national governments, universities, and the private sector to determine how they can individually and collectively support and scale innovation locally. Each of these groups of actors has their own skills and comparative advantages that they bring to bear. We're also working to make sure a diverse set of voices are embedded within local systems so that innovations are inclusive and holistic. We've co-designed a competitive pri prize with the Creating Hope in Conflict that incentivizes and rewards women-led and locally-led innovation teams who work to strengthen local systems and networks amplify, and amplify the voices and priorities of conflict-affected populations. Our vision for the future is to bring a new set of problem solvers to the table and to listen, learn, and perhaps hardest of all, at times be led by them. To make the changes internally, often the most painful ones to make, that enable us to work differently, to engage the whole ecosystem in solutions, and most importantly, to put people with the lived experience of crisis at the center of the structures and incentives in our system. It's not a given that humanitarian innovation will fulfill its potential and address the challenges of the sector. Innovation necessarily involves risk, often magnified by rapidly changing technology. We need to leverage the opportunities of emerging technology without marginalizing those that don't have access to it and without putting those who do have access to it at risk. We must learn from the private sector approaches and models for innovation, but recognizes that these approaches will not be relevant for all people and in all of the places that we work. And we must accept higher levels of risk as we try new ways of working, but not transfer that risk to the communities that we serve. I very much look forward to hearing from the panelists today what they see as the opportunities, risks, and challenges in our sector, and what might become possible if we create the space for people to imagine and build a more effective and more just humanitarian system. Thank you so much for that uh, comprehensive remarks and for your kind comments and spoiler alert, I'm moving to Tanzania. Uh, was that not no, public? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very excited. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, first and foremost, you talked about um, a lot of your partners that you're working with, the WFP Innovation Hub, um, MIT, who we'll hear from in the next panel and, and others. but. Um, one of the things that I always think about is that sometimes the humanitarian sector seems like it sits alone uh, within the U.S. government context. And innovation is something that the entirety of the U.S. government is thinking about, business sectors, you know, the whole world is trying to adapt to new technologies. So can you talk a little bit about how BHA's efforts to innovate um, fit into the wider U.S. government's efforts to transform the way it works? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's certainly, we have, we have the great challenge and benefit of standing up as a new bureau in the midst of um, COVID, which, you know, in many ways um, radically transformed the way that we worked in the, in the U.S. government. And I think not unlike, I'm sure, a lot of your organizations, um, that came with, of course, immense challenges, but also opportunities. And I think the, the biggest opportunity was the, the flattening we saw between Washington and, um, and our colleagues who work around the world. And so, you know, this is something that I think is being felt across the U.S. government is how, how do we, um, I think colloquially in the U.S. government, we, we call it return to work, but really how do we return to the office um, while maintaining some of the, the flexibility and, and frankly, um, most critically, I think the flattening that came with, um, came with being forced to uh, forced to take a lot of our, our work online, um, which again created challenges, but but really um, built built connectivity. I think again with with a number of our colleagues that are working um, working around the world and between them and a number of of their partners, um, which I think in the U.S. government was 
you know, again, particularly critical at a time when we're coming off of about 10 to 15, even 20 years where um, the, the work of, of our colleagues has increasingly come behind embassy, embassy walls in a way that I think is, is really quite frustrating to many, um, many of our colleagues, but, um, but again, uh, has created some opportunities in this time, uh, time of online work to, to connect in a more, more meaningful way with a lot of our, our partners. Um, I also think you know, there's just been a tremendous conversation um, inside of the US government, but really uh, around the country and around the world about diversity, equity, and inclusion coming out of um, these last few years. And while um, much of that discussion at USAID and in the US government has been around our own workforce, our own practices, I think with, uh, within the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, we've also used this dialogue as a way to open up the conversation about accountability to affected populations, about localization, and about changing power dynamics um, around the table. And then maybe finally, I would say, you know, I think we've we've watched a real roller coaster um, uh, around uh, over the last even five or six months in um, in new financial tools. You know, we've seen um, seen the 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 kind of bubble burst around um, crypto and and other um, other uh, monetary tools that you know again I think. Uh, have shown some um, some glimmers of promise in the humanitarian sphere, but also come with come with real risks. And so, you know, our work at the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, looking at some of these new products, new technologies, is very much grounded in a wider effort at USAID and, and a wider effort across the U.S. government um, under an executive an executive order um, around these tools. Looking again at kind of the promise. Um, and the risk of, of these tools, what, what some of the new regulatory requirements could or should be, how to, um, how to, uh, how to potentially take advantage of, of, um, of the promise of these tools without, again, transferring risk onto the populations that we work with. Thanks. You talked about, again, these, these partners, and there's certainly always a push and pull between donors pushing partners or partners pulling. And so I'm, I'm curious, how have partners responded to your efforts to push them towards innovation? And in terms of the private sector, not just as a resource uh, for humanitarian actors, but as an actor itself, what are some of the challenges bringing in these new actors? And are there any other successes you'd like to highlight? Yeah, um, maybe I'll start with the, with the private sector piece. I, I, um, in the, in the midst of everything going on in the world, I um, recently traveled to the Philippines and Indonesia um, really to focus um, on, on kind of uh, the important, if, if not the, the urgent, a, a lot of our work um, around localization, around disaster risk reduction, and around climate adaptation. And I think in a place like the Philippines, you have a real model of how the private sector can be um, very much integrated into um, both efforts to, uh, to address disaster risk reduction, but also humanitarian response, not as, not as alternative sources of funding, but as real partners in response that are looking at um, resilience of supply chains, that are looking at um, early warning systems, that are looking at um, climate adaptation. I think there are models there that have um, coming out of the World Humanitarian Summit, there have been efforts by OCHA and others to replicate that on a global scale, but I think we, we still do um, have a lot more work to do to take our relationship with the private sector from one of kind of seeking funding to one of, of partnership. And I, I do think the, the disaster risk reduction, the climate adaptation space is a space that's really ripe for this because there's very much shared interest between the humanitarian sector and the private sector around issues of market resilience, around issues of supply chain resilience, around issues of, of early warning. Yeah. I certainly think it requires a cultural shift on the part of humanitarian actors. We, we saw in a trip to uh, Nigeria, looking at the crisis in the Northeast, that uh, electrification, which was a huge problem, there was the private sector of Nigeria, which is incredibly vibrant, was looking into electrification for their own, you know, as a, as a commercial enterprise, and yet the dialogue between what the humanitarian community needed for protection for basic quality of life and what the private sector was doing just wasn't advanced enough to incorporate them. So I want to ask you maybe, pivoting off of that, when you think about um, 
innovations, bringing in the private sector. You talked about DEI, you talked about localization, you talked about accountability and, and people-centered um, thinking, but are there other unique sectoral challenges that we have in the humanitarian sector that you're thinking about? And I'm thinking maybe about protection concerns or principles and, and how we can integrate you know, the thinking of this community with the thinking of the new actors. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, this, the protection concerns, I think, have to be central to any conversation that we're having about innovation. And I think it comes in in a few different places. One, um, I think there's been a pretty ripe conversation in recent years, um, but much more is needed around data protection, data privacy, around um, kind of informed consent. Um, these are populations that are um, have a tremendous, on the one hand, have a tremendous amount of agency or are, um, are um, of course, agents uh, of their own, uh, of their, their own lives, but in, in many cases are highly dependent on the international community, which I think raises the bar for um, our, uh, our work on, on norms, on, um, on best practice, uh, and on communication to ensure that, again, we're not transferring the risk of this technology onto populations um, without, without that dialogue and, and consent. Um, and then, you know, I think the other protection dimension is um, there's disparate ac access to technology. So, you know, as we, um, again, we kind of touched on, on crypto, and I remember the very early days of the Ukraine crisis, I was getting a lot of incoming and, and questions from people outside of the humanitarian, you know, are there ways that we can use crypto to get resources to, um, to populations inside of Ukraine? And, you know, really in conversation with our team, the, these issues base, beg the question about, you know, who has access to this kind of technology? Is there an ecosystem that, um, that can support this kind of technology? Um, are the most vulnerable going to be able to take advantage of, of this kind of technology? And of course, we've, we've seen other risks associated with, with moving in that direction as well. But you know, even the, the cash conversation, I think we have a tendency, it's an incredible innovation in the sector, one that we're very supportive of. Um, but when we look at the specific modalities of how to deliver cash, we're very conscious and we work very closely with our partners on um, in, in, uh, in using uh, various modalities, who's, who's potentially left behind and how, to, how do we ensure that it's not, not the most vulnerable. If I can trouble you for one more question. Sure. You know, they, they say, um, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 50 years ago, and the second best time is today, right? <laughs> so if you think about a vision of what a transformed BHA or a transformed sector looks like, do, do you have that vision? And if so, what should we be thinking about 10 years ago, and what should we be thinking about today and tomorrow to try to get there? I mean, I, I think there, there are two uh, kind of two big trains we're trying to drive at, drive at the same time. Um, one, is, uh, one is around localization and really uh, thinking about that in a very holistic way. So it's not just about money transfer to local NGOs that become you know, local versions of, of big international NGOs, but really looking, although Transferring the resources is a big is a big part of it, um, but really looking at how to center local voices in decision making and leading of humanitarian response, um, and innovation certainly has a role to play in that. Um, the other piece, and I touched on a little bit, is you know how do we move much more towards anticipatory action, and I think the. Um, the role of, of climate change, but it's not just about climate impacts, um, uh, has, has highlighted the import of, of moving early, responding early to save lives. And, you know, I think in, in our world, one of the great innovations of, again, several decades ago was the famine early warning system coming out of the um, drought and, and famine and in the Horn uh, nearly 35, 40 years ago, um, but that, you know, that early warning has not yet tra tra translated to the early release of resources in a consistent and predictable way. And so I think one of the, the big innovations over the next, uh, you know, next four or five years will be um, certainly looking at how, how do we move resources um, early, um, where they're needed, 
um, and how are those steered by, by the people that are closest to, to the challenges. Well, Sarah, thank you very much for being here today, for your support and partnership, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. For the rest of us, we're going to take a 10-minute break. We'll come back here at 9.45 for our first panel. We'll hear from, from among others, the MIT D-Lab, the Response Innovation Lab. So um, please feel free to grab coffee and, and drinks, and we'll meet back here at 9.45. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for um, being here again, and thank you to people joining us. Uh, online, virtually, and particularly to our co-panelists who are joining us virtually from, uh, from Uganda and soon from the United Kingdom. Um, I'll spare uh, extended opening remarks because I already made mine. Um, but we have um, a really distinguished panel here right now um, to talk about humanitarian innovation and in, um, in broad strokes, but also to touch on the issues around engaging the private sector. Uh, we're joined by Charlene Cavett, manager for the Response Innovation Lab in Uganda. Charlene is a humanitarian worker who has served at the UN World Food Program in Central African Republic, Chad, Senegal, and at their HQ. Um, on my right is Zaid Hassan, co-founder and CEO of 10 and 10. Zaid is a strategist, facilitator, and writer, spending the last 20 years developing responses to complex social challenges, and is the author of The Social Labs Revolution a new approach to solving our most complex challenges. Uh, on my left is Amy Smith, founding director of the MIT D-Lab, an innovative university-based program. Amy's also a senior lecturer at MIT and is the founder, there we go, of uh, the International Development Design Summit, co-founder of the MIT Ideas Global Challenge, of Rethink Relief Conference, and is the originator of the Creative Capacity Building Methodology, Amy was selected as a MacArthur Fellow in 2004 and named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2010. And we'll be joined as well by Ben Ramalinga, a senior leader, strategist, author, specializing in international humanitarian and development work. Uh, ben leads the pilot phase of the UK's Humanitarian Innovation Hub, oversees a global portfolio of strategic projects, and in 2020, Ben was named a Humanitarian Changemaker of the Decade and has also authored two books, including Aid on the Edge of Chaos. So a really distinguished panel. Let me start with you, Zaid. Um, the humanitarian sector is fundamentally reactive. Crisis breaks out, system turns forward. But innovation as a field, I think, is designed about thinking proactively about trends, capabilities, challenges. Can you speak to the way in which your work seeks to move from that reactive to proactive model in thinking about humanitarianism and what we as a sector should be thinking about now? Yeah, thanks. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, good to be here. Good to see everyone. Um, so I think, I think you know the the way I would um, I understand your question is there's a there's a, a challenge for all of us to be strategic in response to the challenges that we are seeing and witnessing, and I think part of the problem is that um, you know we have a fairly good idea of what's coming down the pipeline in some ways, uh, and uh, looking at it is kind of scary. Uh, so the issue is you know how do we look down you know how do we look down river if you like and you know, um, we know kind of, or how do we look up over and we, we know what's kind of coming down, if you like, towards us. Um, and how, how, do we, how do we take a strategic view rather than just purely reactive view in terms of, you know, look, this is going to happen. When it happens, we're going to do something. And I think the climate crisis is a really key example of that, which is that, you know, we, we're kind of getting a fairly good inkling as to what is going to happen and what is going to happen that's going to impact the humanitarian sector profoundly. Um, and the question is, what do we do about it? And what do we do about it in time, rather than wait for things to hit and challenges to happen? So I think that's, uh, you know, and the way we work um, is that um, we're, we're working on a response to the climate crisis that has been kind of in the making for a long time. And it's basically a distributed response um, where essentially uh, the whole is not subject to, if you like, um, you know, uh, centralized decision making. It's a decentralized response. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to be strategic, we're trying to be um, responsive well in advance, kind of, you know, we know what's coming three or four years down the line. How do we build the capacities and the capabilities today for what's coming in four or five or ten years, basically? Let me go to you, Charlene, and thank you so much for joining us from Kampala. Can you tell us a bit about the Response Innovation Lab, 
the priorities that you're working on in Kampala and the way in which you see innovation manifesting in Uganda or East Africa more broadly? Thanks, Jacob. Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to join the discussion. Um, so from the Response Innovation Lab side, we are a global collaboration that was launched by Oxfam, Save the Children, World Vision, and Civic. And we have moved into becoming a, a network of field labs that focus on uh, breaking silos to support the humanitarian innovation space in different crises. In Uganda specifically, we've been active for five years, supported by Save the Children, our founding and, and hosting entity. And we are specifically focusing on the refugee response space. Uganda hosts 1.4 million refugees. Um, and more specifically, we are looking at this humanitarian development nexus and how innovation can play a role in this protracted crisis context where some of the refugees that live in Uganda have been here for 12 years. Um, there is no chances for return there in a very short term and there is um, a reduction on funding flows while people keep coming into the country. So our priority really is to try and find ways to encourage more durable solutions, alternative to traditional ways of delivering humanitarian assistance so that communities impacted by this crisis find ways to um, access better services, um, transformed livelihoods, market opportunities, and be able to, to move towards self-reliance. And we work across different sectors to, to do that, because of course it links to maybe agriculture, but it can also link to um, financial inclusion, very critical area. Um, so this is very specific to Uganda, but what we are seeing in terms of trends is that there is a very rich ecosystem in Uganda and the same can be said for several other countries in East Africa. Uh, a lot of innovation coming up in Kenya, in Rwanda, even in Somalia where we have a, another lab and which is often thought of, um, it is often not, um, doesn't come to mind uh, as a priority when you think about it, an innovative place, but very rich uh, ecosystems of academic partners and startups that have an, an ambition for social impact. And what we can do as Response Innovation Labs and other partners is find a way to bring those non-traditional actors to the table and contribute their creativity to this discussion on, on the solutions we can bring to the people who need them. Thanks, Charlene. Um, Amy, much of the discourse around innovation focuses on the system or large structural changes. Um, how does the MIT DLAB view this question of innovation and transformation and why? Great. Um, thanks so much for the question and also for um, in inviting um, DLAB to be here. So um, uh, we're very much grateful for the opportunity. Um, so I, you know, when we think about transformation, I tend to think about it as, you know, in order for there to be long-term sustainable positive change, that there needs to be um, sort of transformation on the institutional level, on the systemic level, but also on the community level and the individual level. And, um, and those are the levels where we tend to, um, to focus more on the individual and community level. And I, I would, you know, when you ask why, I think a lot of that comes back to my experiences um, where many of my most meaningful experiences were where I had the opportunity to use my creativity to, um, to solve a problem. Um, and, you know, as a mechanical engineer, when I built something and it worked, I mean, what, how many people have made something and had it work? And how do you feel, right? It's awesome. Yeah, and, and, you know, and fundamentally, there are these untangible benefits of, um, of design and innovation, which are around the sense of agency that you feel by solving a problem with your own in ingenuity, the, um, the joy that you feel by creating something that works. And these intangible benefits, I believe, are the sort of the necessary uh, foundational transformation, which is ne uh, needed in order to then transform the community. And then you, when you have that aligned with systemic and, um, and uh, 
institutional transformation, then I think you have things that stick. I think if there's transformation at the institutional level and you're just giving people new things, I think that that doesn't change their position and where they are. It doesn't change the way they think about where they're going. And I think that that's really um, important. And if you would grant me the liberty, I, I just have a little demonstration which of a technology which will be a little challenging with this, but I think I'm going to do an innovation and do that. Okay, so. <laughs> In, in much of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, women uh, spend hundreds of hours removing the kernels of corn um, from an ear of corn, right? And it is, it is both tedious. Whenever you talk to women, they always start rubbing their thumbs. And, um, but they're, and it, it's hard work. I'm not just playing at it here. Uh, usually I'm better at this. Um, but there's this technology, which is a very simple technology. It's a ring of plastic with these ridges inside of it. And it fundamentally changes the way that corn is shelly. Yeah, and I see my African colleagues saying, I want one for my mother, don't you? <laughs> yes, exactly. And in fact, um, everyone, you know, when they see it, they want one. But you can't necessarily start a plastic manufacturing site. So what we've done is we redesigned it. We have a little machine here that allows you to put the um, grooves into a piece of scrap metal. And then you can make your own maize sheller. So part of the trainings that we do, on the very first day, we teach everyone how to make this maize sheller. And just imagine now that you're a 50-year-old woman who has never held a tool in her hands in her life. And then, in less than an hour, you use a hammer, uh, pliers, uh, files, uh, uh, what else, <laughs> tin snips, etc., in order to make this device. And then you go home, doubling the work, cleanup work, but anyway. You go home and you are able to save like literally 100 hours of labor every year. You do not think about yourself in the same way ever again. And in fact, that's what we see is these women come back to the shop and they're making now furniture for their home. They're doing these things. The men in the community are creating their own um, income generating um, uh, devices, whether it's a groundnut sheller or a um, cassava grater or creating things that are higher tech like solar, phone chargers, et cetera. But this idea of I can do it and I can choose what I want to make, I think that that is fundamentally important to the transformation that changes the way that refugees are, right? So that they are not constantly thought of as vulnerable populations, but creative, capable populations who are active contributors. So um, yeah, so that's my extended remarks. <laughs> No, thank you. That's, it's so important. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I'm really, you, you asked me about bringing, bringing the toys, and I think this is great because I think it's really, it's, it, it concretizes some of the ideas that we talk about, and I think in more abstract terms. And I, I like this idea of agency that, that you talked about and, and individuals, um, you know, not just being handed tools to solve the problem, but, but making their own. So I might want to come back to you, Zaid, and, and talk about the Gigaton Challenge. And, um, you know, if, if you could tell us a little bit about that, but also, you know, where this concept of agency fits in, in terms of, you know, not just a top-down approach to solving our biggest challenges, but, you know, asking folks to get involved and solve the challenges themselves. Yeah, so... Um one thing uh, about the climate crisis is that it's huge, it's big, it's out of our hands. We know we can't, we can't deal with it. So in my work in the climate space over the last kind of 15 years, the, the bulk of responses that I've seen, if you like, the, the bulk of energy have gone into policy responses in the sense that, you know, if we can shift the policy landscape, if we can make policy changes, um, then we're good. Uh, and as we have seen over the last couple of days, those policy changes are kind of fragile. They can happen, they can not happen. Uh, so part of the part of the response uh, that we've designed with the Gigaton Challenge is what does a distributed response look like that um, is in the hands of people, where in the sense we don't have to wait for uh, a policy shift to happen. Um, and if you look at the last kind of 30 years of the climate crisis, um, uh, of the last 30 years, 50% of global emissions have happened since we have known that we've got a problem. Since we've since the first kind of UN uh, FCCC conference in Rio. Uh, we've basically been unable to respond. So 
so the, the Gigaton challenge is essentially a distributed response. What we do is we essentially mobilize, train, and finance teams on the ground. Um, we give teams targets, and they basically meet targets. So these targets are abatement targets, equity targets, and time targets, so temporal targets. Um, and, and the idea is that um, anyone can start doing it. So we've got teams in Uganda, we've got teams in, uh, in Zimbabwe, we've got teams in Jordan, we've got teams in India. And basically all teams start at level one. Um, so they have to abate one ton of emissions within two weeks. Uh, at level two, it's 10 tons. And then from level three, uh, it's 10 tons a month. And then they also have an equity target. So they also have to provide benefits, direct benefits to 100 families in the bottom 20% income bracket. Those direct benefits are either part-time employment, food security, or energy security. So they're very tangible benefits. Um, and the, and the, the, the theory, if you like, the math behind um, Gigaton is that if you've got enough people, enough teams performing at a certain level, you bend the curve on the climate crisis in terms of abatement numbers, but also equity numbers. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is what we're doing. And the idea is that um, if we have... You know, the, the numbers would say that if we have 2,000 teams around the world performing at a certain level, you have essentially bent the curve on the climate crisis. So um, I, I think we're joined now by Ben. So I want to um, give an opportunity to, to join the conversation. Um, ben, you've been working on uh, issues of humanitarian innovations for nearly 15 years and, and drafted one of the first papers highlighting the need for new thinking and engagement on the issue. So maybe if you could pull back for us a little bit um, and give us the lay of the land in terms of what has changed since you started to work on this issue and what hasn't. Sure, thanks. And I hear, sorry about the technical issues. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, so I guess in the time that you described, Jake, and that we've been talking about, I guess there's been an endless litany of innovations in almost every aspect of humanitarian work from food security to water and sanitation, to health, to disaster prevention. And within humanitarian organizations, you've got a lot of innovations in process, internal processes, like coordination, accountability, learning, information, evidence. And I think across all of that work, I think there's two messages that come through really clearly today. First, there is a mantra that innovation is essential for us to meet the shortfalls of the system. But that mantra is something of an empty one. We spend much less than 1% of humanitarian spend on research and development globally. And if you compare this to other industries, we're equivalent to quite well-established, heavy, and, and quite conservative sectors with a small c. The closest comparator in financial terms is paper pulping. And, you know, no offense to any of the really creative paper pulpers out there, but that industry is not famous for its originality mm -hmm. or dynamism. The, the second point is, um, and this is really building on the points that were already made by Amy, that if we're going to be serious about transformational innovation, we need to change our approach to innovation. And we need to really anchor ourselves in the, in the understanding that the, the most significant innovations have not been technological necessarily. They're the ones that have been fundamentally about rethinking the relationships and the dynamics between the aid sector and those people we seek to serve. So whether it's about giving communities cash instead of giving them goods to empower them to become agents in their recovery, while at the same time re-energizing markets and businesses to drive growth, whether it's about giving poor parents the means to treat malnutrition at home before it becomes severe, to reduce the costs of treatment, expand coverage and reduce rates of death globally. Whether we see techno digital technologies not as a means to accelerate our own aid processes, but as a means of empowering communities, building financial access and paying for things securely and safely. I think genuine humanitarian innovation requires that innovation be developed into goods and services of the kind that Amy demonstrated, that, that can be accessed and afforded directly by vulnerable and excluded groups and giving them the motivation and capability to use that innovation. And there are all kinds of po political barriers to that thrown up by the system and by the socioeconomic systems in which those communities live their lives. And because of those political challenges, the vast majority of humanitarian innovation investments have been shallow technological solutions that skim the surface of existing status quo or even worse, reinforce it. Um, and I think that the, the, real, the real issue that we face at the moment is, you know, we, 
And this is the big reason why we shouldn't treat humanitarian innovation as a silver bullet that needs to be discovered and used to change the sector. We shouldn't be seeing innovation as a way of grafting you know, new gizmos onto an otherwise unchanged operational business model, because down that road, silver bullets become red herrings. And I think actually what we need to see is humanitarian innovation is less a search for the holy grail and more of a magna carta, more of a set of principles and behaviours that guide collective action across a whole range of parties, agreeing to share power and resources for the common good. And I think, uh, I just want to close with this quote, and it's from Albert Einstein, and he said, it's become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. And he was talking about militarization, but I think it's actually true of all so-called humane sectors where technology is taking root. And at its best, humanitarian innovation is an attempt to rebalance our technology and our humanity. It's an attempt to create a new kind of common good in our sector about not reinforcing the existing power dynamics, but challenging and upending them. And it means putting the power of innovation as close to the front line, as close to the community as possible, and see what might emerge as a result. Thanks, Ben. I, there's, a lot, there's a lot there that we can unpack. And so I might maybe first turn to Charlene. And, and you know, Ben talked about it's not the tools, it's the change of thinking and, and a roadmap. But we have an audience here of humanitarian practitioners and so I want to, you know, maybe turn to Charlene and then to, to Amy and Zaid. And what should humanitarian actors look to um, innovation for? I mean, you know, either in terms of thinking or in terms of, of products. Charlene, from your perspective, you know, what, what do you look to, quote unquote, innovation um, for what purpose? Thanks, Jacob. And I have to say that um, I was noting a lot of what uh, Ben was saying really resonates with with why Response Innovation Lab was launched and the, the mandate we're trying to bring to different um, emergency responses. And I think one of the um, critical, maybe I'll mention some two of the critical mind shifts we have to have as humanitarians when we are thinking about innovating. Um, one of them would have to be to stop wanting to be the innovator ourselves necessarily. Um, there is, there is maybe sometimes a tendency to think uh, we will develop fully from zero the right solution and a sort of um, siloed approach of not being uh, able and willing to see what is out there, the creativity in the community amongst um, other players in the ecosystem that can really make a contribution that have already been working on something relevant or maybe looking at other country contexts. So one of the critical um, ways to think about innovating for, for the humanitarian space requires a bit of humility and thinking about how we can bring other expertise to the table and join forces to solve problems. Um, the other also really critical thing to, to have in mind is that we need to work on solving problems that matter and really be ready to, to sweat doing so. Um, having a small six months innovation pilot in your portfolio, a shiny digital tool in your funding proposal is not gonna get you the change you need uh, for the communities. And embarking on a true innovation journey really takes dedication and the understanding that um, it takes a, a village to raise the child, right? We always hear that, but it also takes the whole ecosystem that's enabling for an innovation to flourish, and it, it requires a long-term investment. Um, and Ben mentioned a lot of very interesting trends that um, have, have improved our sector, internal looking trends. At Response Innovation Lab, we focus on the community facing innovations, but very often what we see is that while you work on those outward facing innovations, you have as an organization to change, you have to increase your risk appetite and you have to be ready to evolve so that you can really go on that journey um, and, and learn and be more um, creative. Maybe I can turn to um, you, Zaid, and, and what should humanitarians look to innovation or the innovation sector for? Yeah, so, um, you know, the way um, 
I think about innovation is that it's a practice. Um, and so, you know, we, we heard about tools and we heard about principles and, and one uh, analogy, if you like, or not analogy, one, one practice we're all familiar with is cooking. So if you think, man, cooking is a practice, you have tools, you have recipes, you have processes, you, know, you have spaces. Um, and obviously the only way to get good at cooking is to cook. <laughs> you can't read a book and be like, you know, I now know how to cook. So in terms of, you know, uh, first of all, what is innovation? I would say it's a practice. Um, the other thing I would just say is that I think that, um, um, you know, the, the demonstration that we just saw is really, really interesting. And I think that um, with Gigaton, for example, a lot of people say to us, you know, well, what is the innovation? And what we say is the innovation is the team, basically. So it's a bit like, you know, it's the people who are sitting around the table, not what's happening in the middle of the table, and that's the innovation. And again, in terms of what you were saying, it's the, it's the capacities that you engender, it's, what, it's the shifts that happen to, you know, to people when they go through the process of, you know, building a tool or making a tool and so on. So what I would kind of say is that... Um, you know, the innovation is really the practice. It's practice, and it's the teams who are doing the practice. And really, I think that, that, that what we need to look to um, uh, innovation for is teams that are cap capable of responding to complex, cha fast-changing situations and contexts. And if you manage to create those teams, then you've got something that is responsive and um, can uh, shift the situation. So I would say that... Um, should look to uh, innovation to create teams, basically. It's a bit like teams practicing innovation is what we need, really. Great, thanks. Amy? Thanks, there's a, uh, uh, so building off of the, the previous comments, I, I think um, one of, there's two frameworks that I think can be very useful when you're thinking about innovation. Um, one is this uh, idea of that innovation um, there are products and processes of innovation, and that those are both really important. And they, you know, and that's similar to what you're talking about. You know, the the team that's doing the innovation, and so I think it's really important to think about which of those are we um, looking. Um, to. If, um, if you're looking for a technical um, outcome, then it's probably the product of innovation. If you're looking for capacity building, it might also be the process. So, so I think being clear on the, um, the distinction between those two, and of course both is great, right? Um, but, but understanding that there are very different things that come from them. Um, another framework that I think can be interesting to think about is this idea of, you know, uh, and I use it in terms of design as opposed to innovation, but it's this, the, basically the same framework is, you know, uh, are, is this designed by the crisis affected population? Is it designed for the um, affected population or is it designed with? And, um, and we, often there's a pendulum that kind of swings where we go too extremely in any one of those directions. And I think it's important to recognize that each one has value. Each one has a situation where it makes sense. You know, if you're really looking at building relationship, then maybe co-creation is the way to go where there's designing with, and then you have a different relationship between the humanitarian actors and the affected populations. But I think having it in your mind that it's not um, it's not always the um, that you want all the innovation to come from the community because there are some things where you know the human humanitarian actors have better capacity to solve the problem. You know, if I need a new heart um, valve. I could design it myself, but I think I want someone with a little more experience than that. And so, um, so I think we need to really think about what are we trying to achieve? What's the right paradigm of design or innovation? And then what are the outcomes both from the product and the process? And really think through that um, and not just saying, well, we'll see what happens, but being intentional in that approach, appreciating the two frameworks and using that to guide the way that you then choose to implement the innovation. Let's stick with the heart thing, right? Because um, I want to sort of pivot to the second part of the panel topic here and the discussion about the private sector. And I'll, I'll stay with you here because I think, at least at when, when I started to think about this or read up, you know, much of the conversation about innovation globally, I think, revolves around the private sector and Silicon Valley and, and the idea as, you know, it's... it's um, the commercial that generates innovative ideas. And 
Um, the lab stands out a bit um, because you don't extensively engage with the private sector. So, um, and we'll, we'll put this to the whole panel, but can you talk a little bit about what you see as the role of the private sector? Was it a conscious choice for you to engage or not engage? Yeah, there's a couple of answers and I'll try to keep my um, response brief because I could go on for much longer. But um, I think that fundamentally the innovation practice that happens in Silicon Valley is not the right um, practice for the humanitarian sector. And I think that there's a lot of tools and techniques that come from that because we see that Silicon Valley was very successful. But you know, there, um, Silicon Valley allows you to take the risk, right? So you don't like your phone, you'll buy another phone. Or, um, but you know, when you're looking at populations that are displaced, they've already got, undergone trauma, should the risk get transferred to their shoulders? I don't think so. And so I think a lot of the design methodology that um, the humanitarian sector is bringing in is coming from a very different type of sector. So um, so I personally and our lab, we believe that we have to do have an innovation process that is reflective of the needs and the risks uh, and the ability to take risks of the target population. Um, the other thing is, um, I think a little bit about how you define the private sector, and maybe if you want to um, define something as maybe the micro private sector, which is also the informal sector, um, you know, we, we very much look at integrating into sort of the local ecosystem, and I think that that was mentioned a, a couple of times, and we very much would um, want to engage with those like private sector actors, but there it's again um, a, an informal economy rather than the formal economy. And that's, um, but I want to go back to this idea of design for, with, and by. That uh, that's one approach. It's not the only approach. There are other people who engage with small and medium enterprises. Others that engage with the larger companies. And I think that um, a multifaceted approach is going to be necessary. But there's always, you know, the, the wisdom to know which is the the right partner, the right approach is. Um, the, uh, well, there's no easy answer to that, but at least thinking about the fact that there are different approaches and then trying to match them with the uh, um, anticipated or um, desired outcomes. Thanks. Maybe, Zaid, I can ask you, I think you probably have the, the closest relationship or familiarity with the private sector. Do you see, um, do you see there being any disconnect or does this idea of teams, you know, mean, you know, this is just part of the team now? And how do you, how do you see um, the role of the private sector, particularly for the humanitarian community, which has its own principles, ethics, neuroses, what have you? Yeah. Um, so, so in in the work that I've been doing, I guess over the last twenty years, um, we we build teams that are multi-sectoral. So these teams involve the private sector. They involve. Um, community-based organizations, NGOs, and government. Um, so one thing I would just say is that I think private sector participation is absolutely necessary. That's one thing. I think the question that's being posed is, you know, what is our practice really? And what is it that we're doing in the humanitarian sector? And what is the relationship of what the private sector is doing to that practice? So I think that there are a lot of things in Silicon Valley that are useful, really interesting, again, their own neurosis, their own challenges. So I don't think there's such a thing as kind of lifting best practice, if you like, from a particular sector and then saying we should copy it. I think what we need is um, reflexive practice. Um, and there are certain things I think the private sector does. I'll, and I'll give you a really, really simple example. I was actually in Silicon Valley last week and had a meeting with um, someone at Facebook and we were talking about with Gigaton, we set very time-bound challenges. So, you know, teams have to complete things within three months or six months or, you know, even in some cases, two weeks. And uh, the person I was speaking to said, you know, that fits quite well with what, how we work. And I said, oh, how come? And he said, well, Mark comes into the office and says, you know, you need to do this in two weeks. Can we do this in two weeks? And people go, in two weeks. He says, yeah, we need to launch this in two weeks. Now, if that is part of your iterative practice, that you're actually trying to do something quickly, testing it, seeing whether it works, retesting it, and you can teach people how to do that. In my opinion, that's an interesting practice, and that's a practice that, you know, we could do a lot more of, in the sense that, you know, I've worked in the, in the humanitarian space where, you know, you say to people, okay, we want you to do this within two weeks or three months, and they go, you're kidding, right? It's like, 
you mean you want us to write a proposal to do this in two weeks? And we're like, no, we actually want you to do it in two weeks. And it is a, a cultural shift, basically, to say, actually, no, you don't have a two-year planning process or a six-month planning process. You've actually got to implement and deliver something within two weeks. And you see whether it works, and you test it, and you change it. So what I would say is that, firstly, I think we need multi-sectoral teams. We need to bring the private sector in. And I think when you bring the private sector in, what that means is that they don't own the space. They don't get to say, this is how things work. They get to negotiate how things work, and they get to say, well, this is how things work with us, and how are we going to work together? So I think what we need is negotiated spaces rather than sort of inherited spaces. Um, and I think there is a role for the private sector. There's a lot we can borrow, and there's a lot that we need to leave behind. It's like, you know, we don't, there's certain things we just don't, we should not borrow from the private sector. So, Thanks, Sid. I want to turn maybe um, to our colleagues. Ben. How do you see the role of the private sector? Do you see there being a disconnect? And if so, you know, what can be done from your perspective to, to bridge the cultural you know, neuroses gap between these two sectors? Thanks. Um, I guess there's, there's two or three kind of aspects to this. One is the way the world is currently seeing the private sector and its role to in, in innovation, and then how we in the humanitarian sector tend to see it. So more broadly around the world, people are, there's a recognition that actually this image of the tech entrepreneur as, as the kind of driver of creativity and growth, and that you know, the private, the public sector and, and the not-for-profit sector should basically stick to the basics and keep away. That that that's being increasingly seen as ideological, not actually evidence-based. And many of the big technologies of the last 50 years, including the ones that Silicon Valley entrepreneurs exploited themselves, they were actually supported by long-term patient financing from the public sector, not from the private sector. You know, people talk about Apple a lot, but the, in its early stages, it got huge amounts of government subsidies, and you know, it, it, things like the iPhone relied a lot on the internet, GPS, touchscreen displays, voice-activated smart finishes, and like Siri, all of those were bankrolled initially by the by the state. So we're often we're sold this idea of private enterprise driving innovation, but actually the reality is that the, the public sector and the not-for-profit sector plays a really important role in, in innovation. And it's one that we haven't necessarily got a very sophisticated grasp on in the humanitarian sector. We tend to either say, let the private sector in, they know how to innovate, we'll hand everything over to them or we hold them at our arm's length because we worry that there's going to be price gouging behaviors and you know, humanitarian exploitation and profit making at the, uh, at, the, um, at the cost of the most vulnerable. So we, 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 I don't think we've really worked out yet within the humanitarian sector is the role of the private sector in innovation a symbiotic one or a parasitic one? Um, different people have, have different assumptions in their heads when they're talking about the private sector. And quite often we won't actually surface that. We'll go into meetings, talk about the private sector. I'll have the parasitic mindset, someone else will have the symbiotic mindset and we'll never actually talk about what we are expecting. So I, I just want to reinforce what Zaid said, that we need to, um, negotiation becomes really important. You know, who wins, who gains, who loses from innovation. And we need to make sure we have that conversation up front. And from the private sector perspective, I think there's a, they're, they're quite frustrated, many of them, by the fact that the humanitarian organizations go to them either with a desire to fix everything uh, through innovation and you know, bring in private sector expertise, or, or with massive amounts of distrust. And I think the solution to this is actually to have clearly defined problems where we can have an understanding of what capabilities we've got and look the private sector in the eye and say, you can bring your core capabilities to bear on addressing this challenge. And that's how it's worked well in different settings. And it's been a long time since the humanitarian sector actually made anything directly itself. Uh, obviously, it builds things and so on, but actually making new products or making new processes is something we rely on the private sector to do. Something as obvious as cash transfers, we needed banks to work, uh, to work with us in the, in the early 2000s to develop clear systematic processes, develop financial mechanisms, make sure they were robust, make sure they were secure and so on. But it was only when we were able to define the problem well enough that the private sector could actually come in 
and tell us how to drive down the cost and build that system. So I think we just need to make sure we're really careful about how we engage the private sector, bring them in at the point when their capabilities add value, but not expect them to be a silver bullet, as we said earlier. That they, they've got value to add as long as we, we understand that um, we have to negotiate that value. Thanks, Ben. And, and Charlene, maybe over to you, and then we'll um, open the floor for some questions from our, our audience here. Um, how do you see this, this relationship with the private sector manifest in your work, either at the macro level, the Silicon Valley, or at the very um, you know, local community market level that Amy spoke about? So for Response Innovation Lab, we do have that, um, that angle of trying to actively bringing the private sector, but it's not an ultimate goal. It's one of the players amongst many, and the choice of working with a private sector partner to solve a specific problem rather than another type of partner, maybe a community-based organization or an academic entity, will be really driven by the content of the solution that we're looking for and the value proposition that is, that is brought about. And basically, it's really important when you work with those communities that have been affected by crisis that you're approaching approaching them very ethically so it's important to make sure you have the right proof of concept in place before you start piloting uh, rolling out approaches etc and the private sector is interested in working with humanitarians they are still disconnected somewhat from our space in some ways but there is an increasing interest in in getting involved there is an increased understanding that in some ways displaced persons, refugees, vulnerable communities may be a new uh, type of customers if they just find the right um, services to, to bring about or the right um, products. So there, there is really an option to, to, to dialogue and to create this, facilitate that understanding of what is needed from the user perspective and what the private sector can bring. And this is where we can play a role as humanitarian organizations, because they, the, the partners often appreciate it when we are acting as a sort of uh, facilitator to enter a complex space like a refugee settlement, which is very political and had, has its own rules. And they, uh, without this kind of facilitation and introduction, they would be unable to access those segments. Um, what, so for, for us, we work a lot with um, startups uh, within the Ugandan space, and we put a lot of attention on sensitization, making sure ethical principles are understood um, and can be uh, kept in mind. And we we also, there are, there are some dynamics we need to keep in mind is that um, depending on your how your innovation works, who your target group is, who is gonna be the direct beneficiary of the innovation, who is going to be the user, there have been very many models. Some of them can be sustained through market forces. Some of them will continue relying on aid funding or government funding. And that's really due to the nature of the population you're trying to support. So in some cases, a private sector partner can bring a very interesting tool to the humanitarian um, partner with whom they work, but they will continue the client of that partner will be the humanitarian organization or the government. It will not be the end user that benefits from that service because they do not have the, the purchasing power to, to get that service. And that's the whole reason humanitarian actors are present to fill that gap. So um, there is definitely a role to be played if we go about it in a strategic way. And also if um, humanitarian stakeholders are ready to enter into a true dialogue with some of the private sector partners and not consider them just as suppliers, but create meaningful strategic relationship where you are sharing, finding shared goals um, and, and co-creating together to see that you are um, getting, you're, you're getting the right results. Thanks, Charlene. So in the spirit of, of the team here, um, I want to open the floor. I have an extensive list of questions, but I want to give an opportunity for our guests here. Um, if you have a question, I would just ask that you um, give us your name and affiliation and try to keep it as brief as possible. So are there any questions in the room? Um, 
very polite crowd. Okay, so we have uh, one here. We'll take two. So her aim over here, and then we'll come to the front. Hi, my name is Brianna Nerlish. I'm a student at American University SIS. Um, Amy, you mentioned changing thinking earlier, and I think that's been mentioned a few times here. So I'm just wondering, um, in, with the nexus of private sector partnership and public sector partnership, and then the government as well, um, how are these actors able to change um, tra very traditional thinking um, and to kind of evolve them into embrace some embracing innovation, um, specifically with some of the most traditional and conservative institutions in the world. Sure. Um, thanks for the question, and I'll I'll respond first, and then ask other people too, because I think we all will have uh, slightly different answers to that. Um, the way that we uh, work on engaging these different actors and trying to change their thinking is through these co-creation summits that we do. So we bring together humanitarian actors, members of the host community, the refugees, international NGOs, local NGOs, designers, students, and then they're all working together on specific challenges. Um, and in working together, they build that relationship, they build that team, and they see each other in a very different light. And um, um, and I think that a lot of a lot of barriers are lowered, and a lot of um, sort of veils are are lowered too, just in terms of the way people see the other actors. And so that's our sort of highly pragmatic way of, of doing it. But I'm um, but it's it's not a scalable solution. But I think it does because it influences those people's spheres of influence. Then it it does have some degree of a ripple effect. But we've find that that's an extremely effective way of getting people to change their mindset about the capabilities of all the different actors in the, in the sector. So let's go maybe to Ben and then we'll come back to you, Zaid. Ben, how do we go about changing thinking and in particular changing thinking in you know, very traditional mindsets? Um, it's, it's a really good question. I guess the, the thing is, uh, there's there's a whole bunch of vicious and virtuous cycles when it comes to our thinking. If you think about innovation generally, that there's a there's a tend there's a kind of downward spiral in humanitarian innovation. So if you take our sector, which is challenged around legitimacy and efficiency, you get add kind of insecure management, bad press coverage. And then you bring in technology evangelists who pr promise to cure rare ailments with their particular brand of innovation. So the dominant regimes within our organizations that have capital invest are almost always going to go for innovations that enhance efficiency over legitimacy. That trade-off's always going to go down the route of let's add economic value. And um, th what that ends up doing is applying the existing business model bigger, faster, harder. And innovation speeds up the system and fixes the cracks. And so as a result, innovation ends up reinforcing the existing business model in the name of efficiency. Uh, and that's one of the cycles. But there's another story that can also be told. And we've seen these two in our, in our, in our sector, although there are not many of them. And it's where innovation is not necessarily underpinned by a narrow notion of economic value, but of our values, plural. Um, and this is where you begin with the desire to make technology and innovation, not necessarily just about generating more resources or growing the organization, but trying to be more representative, more inclusive, more fair. This leads to trust and confidence in the work that we do in innovation efforts and the kinds of processes Amy was talking about and the kinds of dynamics that, that, um, that Charlene was talking about. And over time, this leads to better, fairer, more equitable outcomes. And that, that reinforces the use of innovation that's representative inclusive and fair. So I don't think we can say we're going to radically switch to a new way of thinking. We have to understand the kind of dynamics that we're in, the, the thought worlds that we're in, and the, the cycles of thinking, and work out ways in which we can break beyond them. Um, and I think there are many more virtue, there are virtuous cycles out there, they're around now, but it requires us to have a much more honest and genuine dialogue about who innovation is really for and what purpose it serves. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the way in which we then do that, we need to build evidence that, of how it actually adds value um, and in a whole range of different settings, good, 
case studies of examples. Um, uh, we, for example, Medicine Sans Frontier, I think, is the exemplar in our sector. They're constantly trialing things in disaster-like conditions so that they're ready to go when emergencies hit. And evidence doesn't mean being limited to um, existing research. It means being poised to act in ways that are both creative and rigorous. It also means getting good networks between innovators, between front and frontline staff and researchers, creating coalitions of the willing who are ready to go when disasters strike. And it means working in politically savvy ways because we have to be aware that the unoriginal thinking is linked to vested interests. Um, and if we are gonna be using innovation and original thinking, we have to engage with the fact that means transforming power dynamics and deep inclusion of the kinds that we seem to be pointing towards in this dialogue means actually rethinking our institutions, rethinking the relationships. And it might mean, you know, having innovation tugboats rather than expecting the mothership to change overnight, finding ways of actually creating pockets of innovation around our organizations that are of our, of our system, but not limited, not within and embedded and stuck in the system. Um, and this is something that the private sector does pretty well as, as well, actually. We don't, it's not something that, that this is independent of the sector that we are working in. Scaling innovations is always a political process. Resistance comes in many shapes and forms. So, so I think we need to talk softly and carry a big negotiator yeah. stick. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, maybe I could turn to you because you've worked across, um, these, across these sectors. Um, you know, so it's not just changing thinking in the humanitarian sector, but in what, what techniques and tools have you found that are effective to help um, transform the way people think about problems and partners? Yeah, so may, maybe just um, a couple of um, caveats before I answer the question. But, you know, the only reason um, what we or an organization thinks matters is because it influences what we do. So the question is, what are you doing and why are you doing it? And, um, and really, um, you know, I had a really pivotal kind of moment in my career, like 20 years ago. I had a conversation with a, a guy called Professor John Powell, who and we were working on racism, basically. This is in deep Michigan. And, um, and he sat me down and he drew two curves. <clears throat> and he showed me one curve and he basically said, you know, look at this curve. This curve is essentially the prevalence of racist thinking. And he basically said, you know, people in general are less racist than in the past. And basically, the prevalence is kind of going down. So there's less racism in, in the world, if you like. And I was like, yeah. And he said, now let's look at the indicators of how the African American community in the US is doing. And all the indicators are going the wrong way. Things are getting worse, basically. And I sat there looking at these curves. And I said, so you're saying people are getting less racist in their thinking, but the situation is getting worse. And he said, yeah. And then I was like, but that means what people think doesn't really matter. And he said, that's correct. <laughs> and I was a bit like, huh. <laughs> so, you know, what is that about? So obviously, you know, then he explained structural racism to me and so on. So partly I think what the, the, the challenge with institutions is that um, what you do out in the world is a function of obviously what you think about the world. So we talk about strategy as inner game, that there is an inner game, if you like, which is inside your organization, inside your team. And that determines what you do out in the world. Now, if you don't pay attention to that inner game and you basically say, okay, the issues are out in the community, they're out there, you've got a problem, basically. Um, so in terms of kind of changing people's, um, quote, thinking, what I would say is it's about changing their practice and what people do. And so it is literally, what is it that you're doing? We're sitting in circles around tables. If you want to change the practice, well, don't do that. Do something different, basically. So I think it's actually almost physical. It's like rearranging things physically, what you do, how you talk. So I think that's um, how you do it. The other thing I would just say, last thing I would just say is that, you know, if institutions don't change their thinking, then they will go extinct. And, and you know, we have to ask the question, is it our job to change those institutions if they don't want to change? You know, so if, the way I look at it is that, you know, if we're working with an organization or institution that doesn't want to change, it's not really my job to change that institution, unless they're obviously blocking my way and they're not allowing things to happen, which obviously does happen. But it is like, is it really our job to basically invest all of our time, energy in trying to change institutions that fundamentally don't want to change? Or do we move on and find younger, newer institutions that are up for doing what we think needs to happen? So.
Thank you, Zaid. And, and Charlene, maybe um, from your experience, you know, working directly with um, communities um, in need, how do you how do you see this question? How is it manifested in your practice? And what approaches have you found that help change the thinking, either in your own organization or um, among the communities that you work with? Thank you. Um, so yes, from a like implementing perspective in the field, there we've been um, experimenting, and we have had to contend with trying to change. Uh, people's mind within our own organization and that requires asking a lot of questions keep pushing and find the people who can be your allies the drivers of change um, the ones who the, the early adopters who are going to help you create that change trust you slowly slowly to bring about something and when you're able to bring some kind of demonstration of what you're preaching then that's when uh, mindsets start changing around the table um, then, in terms of the, the engagement at the community level, there are two things we've been trying to do. One is that you have to be very concrete um, when you're proposing the introduction of something new. You need to come with the solution to demonstrate it or the, or the partners that can really explain it to create an early understanding of your objectives amongst the community and see if it resonates. Um, so. So that's one, one side. And the other side is make sure that whichever innovation design you have in mind, you are going to test it against the expectations of your users in the field. And that's been some, it sounds very basic, of course, we talk about this a lot with human centered design, etc. But in practice, it takes things like forcing people who don't usually interact to have a conversation around a certain topic or bringing a, an interesting innovative startup to a refugee settlement to understand actually the living conditions, the capabilities, the networks, the challenges in, in this context and push people to take on that new information to, to make sure that they are um, really providing, um, that, that they are incorporating these, these elements into their thinking. So there are some very practical ways we are using to encourage change in, in thinking uh, by encouraging dialogue and enforcing, um, encouraging rather than forcing, encouraging conversations between um, those traditional actors and maybe the less usual suspects. Thanks. I know we had a, another question up front here, so. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Emma, and I'm interning with Atlas Network, which is a think tank located in Arlington. Uh, and my question was: uh, I know, like, the private sector has a way of like innovating very rapidly due to like competition uh, and stuff like that. And so I was kind of curious about knowing about like how does that translate into the humanitarian world, and uh, so like the ways of innovation from the private sectors and uh, their speed, basically. How, how does it translate? And do you see like an increase in speed or like a difference of innovation in the humanitarian sector uh, when you bring in the, those private actors? Maybe we can start here with you. I think you spoke about this a little bit earlier, that, that pace of innovation. I, I was struck before in your answer about the humanitarian sector pace versus the Facebook pace, because oftentimes the humanitarian sector actually can move very quickly when a crisis strikes, mm -hmm. but that's with the standard way of working. Um, so how do you take that? Yeah, so I, I don't think um, the private sector has a monopoly on speed. Um, you know, it's not private <laughs> to be fast. So uh, what I would say is that, um, you know, in the work that we do, we work with community-based groups, we work on the ground, and people can operate at speed and they can prototype and test and iterate at speed. And I don't think it has anything to do with um, competition per se. I think obviously you need incentives in terms of why you're doing it. Um, but you know, the way we work is we essentially don't work in what we would call linear cycles. So we don't work in these long linear kind of planning cycles where you're kind of doing, you know, um, design, implementation, and then if you're lucky, evaluation, you know, five years later. Um, so what we're doing is we're just working in very rapid cycles of design, implementation, evaluation, and they happen in weeks or months. 
And I think it's just to practice. It's the question is, you know, how do you incentivize people to practice that? Um, and it's it's culture, really. It's more more than anything else. So, I would just say that I I would, yeah, I would hesitate to say the private sector has a monopoly on speed. Amy. Yeah, I think that uh, I can make a, a a generalization, which is you know just that it's not true across the board. But I suspect that there's sort of an inverse relationship between the size of an organization and speed of uh, ability to innovate. So you know you'll see. Uh, uh, that sometimes it's it's faster for um, you know for example the the community groups that we're working with their you know their uh, part of the design process is that innovation and iteration etc. Um, but I think the other um, thing that is uh, part of that equation is the ability to scale and um, and so I think that the ability to innovate quickly and scale quickly is a really special place to be in. And I think that is the, you know, that to me is what uh, we should be striving to say, well, how could, how could we create an innovative um, space which combines those things that has the speed of innovation and the ability to scale? Um, and not by saying that it's one entity, but by bringing the best bits of different entities so that there's this sort of, this outcome which is contributed to by multiple organizations or um, or actors, and, and, and sort of building on the strengths that each one brings in. Thanks. Uh, you know, in, in a previous response, Ben, you talked about um, the uh, vicious and virtuous cycle and the challenges around legitimacy and, and efficiency. And one of the things that came up in, in our um, keynote address at the start from Sarah Charles was the uh, ambitions around localization and connecting the innovation agenda with the localization agenda. And certainly it seems like um, both of these questions, legitimacy and efficiency, could be achieved through um, you know, a much more rapid um, achievement of some of the localization ambitions. And so I want to uh, maybe turn to, um, to, well, let's stick with you, Amy, and, and your approach to localization. We, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I want, I want to understand a little bit about how you see the global agenda and what role innovation can play in achieving a more localized humanitarian response. Okay, um, sure, thanks. Uh, so I think in, in, in the way that we work, we always work through local partners because of their, um, uh, because for any high touch intervention, you need people who can speak the language, who understand the context, et cetera. So, so the, the, the localization is, is very critical there. I think that um, I think that Sarah referred to this in the um, in the beginning. Is that there's sort of these to me there's these different stages of participation. One is where information is 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 um, is transferred. So that's sort of a consultation kind of uh, way of thinking about it. And then the next level up is where decision making can um, can also happen. And then the next level up from there is leadership. And I think that there's a, a real need to move from, you know, uh, I would say probably, let's say 10 years ago, it was much more of this consultative thing. Well, let's talk to the local partners and, and see what they say, but we'll still decide what happens. And, and I think, again, rec um, looking towards how can you transition from this sort of consultation mode to active decision making on the part of the local um, the local actors to the actual leadership on that side and I think she also referred to this idea of letting go and not leading and that is particularly challenging I've found for funders to um, not have specific outcomes out laid, you know, laid out at the very beginning of a project when innovation requires that you change along the way and that it's a dynamic process. And, you know, and in, in our case where we're creating technologies, they'll say, well, what will people make? And my answer is, I have no idea. And if I do know, then I'm not doing my job right. You know, if, if people are making what they identified as their prior priorities, I don't know what those are. And that's not a reassuring answer um, for the, the, the funders. But I think there has to be this transition to recognizing that if you have a goal of innovation, you have to change your metrics of success and your requirements for, um, for you know, giving people the opportunity to, to do that. And so I think there really needs to be a transformation at that level to embrace uncertainty and recognize that it is where the creativity happens. Um, 
I want to, we've got about seven or eight minutes left, so let's go to some, some parting thoughts and, and key takeaways. And maybe I can start with you, um, Charlene. You know, from your perspective in Kampala, working in this, in this great lab, you know, what does the future look like for you of humanitarian innovation, and how do you see us achieving this vision? Thanks. It's, it's, it's a really tough question. <laughs> but um, I, I, would, I liked uh, what uh, Amy left us with, because that's something we, we really face as Response Innovation Lab, and that um, for humanitarian innovation to become increasingly effective and more impactful moving forward, hopefully we can have um, a shift from trying to be more focused a shift from being solution focused to being more problem focused and at response innovation lab we often say you need to fall in love with a problem and if you do then that's where an, an interesting innovation journey starts whereas if you're too focused on the solution which you shouldn't necessarily know before you get onto the journey then uh, there are risks of finding fake problems just to try and fit innovations that are attractive or that you believe will attract funding into your portfolio. So um, yes, for, for the future of humanitarian innovation, I hope we can be increasingly problem focused and um, maybe also to just remark on some of the things that were shared before around speed and scale, those are um, important dimensions to have in mind. I would say that in some cases, speed is not in, in positive. For the context, which is of a protracted crisis, what is much more important is to be ready to fail and learn rather than, than go very fast. Um, and, and to think early on on the scaling potential. And that's usually not a fast journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlene. Maybe over to you, Ben. You know, um, how do you see the future? What are some of the gaps in the landscape now, and and where do you think? What do you think we need to be doing now to to get to a, you know, a more effective and, and efficient humanitarian future? Thanks, Jake, and thanks for a great conversation as well. Um, I guess from my point of view, the we 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 have a mission mentality in the humanitarian. It's about responding to each crisis as best we can. But I think because of that crisis-driven response mentality that we have, we don't actually look at the bigger picture. We focus on micro missions and we are quite often set to aside the kind of macro mission. And when we do look at the macro mission, they're in kind of big numbers like 290 million people in need of humanitarian aid this year, or 900 million people who are hungry. And it is not a, an especially action-oriented way of thinking about the future. And I think one of the antidotes to that, and, one of the, and I think, and also that's combined with a kind of pilotitis approach to humanitarian innovation, where we focus on very small scale interventions that are creative and novel and interesting, but potentially aren't going to necessarily challenge anyone too much. But history shows us and the world show, around us shows that big missions can galvanize innovation. We see them more in the development sector. We've seen them in the private sector. The public sector generally is trying to do more work on mission-oriented innovation. And the humanitarian sector, we just haven't really done that. We haven't really embraced the idea of saying, you know, what, what are the inspirational goals that we can use to crowd in private knowledge and expertise, public sector resources, humanitarian knowledge and local actor experiences. And, and, and I think a, a more mission oriented approach that actually identifies a few priority areas we really want to see change happening, where resources are flatlining or reducing and needs are growing. I think that that's got to be the key for the future. It's part of what we're trying to do in the UK Humanitarian Innovation Hub. Um, I did a number of areas like vaccine delivery, like rethinking global humanitarian surgery. Um, some of them are technology oriented, like the use of parts of AI or satellites. Some of them are more problem oriented. But we are trying to take that exactly that approach that, that Charlene was talking about, to be problem oriented, but also to be quite 
expansive in our and in our view and say you know the humanitarians do not have a monopoly on on this on this way of working we need to draw in as much as possible and then try and convene and and when we convene the right actors the money isn't actually the biggest barrier it's 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 the mindsets thanks so much ben um Zaid, over to you where do you see us going and what should we in the room be thinking about to get there so i think um you know, we're in the middle of uh, what you could think of as a as a poly crisis. It's like it's not one crisis; um, it's multiple. And um, you know, we're not going to have one novel virus circulating. We're going to have ten, and it's going to be 120 degrees outside. So, I think the I think what's going to happen is that either the sector is going to become irrelevant because it's unable to respond to the poly crisis and these multiple things happening, or the sector will become increasingly relevant through changing its practices to adapt to what is happening out in the world. So what I would say is that um, you know, we have to proactively adapt our practices and how we work um, to the context that we're in, which is that we are in a crisis that is going to accelerate. We know it's going to accelerate um, in our lifetimes, and uh, we will either respond to it or not. And Amy, final thoughts. Where do you think we're... We're going. I mean, you're going to South Sudan tonight, so thank you very much for joining us. But where do you see the sector going, and you know, what, what parting thoughts would you have for these practitioners who want to help us get there? Sure, and I think my, um, my vision is not the global overarching one, but for you know, what I would see like our organization hopefully being able to create, which would then hopefully provide some utility to the, um, to the sector, which would be these local innovation ecosystems where um, members of the affected population are, you know, they're, are able to contribute creatively, and there are better relationships formed between the humanitarian organizations that are working together with the um, with the uh, with the affected populations and that there would be a very much a change in mindset in terms of um, who who should be and who can be creating solutions to the challenges who is identifying those challenges who whose ideas have priority etc so I think that there's um, there's a lot of these questions and um, and I believe that by creating these ecosystems that can thrive then that will lead to uh, sort of a stronger position I guess for um, for the affected population to be uh, be able to collaborate from. And um, so I think that's, that's not, it, it's the basis, I hope, of a sector-wide change. Um, so on behalf of the Humanitarian Agenda, uh, I want to extend a very special thanks to Amy Smith, um, Zaid Hassan, Ben Ramalingam, and Charlene Cabot for joining us. Um, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in this room, or in this Zoom link, um, at 11.15 for our next discussion on engaging women's leadership. Um, really excited for this conversation. It's about, it's about changing organizational structures, changing thinking, and um, moderated by my friend and colleague, Caitlin Welsh. So we'll take a short break and be back here at 11.15, and thank you so much to our panelists. Hello. Good morning and welcome to this second panel of today's Humanitarian Innovation in Action Conference. This panel will focus on elevating women's leadership in humanitarian response. I'm Caitlin Welsh, director of the CSIS Global Food Security Program, and I'm very pleased to support the CSIS Humanitarian Agenda and my colleague and friend Jacob Kurtzer in today's event. Today's discussion will focus on ways women in crisis-affected contexts can lead in designing and implementing services, and ways the humanitarian system can shift decision-making power, funding, and influence to local women actors. We'll discuss these topics keeping in mind today's theme of innovation in people, processes, and products. To discuss these topics, we have assembled a world-class panel, including Dr. Ifat Zafar Aga, founder and COO of Sehad Kahani, Ifat will be joining us from Karachi. Very pleased to, uh, to, uh, to welcome her to our panel. Sanam Naragi Anderlini, MBE, who is founder and CEO of the International Civil Society Action Network, or ICANN, joining us on stage. 
and also Melissa Horn Albuja, Acting Division Chief of Protection and Community Capacities in USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, also joining us on stage. I've spoken with each of them before this, uh, uh, in advance of this panel, and I, I think it's definitely the case that we could fill the entire hour with a conversation with one of these panelists, so I know that we will have a, a very rich and important conversation to follow. Following my discussion with panelists, I am going to be happy to open the floor to questions from all of you. And we will, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll come to you with a microphone. So without further ado, I'm pleased to turn to our first panelist who's joining us online again from Karachi. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ifat Zafar Aga, again, CEO, founder and COO of Sehat Kahani. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank you so much for uh, having me on board. Really excited. Great, thank you. I'd like to start with a overview question about Sehat Kahani. Can you explain to our audience what it is your organization does? Yeah. So Sehat Kahani essentially means story of health in Urdu, and it's a telemedicine platform, a telemedicine-based organization that me and my co-founder, Dr. Sara, started uh, in 2017. Um, the organization works in the following ways. We enable health accessibility in a developing country like Pakistan using telemedicine. So, you know, for people who may not be aware, Pakistan is the fifth largest in the, in the entire world in terms of population. We have around a population of 220 million people. Yet the irony is that because of social and cultural norms, um, a lot of doctors don't practice to their full potential. We have around 245,000 licensed doctors. 80% of these are women, but unfortunately only 40% of them, them practice. Um, a lot of them drop out because of you know, childcare issues, because of lack of having permission to work, uh, because of lack of childcare facilities for them. And another 15% leave Pakistan for better opportunities globally. So at Sehat Kahani, we uh, do two things. We create nurse-assisted telemedicine clinics in low-income communities, enabling a community dweller to access a doctor from the city through an online platform, which is facilitated by a nurse who resides in the community. And for the urban market, we have a mobile app, which is essentially a product for people like you and me, where you can access a doctor from your smartphone. So that's essentially um, what we do. Thank you. Um... Uh, that, that's obviously an innovation um, in, in approach to healthcare. Um, can you explain some other ways that Sehat Kahani embodies innovation in your approaches? So, so um, innovation is something that obviously has been at the core of our work. Um, we started the company in 2017. We created, we started creating these nurse assisted uh, telemedicine clinics in communities. Then in 2019, we thought that, you know, healthcare is a challenge for the urban population, we thought we need to make a mobile app. Now in the mobile app, we also created a corporate version. Uh, in Pakistan, healthcare insurance generally only comprises of um, access to a doctor uh, when you fall sick and you are admitted in a hospital under the insurance package. But we, you know, kind of identified this and, you know, um, felt that a lot of patients don't need hospital admission, but they need access to a doctor for a consultation. And, and uh, a lot of uh, multinational companies do that on a reimbursement basis, but then there's a lot of pilferage, a lot of fake billings, a lot of challenges that they were facing in terms of those reimbursements. So we told them that how about you enable um, online consultation for your employees and you know through this um, they can access services. So today as of date, we are working with four leading insurance providers. We're providing this online uh, unlimited access to general physicians at around 40 specialities to around um, 420 corporations. These include names such as Nestle Pakistan, Coca-Cola Pakistan, Philip Morris Pakistan, to name a few. Then we also realized that, you know, along with physical health, mental health is also a challenge. So, so we pivoted, pivoted the business and we thought that, okay, how can we give mental health to all of these people, despite the fact that in Pakistan, mental health is really expensive. So we started to look for um, donors and funders in the international market who could facilitate us. So British Asian Trust is a very prominent partner who enables us to uh, give access to mental health consultations in the very low income um, rural population. So, so the consultations are subsidized heavily by British Asian Trust. So this is another channel that we um, started working on. Thank you. Um, you uh, I heard you explain the way the Seha Kahani operates in urban context. Um, did you explain the hybrid model and how you operate in rural context as well? I was sorry, I was having a, a bit trouble hearing. 
So, so it's a very interesting model. Um, see, we live in a society where uh, if you talk about the low income populations, we are talking about a country where women are not literate enough. A lot of, you know, in those communities, even the men aren't literate enough. Um, we're talking about communities where women don't own a smartphone or they're not allowed to own it. So that's another challenge that um, they face. So even if, for example, a household has a smartphone, it's owned by one person only. It's usually the man of the you know, community. So we thought for a community which lacks trust so much, even if we did introduce a doctor on a smartphone, they wouldn't be able to really understand or acknowledge it. And when we tested it out and they all thought that, okay, the person sitting on the other side of the phone is probably, you know, uh, not a proper doctor or anything of that sort. So we started collaborating with nurses from those community only so that people already trusted them. There's already a two room space, which is present. And we would upgrade that space into a telemedicine facility. So for example, any other regular um, community clinic and you, you add a telemedicine platform to it, you turn the, train the nurse to be able to connect to patients online using that platform. Then there are a couple of digital gadgets, for example, an e-stethoscope, e-dermoscope, which is then added um, to those platforms, which facilitates in the, diagno in the diagnosis further. So what we saw was that, you know, that really brought the trust. People knew those nurses already. They were familiar that, okay, this is a person. The nurse became the advocate for the online doctor. So that really helped propagate the message. Thank you so much for explaining that for our audience. So Sehat Kahani works in urban and rural contexts using a hybrid model. You explain the partnerships that you enter into with a number of private sector actors. Um, can you remind me again how many uh, clients you have across the country? So in terms of the corporations or in terms of the number of clinics? Number of, um, a, a number of people who access your services, your, your healthcare services. So... Um, uh, quickly summarizing, we have around 39 of such e-health centers spread across all the four provinces in Pakistan. These are the nurse-assisted telemedicine centers. Along with that, we are partners with around 420 corporations. Till date, from 2017 till now, we have collectively done 1.1 million online consultations. And we have served a good uh, 700, 800,000 patients. Okay, thank you. And a uh, final question before we turn to our second panelist. Um, can you explain for our audience how it is that you operate in human context of humanitarian emergencies, given the number of types of, of, of emergencies you have experienced recently uh, uh, across Pakistan, including right now um, flooding that we're seeing in Karachi, for example? Yeah, so, so I think uh, the low-income community model or the e-health clinics have been a facility for humanitarian grounds only. We work... Uh, with a lot of international humanitarian partners as well in upgrading existing spaces into telemedicine centers. So very interesting incident that I'll share here with you in the tribal areas um, uh, during the terrorism wars, as well as when the floods came, there were a couple of um, temporary healthcare facilities as well as refugee camps which were built. And you know, when, when situation subsided, when you know, uh, Alhamdulillah, the terrorism situation got better, all of those spaces got vacant. So out of these 39, the interesting thing is two of these clinics are actually built in refugee camps, which were previously refugee camps. Now we have converted them into a telemedicine center. Not only that, um, actively out of these 39, our major clinics are in interior Sindh, they are in uh, KP, which is another province, and Baluchistan, all of these three highly neglected places there are no healthcare facilities. If a patient falls sick, they have to travel all the way three, four hours to the main city, which is, you know, and a lot of women unfortunately die, a lot of children die during their birth uh, because they are unable to travel. Baluchistan again was highly uh, affected by a political scenario. There were no healthcare facilities. So, uh, and, and it was very challenging for us to even open clinics there, but WHO facilitated us in opening clinics there. And you know, those were communities which despite being uh, very illiterate or very uh, lacking in terms of knowledge, took the services you know, uh, heavily because they were so deprived of the service. 
So, so um, and we are working extensively uh, with other partners, local as well as international, in scaling this into other uh, areas affected by humanitarian grounds. For example, you all might be familiar with Kashmir. Kashmir has an Indian part as well as a Pakistani part. We recently partnered with the uh, Kashmiri government in Pakistan, in the Pakistani uh, Kashmiri segment. Again, an area highly you know, affected by politics, by uh, you know, you know, the different wars and lacking healthcare. Now we are upgrading 13 of the government's identified spaces into telemedicine centers. I think one opportunity that we've always seen is that in Pakistan, and there is a lot of infrastructure which is built, which is present, which is vacant, and doctors don't go there. So I think we have been um, uh, really fortunate in being able to upgrade and convert those into a very lean model. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for providing that excellent overview of the work that you're doing with Sahad Kahani. We look forward to turning to you uh, at the, um, after we've spoken with all panelists. So look forward to turning to you again with, with some more questions. But thank you again for joining us from Karachi. Very pleased right now yes. to turn to our second panelist, Sanam Naragi Anderlini, MBE, who is founder and COO of ICANN, which is the International Civil Society Action Network. Um, wondering, Sanam, if you can um, provide the same thing, which is an overview of ICANN's work. And thank you again for joining us in person. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Um, it's great to be here in person with everyone. Um, I'll give you a very quick overview of what ICANN does and how we operate. So we're a very small organization. We're DC-based. I have a staff of about 12 people. Uh, we've just upped it with three interns for the summer, so we're 15 people, literally. Um, but our model from the beginning was that um, you don't need us as outsiders to be present in countries around the world because I've been working with women peace builders for 25 years in war zones. And they know exactly what the needs are. They are the first, in fact, women generally are the first humanitarian responders and, and the first to sort of run to address conflict and crisis and so forth. So, so from the outset, the way that we set up ICANN was to say, we kind of are small here, but we, we now have a, we spearhead a network in, uh, with partners in over 40 countries now. Um, all of them conflict-affected fragile states, um, closing political space. And they're all local women-led organizations with, um, with a particular focus on peace building, preventing violent extremism, um, and dealing with crises, and dealing with the needs of their communities. So, um, so that's, this, in, in terms of innovation, that's kind of one of the first things that, that it's like, we're not present, we don't need to be present. Um, we call it being locally rooted and globally connected. Um, that, that we want everybody to be of their own state con context, they know the tradition, they know the culture, they know how things work, um, but we're also providing the global connectivity so that they can learn lessons from each other. The second thing was that um, for years we were saying, well, we need to give money to women's organizations, and governments would say to us, well, we don't know who they are, it's really hard financially to, to, to manage these small grants and so forth. So we set up something called the Innovative Peace Fund, and we now, uh, accept money from governments, from you know Canada and the UK and, and, and others. Um, and in a sense, we're, we sort of take wholesale and then we retail. So we do all the technical work of helping our partners figure out how to do the proposals and budgeting and M&E. And, and we're, we're help, helping them both in terms of the technical side of these things, but also strategically. Like if something, you know, if there are different strategies that people have used um, in, in Colombia, is it useful for Cameroon and, and, and um, et cetera. And so, um, and then what have we seen? Um, and I'll, as I sit here, I'm like, all these voices suddenly come into my head. I have a sort of slightly uh, busy mental <laughs> life. But um, uh, during COVID, when, when COVID hit last year, we asked our donors if we could channel all of the funding that we had that had been allocated for workshops and meetings and so forth to give grants. We ended up giving, in, in, in the two-year period, we ended up giving out $1.9 million and an external evaluation showed us, we were quite surprised by this ourselves, that the, that the resources had reached 1.3 million people around the world. Um, and the reason why that works is that we have a partner in Nigeria. She, she the first grant we gave her a few years ago was $50,000. She works in, in Boko Haram affected areas. Um, she now has an organization. She's getting resources from other places. But she's got, she's dealing with women who left Boko Haram, who had been kidnapped by Boko Haram, who left who were then raped by the Nigerian military and, and are dumped in an IDP camp. And actually some of them wanted to still go and become suicide bombers. And she's found them, she works with them, she provides them livelihood support, she provides them with psychosocial and, and other support, and has them you know, basically re 
engage with, with society. She's working with, she's created networks of families um, who are missing their husbands and their sons and so forth. So through this one organization, we are really reaching very deep into the Nigerian space or the Liberian space. Or, and, and all of our partners became the, f the first ones to actually deal with the COVID response. So they started making masks. The WHO said, um, you need soap and water to wash your hands. And our partners were saying, we don't have soap, we don't have water. So through WhatsApp, they were talking to each other about how to make, um, use local plants and aloe vera and, and alcohol to do the sanitation and, and things. In Pakistan, they, we, we, our, our partner had a network of women and they used traditional kind of, the, they would stand on the rooftops and convey the information about how to do the hygiene and healthcare. Um, Food shortages. People did food bags for people. Domestic violence. They they inter, you know they became the interlocutors for dealing with with domestic violence. So it's very much a so as I said, locally rooted, globally connected. But um, I don't know what you know. It's innovation, but it's not innovation. It's just common sense in in a way. Sure. So how is it that you arrived at ICANN's model? What is it that inspired you to found an organization with this particular model? So I started this work back in 1996, um, looking at conflict prevention and conflict transformation. And in those days, we were, there was a lot of talk about early warning signs. And you know, if we had the warning signs about you know, the, the war in Congo, you know, we could do something about it. I saw very quickly that actually we have all the warning signs, but we don't do anything about it. Um, you, know, you could have predicted Ukraine. You could have, we, in fact, we were screaming from the rooftops about what would happen in Afghanistan with the way that the diplomatic effort was being handled over the last few years and the stonewalling of women. And Afghan women were saying, you know, the Taliban is what, the, what, the, the, what it's gonna look like. So I had seen that warning signs and systems and, and structures and so forth outside um, go, they may be relevant, I'm not sure whether they do good or harm at, at this point, but on the ground you have people and they have no exit strategy. It is their families, it is their communities, they are the running to the problem. And you don't need to even look, you know, look at what happened with, with Hurricane Katrina. The government was absent. It was local communities in the United States, that local families that were, were helping each other. This issue of our systems fraying and, and the burden on multiple humanitarian crises, if somebody said poly crises, mm -hmm. that is a reality. And so it's when, when you don't have the response from the top People will do what, what it takes. And as I say, I always say, look at images of refugee camps. You see women holding their babies. She is a humanitarian worker. She is looking after the kids. She's looking after the elderly. She's, it is they are, women are risking their lives all the time. It's from the international side that we don't see them. In fact, we invisibilize and we ignore them. And, and, and I've, see, I've been inside the UN system and I don't understand what, how it is that, I've had colleagues say to me, oh, well, there are bombs dropping. And I'm like, there are bombs dropping on women and men. I mean, it's, it's not like the women suddenly disappear. And so, so there is a real problem of not seeing the human beings on the ground. And for us, it was very much flipping it and saying, people are there, they care. Uh, let's give them the resources to be able to do what they need to do. Sure. Thank you so much for touching on the um, the particular roles that women play in the humanitarian emergency context. So can you speak a little bit more about the roles they play and the particular risks that they face? And then also my follow-on question to that is going to be about the particular risks that men face, because I know that you've done studies across, uh, I think I believe, 10 countries on that topic as well. Sure. So, so um, a few things. Any crisis that I have encountered or we've heard about, Tsunami in, in Sri Lanka, the Japanese, you know, nuclear disaster, um, uh, Ukraine right now. Um, sadly, you can guarantee that there will be sexual gender, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Even in, in Sri Lanka, women were being rescued and then raped, right? So, so, so sexual violence, I don't know why, it happens. I think we need a lot of studies around what it is that in, in these kinds of crises contexts, men will rape women, um, but it happens repeatedly over. So that, that's one thing. And our humanitarian responses and institutions have really failed to put sexual violence prevention strategy in place as a standard. You know, we, they do hunger prevention, right? You give shelter so that people aren't exposed to the elements. For God's sake, we know that sex, sexual violence is, rape is happening. Why hasn't it become standard practice to say, how do we mitigate it? How do we prevent it? And there are you know, things that can be done. In the Haiti um, earthquake, the Clinton Foundation went and gave people flashlights. Um, well, they were fine for a while until the batteries ran out, and, and then they were useless because they didn't replace the batteries. 
um, for women to go to the bathrooms. The, the local um, organizers eventually ended up giving women baseball bats so that if they needed to go to the latrines, there would be four women going to the latrine together holding baseball bats and protecting each other. Um, so sexual violence is definitely one of, the, one of the issues and there's lots to be done. Secondly, um, we see women be taking very strategic and very risky decisions. Um, in Darfur, um, you know, people have seen this repeatedly that they say, well, why are the women going off and collecting the firewood if they know they're gonna be um, at risk of being raped? By the, by the Janjaweed or, or the, by the militias. And when they ask the women, the women say, well, um, if the men go, they'll be killed. So they're risking their, they will risk being raped so that their husbands, sons, brothers, whatever, don't get killed, right? Um, it, it's, it's, these are decisions that people are making. And, and again, it comes back to this, that we have to be respectful of people on the ground. And we have to be empathetic. How many of us would be able to survive one night in a, in a tent in Chad or, or you know, in the middle of the, of the crisis in Pakistan. So it's really that respect of what is it that people, what choices people are making. And, and then the third thing that sadly we're seeing in the last few years is that the women, you know, my, my network are peace builders, meaning that they do a lot of kind of um, bridge building and reaching out to government officials, militia, communities, et cetera. And you know, when crises hits, bridges are often the first ones to be blown up, right? Because you want to create division. And so what we've seen in the last few years is that, the, that our peace building community is being targeted. And, um, and they are they're tar being targeted both in terms of their, their own personal safety, online in terms of accusations, and then the most horrific thing is that their kids are being attacked and their families are being killed. Um, I, I just recently, I was just talking um, earlier that you know, we ha I have an Afghan uh, lady who's been reaching out. She was a police officer. They're stuck in Afghanistan. Her husband's been electrocuted by the Taliban because of her work, right? So, so it's they're targeted themselves, but, but also they, they go after their families to try and um, uh, uh, threaten them to stop their work. Um, they don't stop. They don't stop because they can't, because whatever they're fighting for is really for their kids and their families and their communities. And so we need to stand with them and, and um, enable them and, and not actually kind of erase them out of the picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, final comments on particular risks that men face in humanitarian contexts. It's a humanitarian and, and, and conflict and crisis context. I mean, it, it's a few things. Um, number one, uh, young men will are naturally, or sadly naturally, I should say, there is such a perception that if you're a young guy, you're dangerous. You know, you're a young Muslim man, you're a young black man. You're, it doesn't matter. It's and if you're if you're a you know in, in the context of Palestine, for example. Um, Women, in, in some ways, have more mobility because they're not perceived to be a threat. But a young man is perceived to be a threat, and so they're targeted. That, that's, that's one thing. The second thing is that back in 2008, we, um, we pushed very hard for, for Security Council resolution to recognize sexual violence as a threat to peace and security because when you have rape that's happening, it really inflames the conflict. Um, and at the time, we were trying to get language, specific language about the rape of men and boys as well as women and girls. And governments that were in the Security Council at the time said, no, no, this doesn't happen to men and boys. And so we changed the language to say people and civilians. So we had to have gender neutral language just to be inclusive of, of, what, of this issue. But we see this in many places, in, in, in Iran, for example, where I, was, uh, where I come from originally, um, in the 2009 protests, one of the things that happened was that men were being you know, um, arrested and raped, raped with bottles and, and, and things like that. And, and it's a way of emasculating, it's a way of, of trying to sort of really diminish and, and, and um, uh, kind of destroy m masculinity and manhood and, and so forth. So, so you see that as well, that they're being targeted for, 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 because they're perceived to be a threat, they're targeted for, in, terms of, in terms of sexual violence, and of course they're targeted for recruitment into armies and militias and, 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 and stuff. So in a country like Syria right now, over the last few years, it's become a country of women and kids because so many of the men have either died or they've left or, or they've, they've been forced to fight and, and they don't want to, you know, many don't want to. Thank you very much for sharing this um, disconcerting but very important information with our audience. Um, Right now, um, pleased to turn to Melissa Horn Albuja, our third panelist, who is the Acting Division Chief for Protection and Community Capacities in USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Melissa, thank you for joining us on stage as well. Thank you. First question for you is around innovation. What does innovation around women's leadership look like when talking about humanitarian response? 
Thanks. Um, I believe this morning, BHA's assistant to the administrator, Sarah Charles, mentioned um, that in our innovation work, it really matters who defines and prioritizes humanitarian problems and who's designing the solutions. And as Sonoma was just saying, um, we know that women are already leaders in their communities and responding to all types of um, humanitarian disasters, conflict, and the, the, the climate crisis as well. And NBHA, you'll be happy to hear, <laughs> we are re-envisioning how we approach humanitarian assistance and working towards a gender transformative approach that emphasizes women's agency and ensures that the protection of women and girls is a part of the DNA in every single humanitarian response that we're um, supporting. We want to advance a vision of humanitarian response centered around women and girls, exactly as you <laughs> so eloquently said. Um, putting women and girls as the primary implementers and beneficiaries of our assistance. And we, we know that they are critical in all aspects of humanitarian response, but we know that their leadership is essential in addressing gender-based violence in emergencies. Um, despite progress that's been made, gender-based violence needs continues to rapidly outpace us. Every year we see new disasters and they keep growing more complex and the, the risk of GBV are amplifying and increasing risks faced by women and girls. Despite this, unfortunately, the humanitarian community is not consistently prioritizing GBV prevention and response programming and the humanitarian systems, processes, and organizations are not truly centered around women and girls. I think COVID gives us an excellent example of this. Um, we saw that GBV um, dramatically increased across the world, um, specifically intimate partner violence. And despite a very swift and coordinated advocacy um, by actors all over the world, including the Secretary General, we didn't see the programming and the funding at the level and um, comparable with the needs that we were seeing women and girls were facing. Fortunately, BHA, with the leadership of um, Sarah Charles, did have protection as one of the priority sectors in our COVID response. But this, how there were many donors and actors who didn't include it or think that it was a critical part of the response. And we are actually seeing this play out right now with the global food security crisis. Um, I believe Administrator Powers was here yesterday just really underscoring that when food is scarce, it's really women and girls who are the hardest hit. They are the first to go hungry and also often the last to receive assistance. And as they look for water and food outside of their communities and households, they experience sexual violence. So really, you know, for the food security crisis as well, we really need to center our response around women and girls and ensure that protection services are a part of a comprehensive package in terms of responding to food insecurity. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, I'd like to jump to another question about what we're seeing in Russia and Ukraine right now. Um, can you comment on the um, on how USAID is innovating and modernizing your response to address the very real consequences and risks that we see women and girls facing there? Sure. Um, you know, <laughs> women and girls, like in most contexts, have been extremely hard hit um, with the escalation and conflict and the mass displacement that we are seeing, um, severe exacerbating risk to gender-based violence and other forms of exploitation and abuse, with trafficking and emergency being a significant concern, as well as their protection and the sh shelters inside of Ukraine. Um, from the onset, um, BHA worked to prioritize not only the protection of women and girls, but also women's leadership. Um, we were able to quickly deploy a protection expert as a part of our disaster assistance response team that was um, set up there in the region. Um, and she was able to provide real-time advice, technical assistance, um, support the development of protection programming, and to coordinate with protection actors and other actors um, on the ground. We immediately um, worked to increase our protection programming and footprint. We had about five protection partners from our work um, prior to the conflict, that we were able to scale up to now 16 partners, with six of those um, providing GBV prevention and response services. Um, we currently have a robust protection um, portfolio um, where we've committed over 72 million to date to support these different protection activities inside of Ukraine. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we uh, really look to instill or intentionally 
look for opportunities and innovative ways to fund local organizations, particularly local women's organizations. And not only did we do that with our funding, but we really pushed our partners to think creatively and innovatively about how they can equitably partner with local organizations who are already acting, we're the frontline um, workers um, in the Ukraine response. And we've really seen this, as I was explaining the gender transformative approach, this is really what we had in, in mind um, when we developed that, that approach. And we, we hope to have a lot of good lessons learned from this response that we can apply in other contexts. OK, thank you, Melissa. One final question for you. And I think that you were talking about this in the context of Ukraine, but perhaps we can expand this uh, beyond Ukraine. But can you talk about ways USAID is identifying opportunities to enhance the role that women play as first responders in humanitarian crisis contexts? In terms of our f funding for local women's organizations, um, uh, just we we're talking about the, the the roles that women and girls play as first responders, and and wh what have you identified as opportunities to enhance this enhance this role that they play? Yeah, um, so we are uh, looking at enhancing the role that they play by supporting them in a, a, a few different ways. Um, I think that supporting local women's organizations is a uh, a commitment that we have by the entire, or an aspiration of the entire humanitarian community um, that has had some challenges in terms of systemic barriers such as lack of access to funding mechanisms, um, also challenges with coordination and being able to part participate in the coordination structures that have been set up and equitable partnerships um, with um, international NGOs and UN agencies. Um, and some of those challenges and constraints that are <laughs> impacting their ability to be able to more fully do this um, are built into our own systems. Um, so there's no magic solution to, to better supporting them, but um, we're looking to identify multiple ways internally that would help us to be able to support directly as well as influencing the system. Um, a few different ways that we're doing that is to, uh, we're supporting a, a uh, international NGO to, to work with local women's organizations in a number of different human humanitarian response contexts, um, doing capacity sharing and equitable partnerships, and then collecting information and learning on that that we can apply to other contexts. So lifting up, really focusing on, again, equitable partnership and what that looks like and capacity sharing, recognizing that INGOs might have some technical expertise around budgeting, strategic engagement on donor engagement, while local actors really know the context and all are the first responders. We're also looking at different partnership structures, um, looking at exactly <laughs> supporting networks and consortia that already have a, a reach and are working with local women's organizations and how we can work through them um, and with them to be reaching these local women's organizations. Um, and exploring um, pulled funding mechanisms similar to the, um, the, the Peace Fund, the Innovative Peace Fund. There's also the Women's Peace and Humanitarian Fund that does rapidly disperse funding to support local women's organizations to empower them um, to be able to, to quickly respond, even those partners who can't access um, our assistance directly. And then it's also about leveraging our role as one of the leading humanitarian donors. And we need, we, we are advocating for equitable partnerships with local women's organizations between UN agencies and NGOs, between international NGOs and um, local actors. Um, but it really will require us as a global community to work collectively to shift our norms, to make it more focused on equitable partnerships if we are going to achieve what we've committed to women and girls, but also in terms of the localization agenda. It really require all of us playing our role in changing our systems, um, again, centering around women and girls, but also local actors who are, are there doing the first response. Sure. Thank you very much, Melissa. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. I think we'll jump right to questions from the audience um, to make the best use of the rest of our time. Quick question, do we still have um, Ifat available or, or did we happen to lose her? I know she's, again, joining us from Karachi. Okay, okay. Great, oh great, great, Ifat is still with us, okay. Um, so I'm going to welcome questions from the audience for all of our panelists, and what I'll do is take questions in threes. So we'll take three questions at a time, then we'll invite panelists to respond to them. So knowing that we're taking three questions at a time, please, um, if, if, if you don't mind, make the questions relatively quick, and um, raise your hand if you have a question. We'll come to you with a microphone, and please state your name, your affiliation, and then succinctly state your question. And it looks like we have a question, a couple of questions right here up front, and right here. Good morning. 
Good morning. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for your very insightful remarks. My name is Marisa Ensor, and I'm a professor in the Justice and Peace Studies program at Georgetown University. And uh, my question pertains to um, the relationship between protection and participation. Okay. So, um, Security Council Resolution 1325, for instance, uh, recognizes four pillars for action, one of which is protection, the other one is participation, as you well know. Um, it seems to me that in practice, these two tend to be considered in isolation, with those who focus on protection, um, tending to consider women as passive, vulnerable victims in need to be rescued, while those who focus on participation um, promote participation without recognizing that sometimes participation comes with a steep price. You know, over okay, th and over. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think we have the question. Okay. Thank you very, very much about <laughs> the relationship right. between protection and participation. We have a question right up here up front. Yep. Hi. And then we'll turn right here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Reed. I'm from CARE USA. Um, my question is actually for you, Melissa. Um, and it's about how you spoke about the opportunity that BAJ has as really the leading humanitarian donor um, and looking to influence the humanitarian system. Um, since the World Humanitarian Summit, obviously, we focused a lot on the grand bargain in order to do that. And there's been uh, a lot of work by women-led organizations, um, uh, UN agencies, donors, and INGOs uh, working on trying to bring a gender transformative lens to the grand bargain. Um, one that hasn't been successful up until now. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us a bit about how you see the US's leadership role in perhaps not even just the grand bargain in fora like the Good Humanitarian Donorship Fora and others, how you are pushing this and, and how you see being able to push this further. Thank you. Thank you so much. And a final question up here from the sir. Um, hello. Uh, thank you so much for the panel today. Um, I have a question. So I wanted to ask what are the in your line of work, what is the biggest misinterpretation about the way we're trying to empower women on the field? So I'm sure you, mo you have heard these stories about, um, so back home, the, there was a project to install a, a new flue of water to access to the village. And so as we went on, we saw that women would cut the, the, the pipes because they, it was the only time that they would go and gossip and talk and do anything. But then since the water was already available next to them, they were not really happy with this situation. So how do you at the same time empower women, but then try to help them in respecting their culture? Thank you. Thank you very much. So three ex excellent questions, one about protection and participation, a second question about the opportunity for BHA to influence the humanitarian system, third question about misinterpretation of, um, uh, of, of, of the things we've been dis discussing so far. Um, so would like to uh, invite Ifats because you're, you're online. Uh, any responses to the questions that we've seen? I think I'll talk about uh, women being misinterpreted uh, in different work fields. And we face it, you know, interestingly, in both um, the low income sector as well as the high income sector. As the telemedicine platform, our job is to um, create job opportunities for female doctors prominently who are unable to work because of a lot, a lot of cultural factors. In our experience, what we've seen is that when, once they start becoming, you know, financially independent, they start getting a lot of resistance from their families. They start getting a lot of um, uh, challenges in terms of, um, you know, uh, what are the things that they should be practicing or the ones they, that they shouldn't be. If I talk about the community dweller, there's a lot of misinterpretation in terms of the online doctor. So we actually have to go into communities, educate that this is a proper qualified doctor. Men often come in because, you know, in many ways, they just want that clinic to be shut down. There are a lot of rumors that start being spreaded for those community nurses, then, you know, they create this um, weird perception that, oh my God, if my wife goes into this clinic, maybe she'll be filmed 
and this is something that we had to really break in the initial years at least that you know your wife if she's coming to this clinic she's absolutely safe it is an absolutely safe space if there are women in the clinic the person on the other side of the camera is also a female and there is no camera which is recording your your wife or your family but this has been a major um, challenge um, where the service that we created uh, by a woman for a woman has been misinterpreted in many ways um, but then we had to you know work a lot in terms of educating people in the communities educating um, physicians and their families a lot of brands are now also working on this so for example unilever is actively working on it uh, in creating awareness um, around you know why women doctors should work we also have a couple of ad campaigns now in pakistan that you know if you have become a physician if you have become a nurse you need to work but again you know i think uh, it's not only the women we need to target but also their husbands their parents also their mother in laws because in pakistani culture mother in laws unfortunately hold a uh, hold a uh, huge stake in how a family functions especially if women when they are you know um, educated and they want to pursue their careers and all of that thank you very much for sharing those insights ifat um, i'd like to turn actually next to sanam um, for uh, comments particularly on the on the first question but on any of the questions we received sure um, i'm going to start with the last question actually the the culture question um, it's very simple ask the women I mean, just ask the women. Like, they, they have voices. They have, you know, like, I, I mean, and, and it's interesting because it's like, yes, we, the, the story of, of women walking, wanting to walk to the well, is it just, just a social factor? Is it that they enjoy the exercise? Is it, I mean, what are the elements that come with wanting to walk two hours and carry a heavy load? Maybe you can provide the water closer, but also make sure that they still have those other things that come from, from being able to walk. But it's amazing how we do not talk to women. Right, it's just, it, I don't know what, what happens, but we don't. Um, on the question of, of protection and participation, um, so again, this is, it's a very interesting question because as I said earlier, right now what we're seeing is that women who themselves become peace builders, who have chosen to take the risks of engaging and trying to mitigate conflict crisis, et cetera, are being targeted because of that work. And, and we, we do have a responsibility from an international standpoint to a, not do harm, and B, protect them. We, we developed a whole protection framework uh, in 2020 in, with massive consultation. It was a three-year pro program that it's, it's on our website. And um, you know, the UK government took it to the Security Council and to the OSCE, and lots of governments have emulated it and so forth. Afghanistan came and nothing was done, right? So, so it, there is an issue between policy and rhetoric and actual practice. Um, so that's a protection of those who become, who become specific peace builders. Um, we also mustn't infantilize women, right? People are choosing to take these steps, to be the ones who want to talk to the Houthis in Yemen or you know, do the humanitarian work on the border in, 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 in Ukraine and, and so forth. We have to respect them. We have to respect them and engage them to say, what do you do? What do you need? How do we help? How do we harm? Do you want me to, th you know, and when I invite you to the Security Council to speak, that's great, but let me, how, what kind of protection do we need? Because we've had people come to the Security Council and then they've been threatened on the phone while they've been there, right? So there's a huge amount of responsibility from the international side, but that engagement is absolutely critical. And then the third thing, um, when, when, again, with this Afghanistan crisis, we issued a 10 point, very practical 10 points um, letter to, to Samantha Power and to, to development agencies saying, this is what gender responsive humanitarian aid should look like in terms of who you send out, who you engage with, how you do it, et cetera, et cetera. It's on our website. And, and, um, and part of the reason why we did that was to say, you guys are the donors. You can tell the UN, if you demand it of OCHA, or if you demand it of the humanitarian agencies that you fund, for them to, to take responsibility for being, for being inclusive and so forth, they will have to do it. But if we don't have the governments asking this, those agencies won't do it either, right? So, so everybody has their role to play in this. And then coming to the, to the sort of actual practicalities and, 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 and what um, uh, USAID is doing, one of the things, again, we, we produced a, a couple of years ago was a funding framework to say what not to do. What not to do, what to do, and how to do it. Because so much of the problem um, in terms of engaging and really sort of getting to the potential that local, local organizations has, has to do with um, their reality. So UK government, for example, said they wanted to spend 
thousand pounds on Ukraine women humanitarian, but this year, right? In this, in one year, in this, or it wasn't even one. It's on a six month, six month period. They want nine hundred thousand pounds dispersed. That's a recipe for corruption. It just because if you know the local organizations, you know that it doesn't work. They can they can handle nine hundred thousand pounds, ten million pounds, but give them the multiple years that they need to be able to do that, and and give them the safety to be able to take the money as and when they need it. Because we when we dump money on small organizations, it it causes so much um, uh, other additional problems from the communities that they're in. So it's it's more around our own financial systems and structures and changing it, and then working with. You know, I'd, I'd love to work with USAID and others, but working with organizations like ours that, that actually have the mechanisms in place to say, here's a local organization, this is how you trust them, this is, and how do we then loop them into the international dialogues and discussions and so forth? Because that's also a, a big gap. You have the big humanitarian crises, uh, whatever, meetings, and, and the women just aren't present to say what the reality is, is on the ground. So, so w the ecosystem is there, we just need to connect the dots and actually make use of mm -hmm. the entities that, that are already in these spaces. Okay. Thank you very much. Then, um, Melissa, your response to the question particularly directed to USAID. Um, yes, I think that's a fantastic question. I think the grand bargain is an excellent opportunity for us to really employ this gender transformative approach as we kind of reinvigorate um, that the efforts around the grand bargain. Um, I know Friends of Gender have been, been working to kind of cross cut be cross-cutting in terms of the different work streams, including the participation revolution and the localization piece of it. Um, but I do think, again, that, that we're recognizing that we need to be you know, more intentional and conservative in terms of looking at each of those work streams or looking at different um, um, opportunities, whether it's with that, with uh, the IASC, whether it's in Geneva and looking at the multilateral um, space there um, to influence those processes, to really bring the gender transformative kind of approach and looking at key deliverables that we want to to move forward with we've we've had conversation that there's a lot of different things <laughs> that we want to have done and really as being strategic and picking a couple of um, pieces um, that we want to push forward and put all of our kind of effort behind um, and just I think we have a lot of opportunity right now with um, the White House Gender Policy Council and we having a, a new gender strategy that we are developing action plans and this gender transformative approach is part of what BHA is committing to. Also, uh, we're working with our state um, colleagues at the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration, hoping to, to re to launch the revision of our Safe from the Start initiative in the fall. So there are a lot of different pieces that I think are going to help us um, achieve this, um, both at the response field level, but again, looking at the system in ways that we can practically impact the system. So I think that it's also just a call to, to partners who are working in these spaces to, to come with us with concrete recommendations of practical ways that we can influence the system um, that will help us kind of make progress, move the needle um, on these you know, complex, challenging issues. Thank you very much, Melissa. We have time for three more questions, three more very quick questions. Um, and after those questions, I'll turn to final comments from each of our panelists, and then we'll wrap up. So, uh, so three more questions, though, from the audience. And I saw him the way in the back corner first. Hi, uh, thank you so much for, um, for your remarks today. My name is Rachel Moynihan with UNFPA, the UN Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency. It's great to see Dr. Ifat here. We are a funder and partner to uh, Sahat Kahani. Um, also empathize with having junior colleagues around. Um, uh, wanted to ask you, um, what, um, what do you see as the trend in integrating um, Afghan women and girls into your network, uh, given the dynamics of the region. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, question over here. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Faith, and I'm from Child Fund Alliance in New York. Thank you all for your great uh, intervention. For me, I think as uh, someone who's worked in this uh, humanitarian response for a long time and advocated for having the protection, especially SGBV, as a core part of humanitarian response. And we see that all of the time we do not get this sector as a core part of the response. So I just want to know from your work, both at the policy and at the practical level, what else can we do to make sure that protection is seen as a core part of the immediate humanitarian response? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. And a third question. 
question. Great, right in the middle there. Hello, my name is Nandar, and I'm studying at SIS and American University. I'm originally from Myanmar, and uh, we have a really big influx of refugee crisis uh, at uh, Rakhine State, where the genocide happened, and also after the coup, there is more and more uh, refugees crossing the border uh, to Thailand and India. So uh, my question is, what is uh, what is what can the international community do to protect those women uh, and children and girls uh, living in the refugee camps? As, uh, specifically, uh, they they are just like many of them are just stranded in refugee camps for like decades or even years until they get uh, to a third country. So, uh, for and that affect their education and you know like just well-being in general of these women and girls and it's so important to protect them at the refugee camp so like what kind of specific uh, mechanisms are in place and what can be done more to help them uh, uh, overcome the barriers at the refugee camps thank you very much for three excellent questions um, I believe the first question was directed to, to Ifat um, about working with Afghan women is that right yeah. So, so I think uh, uh, a very important question, especially given the current political situations, I think the challenges that we face is that twofold. A, for any doctor to work in Pakistan or you know, across the border, they need to have a valid Pakistan medical and dental license if they are a doctor. If they're a nurse, they need to have a valid uh, nursing license. However, having said that, while it may be challenging for us to recruit female physicians, the mobile application is available globally. So all the Afghan women who may have a smartphone can actually access the services. There are a lot of campaigns that we do even today where a lot of uh, those consultations are highly subsidized, a lot of times free also. For example, we work with the telecom partner in Pakistan, Zong, through which every first consultation that you, know, you do after downloading, the service is free of cost. Um, also, we are partners with Microsoft uh, and a couple of other uh, uh, entities, as I mentioned, British Asian Trust also, which enable us to create really subsidized uh, solutions for that. Very recently, we have partnered with Unilever, which has uh, allowed a nationwide free helpline with a doctor. Because we understand that, you know, the kind of dynamics that we live in and also a lot of Afghani people would live in is that they might not be owning a smartphone. But then a lot of people now have a feature phone. A lot of Afghani people would also have a feature phone. Again, that is an entirely free helpline. So if anyone has a feature phone in Afghanistan, they can, you know, dial in that number and access doctors free of cost 24-7. So that is, you know, how we feel we can at least do our bit in providing healthcare access to those communities. Okay, thank you very much, Ifat. Um, second two questions about um, what else we can do to make protection core to our response, and a question in particular to, um, to, to, uh, to Myanmar. So uh, open the floor to Sanam uh, and, and Melissa. Um, to the question about how we can ensure that protection is core to the humanitarian response, again, I do think that this requires a collective effort, again, looking at the child protection community, the GBV community, the protection community at large, as well as other actors, um, and influencing, you know, and advocating to influence decisions that are made in your own organization, influencing decisions being made by the HC in terms of the HRP, you know, and then trying to influence donors as well. We're, we're playing our part <laughs> with our, our own, working again with PRM to ensure that we're having robust funding um, at the onset of an emergency, but I do think that it has to come at every single level and not just influencing just the donors. We know that there are plenty of organizations that have funds and they're putting it towards other types of activities, so we need to ensure that we are inside our own organizations doing it, and then the HRPs as well, really ensuring that that's a strong message that all of us as a global community are putting pressure on to make sure it is at the right amount, because I think that we're seeing in most responses, it's not at the level it needs to be. Thank you, Melissa. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I've been doing this work for so long, and the story of what happens to women in refugee camps do they have sanitary pads? Do they not? Is there sexual violence? 
this has been something that in the 26 years I've been in this space, we keep repeating. And genuinely, I'm like, when are we going to have a summit to say what's it going to take and f really hold those who that are in the humanitarian space, the major organizations, accountable for their own strategies and, and to really monitor and evaluate. You know, I get, mon I get evaluated and audited 55 times by, by every donor that I have. What is happening to the millions and billions that are going and, and how are they being held accountable? There has to be some kind of punitive measure for not doing this work. Right, so, so I, think, I think we just have to, you know, it's institutional, but there, at some point it's got to be really serious and, and it's got to be um, uh, uh, mandatory. The second um, uh, issue is that um, on the question of Myanmar, um, I'm, I'm really sorry for what's, what's happening. Um, we are living in an era where literally we're throwing human beings away. I've just come back from Jordan and I was in a Palestinian camp and I was talking to, you know, 15-year-old kids um, their future is, is stunted because they get to 10th grade, if they're lucky they go get to technical school, 300 kids a year go to Jordanian universities, but they don't have any papers, they don't have any ID papers. So they all end up either being married off or working in the local grocery store. I met kids who want to be doctors and pilots and, and, and we're throwing them away and it's the same in all these countries. We need to have a complete reboot of how we think about humanity and how we think about places where we've had crises and conflicts and how we're handling refugees and IDPs. They are not the criminals. The Afghan women are not the criminals, um, right? We've handed a country to a bunch of terrorists and, and now we're, we're locking the women there and, and, and not letting them out. So we have to rethink the, this whole thing. And, and then with the innovation, it's if you're in a camp, bring the education, bring the opportunity for skills, and bring the opportunity. We do, we do online therapy now. My partners are doing online therapy and mental health care for Afghans. We were doing it between Somalia and, and Afghanistan and, and Nigeria when, when bombs went up. There's a lot that you can do if the resources are there. And we're, we're working with people who care. I, to me, this has is, this is now become the most important signifier. Do you have people who actually care about what needs to be done? Because if they care, they'll find solutions, and, and, the resor and then we need the resources from our governments and, and others, uh, others to, to, to deal with this. And also, we have to think about what the consequences are of, of, of throwing people away, right? What happens is that we're going to have a generation of kids all around the world growing up. The boys are going to be you know, pulled into militias and gangs and all that sort of stuff, and the girls are going to be probably forced into sexual exploitation. That's the universe that we are creating, and there's going to be blowback. And so there's going to be a point at which um, our generation is going to have to look and say, what have we created and what have we done? And, um, and I think the change has to start now. It really has to start now. And then finally, um, just going back to the local thing, you know, so often the perception from the international community is that when we say, you know, local organizations, they're like, oh, but they're risky. You know, and I've always wondered, what's the risk? Is it that they're going to be corrupt? Is it that they're going to give the money to terrorists? Is it that they're incompetent? Um, and, and it, we, we need to change that perception. We call it investing in trust. Because if you're risking your life to save other people, um, you're not going to go off and be corrupt for 10,000 bucks. It's just not worth it, right? You're doing, and, and frankly, you know, terrorism, I mean, look, if, with what we've done in Afghanistan, how much more can any of us individually do to enable terrorism, right? People on the ground that, have, or that are risking their lives to look after their communities, we have to trust them and we have to invest in the trust that they have. We don't have the access that they have um, and we don't have the commitment that they have, but we have the resources and we have the power. So it's that transformation that I think needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, pleased to turn now uh, for final comments from each of our panelists. And I'd like to focus on this theme of innovation. Uh, and we'll start with, with Ifat. Uh, final comments from your perspective. I think my perspective, especially if you talk about, you know, uh, humanitarian conditions or countries with major, you know, disaster challenges, healthcare challenges that, you know, you're talking about a country where, for example, a woman hasn't ever gone to a proper licensed doctor, you know, you're not um, talking about a country with, you know, the most latest IBM robot is, you know, doing different work. So I think the innovation needs to be very appropriate to the respective country. It can be something which um, is, you know, uh, very common in the other parts of the world, but it is an innovation for that part um, of the world because even, you know, the basic needs of that community or that country are not being met. So um, the innovation has to be really focused 
on which country and which service is being you know uh, catered to and and i think uh, women need to be really brought forward women are the next leaders um in terms of innovation in terms of technology in terms of healthcare in terms of disaster management i feel women are a lot better decision makers they're more empathetic they're they they they're really true to their cause and i think a lot of women really need to uh, be given the opportunity to come forth come forward and do this work in different parts of the world uh, yeah that's what i'd like to say thank you very much for giving your perspective on on this theme of innovation and thank you again for joining us from karachi we very much appreciate your time um turning to sanam now for comments um i think i've said a lot but i so, so two things i think i'd i'd leave one is harness the, pot the potential that's out there um i can imagine you know if we anticipate that we're going to see multiple crises and um floods and so forth why not put in place structures and people f to enable prevention and mitigation and have the skill set to do it. It's like having fire, you know, trained fire stations and, and uh, firemen and firewomen and, and, and stations. Um, and, and in a way, one way, one thing that I'm thinking about is, is that imagine if we started having a national civil service for young people, men and women, and, and they would be teams and they would learn how to do environmental work, humanitarian work, relief work, et cetera, et cetera. But they would be kind of an ecosystem that is in their own communities everywhere, and when the warning signs are there, when the problems, you have people who actually know how to respond and they have the resources and the materials. So, so it's kind of a new way of, not an army, but a civil service of, of, uh, of, of harnessing that potential of, of young men and women. The second uh, element in this is we have to work on engaging men in terms of celebrating and, and identifying the good in the guys. I, I am a firm believer that 99% of the guys out there are want to be good and are good, but if they're not, they don't have role models, and this was one of the things that I found in my research, I would ask me, well, who is your role model? And they just looked at me blankly, from Liberia to Jamaica to, to elsewhere. And so we need to bring out what it means to be a good man. And, and in Afghanistan, we had a partner who did a project with, with men, and she was working with the clerics and teachers and young men, and, and, um, and the clerics, and, and the story was, what, what we did was we first asked them, what, what are your experiences of violence and insecurity? And once we got the men actually talking about their own experiences, um, which they'd never done, it transformed them. And the clerics went into their pulpits and they started talking about violence against children and violence against the homes, and it transformed the whole community. And, and so that's the kind of thing we need to, we need men to be brave enough to speak about their vulnerabilities and then to be able to say, this is what a good man looks like. This is what it means to be a real man. Real men don't beat up people. Real men don't, you know, so, so just flipping that narrative and engaging men to be part of the protection and, mm. and addressing the, the problems, as opposed to thinking, you know, there's like, we just assume sexual violence happens. It doesn't need to happen. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, and Melissa? Yeah, um, I think just underscoring again what I had said earlier that we really collectively across the humanitarian community at, at every level need to you know, shift our mindset and put women and girls in the center in terms of as implementers and beneficiaries of our assistance. And again, I'm just like struck by the global food and security crisis where we see that data has demonstrated that women and girls are the most impacted, disproportionately impacted, 60% of them are food insecure. And why, and we should, and hopefully we are <laughs> within BHA, ensuring that that is a core part of how we're responding, understanding their needs, understanding what, how we deliver assistance to them, and making sure that that's what's driving our response, not as a secondary item that we're adding on to, but really it is core business. Core business for us is identifying them as ways to implement and ensuring that all of their needs are being met. So I think, again, just strong call for all of us to work collectively on that and definitely BHA is, is prepared to, to work with others in the humanitarian community and across uh, the, the networks um, to, to realize this vision. Great, thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, and thank you to, to our panelists for these final comments. Um, focusing on innovation, uh, and, and I think from what we heard, um, we heard excellent examples of innovation in terms of people, processes, and products. So um, I learned so much from your comments today. Thank you again for joining us, all panelists, um, uh, including those staying up very late uh, in Karachi and joining us in person. So thank you very much for joining us. We learned so much from you. I'd like to thank USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance for your support for today's conference. 
I'd like to thank the audience for joining us in person and online, and thank the CSIS Humanitarian Agenda for producing today's conference. You can follow that program um, at, at CSIS HUM Agenda. So hope, hopefully, we hope you'll follow us there, and thank you again for joining us today. It's a pleasure and honor for me to join with you this afternoon to discuss a very important and consequential topic of humanitarian innovation in data and information management. I'm Vemba Pezo Dizolele, Senior Fellow and Director of the Africa Program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We have heard of a staggering number of 274 million people in need of humanitarian assistance and protection this year, 2022. We live in a world that is obsessed and saturated with data. And the humanitarian sector is no exception. NGOs, local and international, collect data. Names, contracts, stories, cases, etc. This is what technology enables us to do. These organizations collect this data to be more efficient, to perform better. In other words, they do this to better support the vulnerable populations they are called to help. We know, of course, that good intentions do not always lead to good outcomes. We live in a world of hackers, crashes, and other risks. So data collection is also about managing and securing the information, and often very sensitive information. In some cases, it's literally a question of life and death. In some parts of the world, though, organizations still collect data the old-fashioned way, meaning through paper, pen and paper, sometimes pencil. And that is not no more reassuring than the new technology collection way that we have. So either way, we are confronted with uh, several questions and challenges which we hope our panel will answer today. They will discuss um, challenges and promising solutions in the collection, management, and use of data by humanitarian organizations. Our panelists will discuss the need for humanitarian data intervention in court, allowing for data and technology to be made available to local populations in the interest of better humanitarian responses. Our experts will also look at the challenges of accountability, transparency, and the ethical basis of power relations. Now I would like to introduce our panelists uh, in the interest of time, I will use the shorter versions of their bios. Uh, they have impressive backgrounds. And once uh, we finish the introduction, they will speak in the order in which they are introduced. Joining us in the room today is uh, Ziad al Ashkar. He's a PhD candidate and researcher at the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Washington University. Is that correct, George Washington? George Mason. George Mason. I always get those two confused. Pardon me. George Mason University. I didn't mean to start any war here. <laughs> I know in DC. His research focuses on the use of digital technologies and remote sensing by humanitarian peace building organizations. Ziad looks at the role that data collection and surveillance plays in this sector and how to develop and design responsible and ethical practices. Then in the room, we are also joined by Laura Walker McDonald, who is the Senior Advisor for Digital Technology and Data Protection at the International Committee of the Red Cross, where she's working to increase the delegation's awareness, understanding, and analysis of evolving new technologies and implications for the humanitarian aid and, to conduct, and the conduct of hostilities in particular, she focuses on the potential impact on the protection of the affected populations and humanitarian organizations, and new types of digital risks, such as cybersecurity, 
myths and disinformation and hate speech. Joining us online is uh, first uh, Maya Ilazic, who is the deputy head of the Joint Data Center on Force Displacement based in Copenhagen, Denmark. She previously was the deputy representative for UNHCR in Malaysia, where she worked towards the objectives of the global impact for refugees and UN Sustainable Development Goal Agenda, Goals Agenda, excuse me, in a national context. She brings over two decades of experience working in conflict and post-conflict areas and emergency settings in the Balkans, Southeast Asia, and Central Asia. Then we have Dr. Patrick Venk, who is joining us also online. He's the co-founder of Kobo Toolbox and an assistant professor in the Department of Global Health and Population at the Harvard School of Public Health and in the Department of Emergency Medicine. He is also the research director of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the mic to our friend Ziad, who will start, and we'll, take, we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, and let me start by thanking CSIS and BHA for getting us together today to talk about humanitarian innovation um, and where we are today as a sector. I think it's important for us to look at, I think, how far the sector has come in the past 10 to 15 years uh, on these issues. I think 10 to 15 years ago, there was a lot of enthusiasm and excitement about kind of the power and potential of technology to revolutionize the humanitarian response and revolutionize the field um, and the work that we do as a, as a sector and as a community. And I think in my opinion, at that time, um, there was a lot of kind of techno-utopian silver bullet ideas floating around. And I think we've come somewhat, um, we got caught in it a little bit. And I think the sector has since matured a little bit, which is good. Uh, there's a bit more realism about you know, what technology can and cannot do. Uh, and most importantly, I think there's a realization of the very real harms that can, that can occur from the use of technology and data collection. And I think in part this comes from an improved and gained expertise that we have now in the sector that maybe 10, 15 years ago wasn't um, as prevalent. Um, and we built, built better capacities to do this work better um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think the reality is that we've had a few incidents and uh, things have happened within the sector that helped us, uh, that forced us to rethink our approach. Uh, we've the role that civil societies played in this has been huge in pushing back and pushing us to think and be more principled in our work. Um, but of course, I think we still have a lot of work to do and a lot of ways to improve as a whole. So I think if you look back in kind of the you know, late 2000s, early 2010s, at where the sector was, uh, there was very little bit, little guidance about what ethical and responsible data collection uh, looks like. You know, if you looked at the sphere standards, for example, uh, and I, you know, if you go back into the 2007 version or 2012 version, there's very little mention of data responsibility and data collection. You know, you can just go do a control F search, maybe seven hits in a $500, uh, 500 pages document. Um, but now kind of in part, thanks to a lot of the panelists here today, there's a lot more guidance. We have handbooks, we have more conversations about these issues um, and agree, agreed upon principles about how to do um, building partnerships and how to do data collection and engaging with technology in a lot more responsible way. Um, and I'm gonna make a quick note right now, there is the inter, uh, the Interagency Standings Committee has an ongoing survey about looking into changes that needs to be done on data responsibility for operational guidance. So I really encourage uh, those of you in, that work in this field to go online, engage with a survey, because I think this is kind of one way we can make things, uh, make things better. Uh, but I still want to note that I think there's still plenty of long way for us to improve accountability to begin with for the sector, uh, long way to improve transparency on a lot of the ways we do data collection, a lot of ways we do private partnerships with the tech sector. Um, and I believe as we talk about kind of localization as a sector and a community, uh, we really cannot continue doing business the way we have. We really must change uh, we need, uh, the way we approach um, partnerships, we need meaningful engagement, um, and frankly, I think we need to seed space and power in a lot of different ways. Um, and so just briefly, kind of, just to kind of wrap up, I know we've got a two more minutes. Um, for me, when I think about innovation and the research that I've done in the space and the work that I've done, 
I think there's three main issues at play. I think first is a technical issue. You know, do we as a community have the necessary technical capacity to do this kind of work right? To be able to build the kind of partnerships that will be sustainable, equitable, and principally driven? And so that's one. The second is an organizational issue and organizational uh, dynamics. Do we have the organizational structures and the willingness and desire within those organizations to truly change the way um, that we work as a sector and community? And then third and lastly, I think there's a political component at this, a political economic component. Is there really political will to make sure that these efforts have long-term backing and support? And I think this is where it's key. Uh, the first two cannot happen without this political will and support. And if we don't have the buy-in from the top quote-unquote humanitarian leadership and a buy-in from donor governments and institutions, I think we will hit a wall. We will continue to see this cycle of three to five year projects and innovative cycles that really don't lead, don't, don't do much. Um, and so I'll wrap it up here and I'm very much looking forward for the discussion for my panelists uh, and for Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Ziad. Uh, couple takeaway, um, I think primarily is the challenges, organizational challenges and structural challenges, just capacity. Yeah. And then two is the lack of political will, which is key for any change that we can bring about in this space. All right, thank you very much. We'll uh, go to Maya in Copenhagen, if you can uh, intervene now, five minutes, and then we we'll go to Laura, and then we'll conclude with Patrick. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. And, and uh, thank you very much for, to CSIS for inviting me to this uh, interesting discussion. I really feel privileged to join this panel with, uh, with Ziad, with Laura, and, and with Patrick, and with you. Um, when I read the introduction to this conference, um, it sets out an objective to explore the way in which innovations uh, in people, processes, and products can improve responses to, to humanitarian needs such as forced displacement. And, and I thought to myself, in this sense, the World Bank UNHCR Joint Data Center on Forced Displacement, where I come from, the setup, is a, is a new approach to addressing complex and protracted crises. Uh, when the center began its journey two and a half years ago, we identified some of the main data gaps in the forced displacement context. It, became, it really became clear to us that we needed to focus on contribution, um, on our contribution to, to, to dramatically improve the quality, quantity, and accessibility of microdata on, on refugees, on internally displaced, stateless people, and their host communities. Um, so the center's goal is to enhance the ability of, of, of stakeholders to make timely de and, and evidence-informed decisions that can improve protection and well-being of affected people, like you also emphasized, member. But innovation is a critical element in this effort. And so we're pursuing four strategic priorities, and, and please um, allow me to, to, to elaborate a little bit here. Um, the four strategic priorities are, one, strengthening data systems and standards, two, increasing high quality data collection and analysis at country level, three, supporting responsible access to data, and finally, the fourth, building evidence and sharing knowledge across the community. And the Joint Data Center essentially combines the comparative advantages of two major development and humanitarian uh, institutions, namely, the analytical capacity of the World Bank and its ability to link displacement data to other key socioeconomic data. And on the other hand, the access of UNHCR to information about refugees, stateless people, IDPs, as well as the overview of the legal protection and policy frameworks in, in, in host countries. So we sit squarely on the nexus of development and, and humanitarian uh, efforts. And, uh, and it allows us to act as a catalyst, working with our parent institutions and, and other, many other partners in new ways and to support transformative data and evidence opportunities to enable a sustainable change to affected populations. So ultimately, we're a public good addressing the need of both affected governments and populations, while also ensuring that all the results that we produced are widely available. And, and I'm going to just dive in very quickly into an example so that it becomes a little concrete for you from our work. 
So quality and comparable data on the forcibly displaced and host populations is much needed for development programs and policies that can complement humanitarian interventions. I, this was uh, as, as late as, as, as in May, when I was in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I spoke with several development partners and it was so evident that they were uh, thirsting for, for socioeconomic data on IDPs and, and refugees in order to, to in, uh, feed into their programs. Yet refugees and IDPs and stateless people are largely invisible in national statistics, in recurring socioeconomic international surveys, such as the Demographic Health Survey, the World Bank Poverty Surveys, that can enable such interventions. And during the pandemic, we, we faced an extraordinary challenge in this regard. The, pan, the pandemic essentially hindered the traditional ways of, of, uh, of collecting data in, in developing countries. It was simply not possible to rely on the face-to-face -face survey. And other methods had to be identified and it had to happen quite fast. So mobile phone survey techniques uh, have gained sophistication and have largely been able to complement traditional survey techniques. The World Bank led the way by introducing uh, data collection through high frequency phone surveys. And the joint data center was well positioned to facilitate and support the extension of these phone surveys to include refugees and IDPs. So as a result, more than 100,000 interviews have been conducted with forcibly displaced households and host populations in at least 10 major host countries, including Burkina Faso, Chad, Ethiopia, Yemen, Iraq, Jordan, and, and a few others. So this helped really obtain more timely and comparable data on how those displaced were faring during the pandemic in terms of food security, participation in education, access to health, among other themes. And, and I'll give you just two quick examples on, on, on such data. So in Chad, it emerged that over the course of the pandemic, only one third of refugee households had pre-pandemic level access to food. 82% of refugee households have experienced severe food insecurity since the beginning of the pandemic compared to 54% of the Ch Chadian households. And in Djibouti, host households that did not have access to health services were, uh, were needed, cited crowded health centers or hospitals, 48%, and the inability to pay out-of-pocket out of pocket fees, 24% uh, of the respondents accounted for. As the main, and, and this was the main reasons for not receiving care. Whereas refugees instead reported the inability to pay fees, 38%, or afford the trip, 31%. So a purely cash issue. And to, to conclude the opening here, this data has really allowed operational colleagues to better prioritize design and target interventions, considering not only basic needs, but also more nuanced socioeconomic information. These are just two examples out of a, a 55 activities portfolio. And, and we recently came out with a second annual report, which, which, which I would encourage you to read. It gives you uh, more information about uh, the efforts that we put in here and, and the thinking behind our work. So with this, I hope that, that I, was, I was stringing on to, 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 to Ziad's uh, uh, presentation and your in, introduction, Wemba. But I really look forward to, to uh, engage in the discussion of this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. I think the takeaway here uh, will be just the importance of data. I think if I heard you right, data really stands between the needs and the quality of support that this community gets. If it's not recorded properly, then that can determine how much access they really get to support. And I think still, when we go to q and I'd like you to think about what are the vulnerabilities in that data collection? Who uses it and what for and how is it protected? Uh, with that, we will go to Laura. Your five minutes, please. Thank you. And thank you so much for the invitation to join the panel. I wish I could cede my minutes to my colleagues on the panel to hear more uh, of what you had to share. It's fascinating, Maya. Thank you. Um, and Ziad also. And I'm looking forward to the conversation. 
Um, so just first of all, a word about the International Committee of the Red Cross in case anyone's um, coming across the ICRC for the first time. We're part of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, um, which is made up of over 190 national societies like the American Red Cross here in the US um, and the federation that brings them together to provide um, support in the event of natural disasters and, and also a range of other health uh, and other interventions. The International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, which I work for, is a neutral Swiss organization which is independent um, and uh, over 150 years old now. And we support communities who are affected by conflict and other situations of violence all around the world. Um, we're also the guardians of international humanitarian law and help to think through how that law can be applied and can evolve in this changing world that we live in. Um, and my role is around specifically digital technologies and data protection, although I increasingly think of it as digital and other technologies um, because there's more to life than just digital and ones and zeros in, even these days. Um, and what, the role that I play here in Washington um, within the delegation is really just a few things I wanted to, to talk about today just to, as a jumping off point for the conversation. One is... Um, how technology, first and foremost, how technology is impacting the people that we serve. So communities are themselves digital actors now and have digital lives and footprints, which can be very helpful to them in the event of an emergency to get life-saving information, to keep in touch with loved ones. But that digital footprint can also become a risk and can lead to them being targeted and, and other, um, or the, the victims of fraud and other things. So we now operate in an environment where the communities we support, we must assume, have this digital life. And the role that we play in that, to recognize that as a potential source of risk, or to support that digital life, to support access to connectivity, is something that, as a humanitarian organization, we must consider. Um, and of course, we also use technology in providing assistance, and, and um, there have been some, some really good examples so far. Um, and I think there, the issue is, is doing it right, doing it responsibly. So whether it's gathering the right data in a responsible manner for evidence-based decision-making to actually use it with, um, with the plan to do that beforehand is critical. Um, equally, we have placed a strong emphasis on data protection at the ICRC, um, and I can talk about that a little bit in a minute. But I think for me, um, I've worked now for over 12 years in digital and in development and aid, and I think the critical thing is understanding what some of those impacts are. We know really very little um, about things like the specific impacts and harms and, and, and how it can help to have connectivity in an emergency, and what happens when that goes away, and what happens when you provide it for people. Um, equally, um, you mentioned in the introduction, misinformation, disinformation, and hate speech is playing huge roles in conflicts all over the world. It's been very visible in Ukraine, but I think we must recognize that that's because there's a lot of English language content available. There are many conflicts around the world that are going on where there is mis- and disinformation, and it is extremely impactful, but perhaps less visible to us as an international community. Um, and then uh, the final thing that I will just bring up, uh, I can talk more about our approach to data protection if anyone's interested, um, but we also operate as a humanitarian entity with a particular role and mandate in the digital world, and that's complicated for us too. We also have to send email and gather data and store it somewhere, thinking about how we can do that in a way that maintains the confidenti confidentiality of that data that we collect, that people entrust us with, which is a huge part of our access to communities and the reason that they can ask us for help or tell us things they need us to know is if they know we can keep it confidential and navigating that in a world where all this digital infrastructure is provided by the private sector, much of it based in countries who are not neutral in our international order is an extremely tricky proposition and something that we're thinking through in some depth. Um, we are bringing a few solutions to that party and um, so we as I mentioned, we do have our data protection office and they are always thinking about this issue. We have a new delegation for cyberspace that just got started in Luxembourg, um, which is, uh, has a strong um, uh, agreement with the state of Luxembourg around how we store and manage our data. Um, and we're also going to launch in September some new research on the potential for a digital emblem that would help protect entities and objects that would be protected under international law if they flew a Red Cross, Red Crescent, or Red Crystal emblem but they're online, so how do we say this, actually this is a protected server or data or this transmission is protected? Um, so I'll stop there, but um, looking forward to the conversation and, and thanks so much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Laura. I think uh, this was very insightful as well, like the previous presentations. The challenges here, from what I understand, is responsibility in the collection of data, responsibility in managing that data, which is safeguarding it, and then I think this touches on some of the uh, the issues that we have, we studied on. Is there a, an international protocol on how to handle this data that organization get? But we can delve into those when we open up for Q&A. We'll turn now back to our friend Patrick Vink, who is joining us uh, online. Patrick, the mic is yours. Five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, to everyone and, and, uh, for uh, uh, inviting me. And uh, it was great to hear from my colleague there. In fact, it's, uh, it's nice to be last because it will afford me to not have to repeat a lot of the very important and good points that have been made. And, and instead, I will focus on, on two things. I will, I will actually focus not on technology. I'll focus on, on people and on, on policies and processes. Uh, before I do that, though, let me restate what I, I think has been transparent in, in, in what has been said, which is that data and technology have brought important gains to the humanitarian uh, uh, sector, that there have been major success and, and fundamental changes that, that have been en enabled by new technologies and, and new ways in, of collecting data since that's, that's the topic today. Um, but, you know, um, at the same time, there are challenges. Uh, now, let me point again that the needs in the humanitarian sectors are growing. Every year we see appeals growing in, in finance, financial appeals not being met. Uh, uh, so that gap has only been growing. And again, the importance of having data to guide investment when the resources are limited is, is important. So is the need for evidence about what works and that, what does not work. And that can really only be achieved by improving how we collect, process, analyze, gain insights into, into our, our work so that we can be more effective. Now I've mentioned effective and, and one of the key challenges is how do we balance effectiveness with protection, consideration for ethics. And, and, and that's really what we need to emphasize is that uh, gains are important and are needed, but it cannot be at all costs. Um, importantly, too, data and technology are a means towards more fundamental trans transformation of how we are operating in what we are doing and how we are doing things. Um, and, and here I cannot um, understate how fundamentally separated the digital transformation of humanitarian action has been from the localization agenda, from accountability. It's almost as if those two things were completely separate, not talking to each other, and frankly, at time, contradicting each other. And, and that is not helpful because the, the fundamental change that is needed is around localization, is around accountability. So we cannot continue and advancing in a digital transformation that is frankly largely, again, it's big picture thing, but largely ignoring those, those important changes. So let me go back to what I said I would talk about. People, policies, and process. So on the people side, side I, I just mentioned it. I just mentioned how little inclusivity, systematic consultation, effective consideration for local partners and, 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 uh, and communities there is in technological choices. Um, we advance solutions that are proprietary that local humanitarian actors will not be able to use in the long term that cannot afford licenses. Um, you know, these are considerations that we, we need to have. How do we build a more durable and, and, and sustainable response operations where when crises are likely to repeat themselves and not treat partners as this is what you need to do, this is how you're going to do it, and this is the tool you will use. That's not an effective uh, 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 approach. There is also, again, I, I'm sorry, I will make big, big uh, uh, generalization, but this we've seen it in this field, this very insufficient concern for unintended consequences of the digital transformation. The shift of burden that technology brings and putting the burden of having a cell phone, being able to connect, having cards that function, that burden is now on the community itself. The, the, the burden of dealing with access points to get cash 
um, that's now on the community itself. It used to be different. And so we really need to think about those burdens and, and what it means for how we are operating. And again, the efficiency gains that may be perceived on the humanitarian side cannot, and I'm sorry, I'm being under attack by mosquitoes, so you'll see my hands move a little bit, but uh, those efficiency gains really need to be balanced with those protection concerns, for example. Um, and finally, on the people side, I will just note the, the major gap. We are increasingly asking difficult technological uh, skills from people, from partners, from local actors, and yet we don't have the resources to train, to build those skills, to, to enhance uh, uh, digital literacy, for example. So major issues around people. Now, let me turn to the policies and process. I, I hope I have time. Uh, as Ziad mentioned, and I think uh, 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 Laura mentioned as well, we've seen major gains in the framing of the use of technology in the guidance around ethical data collection. This, is, this has been, there's no question that we know a lot better what to do and how to do it. But there are still major gaps when it comes to enforcement, when it comes to accountability, when it comes to oversight around some of the data practices, uh, 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 for, example, for example. And especially when it comes to oversight by and for communities. And so we go back to the localization um, uh, aspect. And separately, a lot of these policies and processes are kind of not necessarily addressing big fundamental question about the transformation of the role of humanitarian actors. We see actors providing services to government on social safety net, on, on technology, uh, humanitarian organization being uh, becoming almost uh, uh, digital service providers. Now with that comes a range, I'm not going to judge whether it's good or bad, but with that come a large number of questions of responsibilities about uh, uh, disengagement, about the ethics of data sharing, about, but these are really fundamental questions that needs to be addressed and for which we need to think through the policies and process to which they can be maybe approach or, or, or use. We've seen humanitarians becoming a source of data. We know that everyone collecting more and more data and we've seen what challenges and risks come, come to that. Just as a small example, we've only begun and there's been very limited discussion as to how the digital transformation of humanitarian action is changing humanitarian access negotiation. There's of course a very famous uh, example from Yemen and a few places where data and access to technology became a big part of the, the negotiation. But how do we handle that when it's going to become a systematic question about who has the data, who collects the data, who, who would have it? And again, remember that local actors do not have the protection or the means that are afforded to international ones. That is very easy for United Nations to say, well, of course we don't give data to, to the government, but the local da actor that collects the data for them, they don't have the same level of protection. They don't have the ability to say, of course, we cannot give you the information we have. And so we really, again, need to fundamentally think about what, what we, we need to do here. So I'll stop here. I'm probably uh, uh, out of time. I, I have not talked about technology. I've talked about people, policies, process, and, and we can talk about more things. But, but the consequences for technological choices are obvious and, and, and important. And we still see ineffective solutions, not durable ones, bad data practices in the field. And so this is a very current and, and important problem. So thank you for, for convening us to discuss about this. And uh, if, if we can even just inch towards solutions, that would be amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, a few challenges that you laid out um, and takeaways there. First of all, that data is important and needed, but it should not be collected at all costs. In other words, there is limit. I think the moral limit of it, the ethical limit of, of that process. You also talked about uh, digitalization uh, the role that it plays in the transformation of the humanitarian space, but that how that is key to localization. I think this brings some questions in terms of the friction that you presented between people and the processes. How do we use digitization or data in settings where society at large is not actually digitized? So uh, Maya was talking about a DRC, 
we heard about Chad, I'm sure if we think of Afghanistan, well, a lot of these spaces are not particularly up to date when it comes to technology. So where is that balance really? And I think in a way it's almost like you have uh, on one side the guardians of the galaxy with their data and the, po the vulnerable population that they're supposed to serve that almost don't have access to that. So on, on, on that note, I think I'll have a question for each of our panelists and then we'll open it to you, the audience, because we really want to have, it's a conversation. We have a lot of knowledge in the room. There's no point for me to be here monopolizing this conversation when in fact knowledge may be with you. Uh, so Ziad, we'll start with you. In uh, all the stuff that you said, I want to know how could um, an established international charter help facilitate a convention for data collection in the humanitarian space? Is that possible? Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, is that possible? I think looking at the way the international system is right now, I'm a little bit skeptical that we can come to an international data agreement on humanitarian uh, data collection and principles and, and the way we do it and regulatory frameworks and, and, and international governance uh, mechanism. Um, so I think an international agreement I don't think is possible in the short term. I think there's a lot of there would be a lot of politics involved. But I say this, it does not mean that we should not be working within the UN system, within the international community, within partners who are interested in building, you know, building governance structures, building in to the points being brought, brought in today, accountability mechanisms, building in standards, building in ways to have feedback loops to the uh, communities who are most impacted by this. I think there's a lot that we can do um, as a, as a humanitarian sector, as humanitarian agencies, um, some of the work that's being done, you know, by the ICRC on, on data responsibility handbooks or on with OCHO Center of Humanitarian Data on building, you know, capacities, building processes. So I think there's a lot that could be done that could be then applied to the broader humanitarian community. Um, I unfortunately don't see, you know, I know there's a lot of conversation happening about do we need a digital Geneva Convention, for example? I think the conversation about digital emblems is critical and so important, um, but I, unfortunately I can't see an international, you know, governing 196 countries, um, uh, data, uh, data responsibility um, mechanism. You know, a lot of countries around the world still to this day don't have a data responsibility laws or data privacy laws on the books. You know, I think roughly it's about 67 to 68% of countries uh, have one. The United States, you know, to, you know, it's, it's a very, for example, you know, there is no real national, national laws. It's, it's, it's down to the states and there's work that's being done on that level. And so I think we're far away, unfortunately, from a global international governance uh, of data for humanitarian uh, response, but I think there's a lot of work that can be done um, that, that ought to be done. But you mentioned earlier political will. Talked about political, yeah. the lack thereof. It's hard to herd, uh, to herd all the cats, all the various countries of the world to come together. But can Western organization be subjected to a code of conduct or code of ethics that may be voluntary but can start the process? I would say I think a lot of them already do have codes of conduct and already have process procedures and kind of follow, follow specific principles. I think one of the big things we come back to is, as humanitarians is that, you know, our fundamental guiding moral compass are the humanitarian principles. Um, we can debate whether or not, you know, we should, we should neutral, the role of neutrality, but I think today, you know, we have fundamentally a do no harm approach. A lot of humanitarian, you know, guide our work and humanitarian principles um, guide a lot of the work of humanitarian agencies. So I think, you know, we've seen a lot of codes of conduct come up. I think the problem becomes if there's too many of them, then it becomes an ad hoc approach. Um, and that was kind of the issue, you know, I think early in the 2010s and 2015s is that we had a lot of ad hoc uh, code of conducts that is not, you know, representative of the whole community. So I think any effort to kind of bring the community together to build one system, to build uh, um, a shared vision of what is responsible data use, I think will go a long way to A, improving accountability, improving, I think, transparency is key. I think this is one of the issues that 
there's very little transparency about how we do collect data and what we do with the data and who gets access to it. There's also transparency about the contracts that the humanitarian sector um, gets into with the private technology companies. And so I think there's a lot of ways, to your point, that we can be doing um, that we ought to be doing, and we're still not doing it. Okay. So it's not exactly the Wild West, but it's close. It's better than, okay. than it used to be. Well, All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, Maya, I would like to come back to you about that disparity that you described earlier, about the data collection itself, but also how that stands on the way for access to services for a lot of these families or these communities. If you can talk a little bit about the vulnerabilities there. Thank you. That's a bit of a difficult question for somebody like me because we're, you know, even though in, in my past life I, I was a protection officer in the field discussing this, I would have to pull on my experience from, from there. Whereas, you know, what, what I can talk about in the context of data for us is more uh, data protection. So okay. um, would, it, would it be good for me to maybe address the, the, some of the work that has been happening in, in, uh, in the UN Refugee Agency in terms of, of developing a microdata library and, and working with data protection sort of concretely and trying to unlock some of those assessments and surveys that we have uh, uh, th that we unfortunately too often have sitting on uh, in the offices precisely because there are some deep data protection uh, uh, challenges. Okay, please go ahead. Okay. Um, and, and so essentially the, the point of departure is is the fact that we need the data as we've established um, and that uh, that it's, it's really complex to manage. Um, and, uh, and in that complexity, at the same time, we're also faced with the fact that the, the cost of not using some of the data that is st stuck in, in, in many offices uh, because of data protection uh, concerns is, is simply too high. We we're faced with, with growing, uh, growing needs and, and, and growing uh, populations uh, uh, being displaced. So what we did essentially uh, with all this in mind, we mobilized, we mobilized uh, our expertise in the joint data center to support UNHCR to deliver on its data transformation strategy. And that's, I, I recognize this word from, from the conversation already. Uh, so that's something that the UN Refugee Agency is also going through. And, and the idea was we need to unlock the value of the existing data from surveys and assessments so that this data can, can be responsibly shared within and beyond UNHCR. Um, we facilitated the, the, the collaborative transfer of expertise, and this is where it gets really interesting because the World Bank has knowledge and tools and, and great experience in, in managing uh, uh, data being a leading institution in household survey data of, of individuals. Um, and they were able to transfer this, uh, this uh, wealth of, of expertise to UNHCR to enable a setup of a microdata library in UNHCR. And part of the pr project was, was, based, was, was a team of cur curators that would compile data inventories across UNHCR and put them into to, to place in the processes to take the data sets identified to publication. And so this required a pipeline through which data is checked, it's cleaned, it's an anonymized, it's, it's documented, and it, it has been developed through, through really close collaboration with the experts in World, da World Bank's data group. And, and then it's being institutionalized rigorously in, U, in UNHCR with guidance and training and governance. And so this means that data is now stored on UNHCR servers and covered consistently by its data protection policy. And, and just to give you an example of what a stark contrast that has been, because I've been sitting in the situation in a field operation where I would have a request for data from another organization, from the government, and I would need to, to sit and look at our data protection policy, uh, which at that time, I have to say, wasn't, wasn't as, as good as it, is, as it is becoming now, um, 
and, and basically make an on-site decision, you know, can we share this data or not? And, and I have to say that as a protection officer, I'm good at international human rights law and, and humanitarian law, but to make a decision like that in real time was quite, uh, quite an onus. So this process of that, that follows the microdata library is, is, uh, is really something that, that, that I think is revolutionizing uh, uh, UNHCR. And so the library runs on an application that was developed and is maintained by the World Bank uh, Data Group and that has been adapted to meet UNHCR's needs through, through uh, regular information exchange. And, and these consistent setups and approaches mean that UNHCR microdata library is fully interoperable with the World Bank microdata library. So building on, on this expertise and learning also from private and public sector outside of forced displacement, outside of the humanitarian space, the microdata library was launched in 2020 and now holds more than 470 data sets. Um, and if we talk about the access, and, and we can talk about access and use later on, but maybe I can just say now to sort of round up on, 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 uh, on this part of, of making the data available. I think, I think what's really important is that when you put together two institutions like UNHCR and World Bank, and when, you, when you're able to transfer this kind of expertise from the World Bank into UNHCR, you're not just giving UNHCR a, a robust and rigorous way of, of, of sharing data and unlocking this wealth for, for programming of not just them, but also other organizations. You're also teaching or, excuse my, for lack of a better word, you're also transferring uh, the, the, the learnings of sensitivities of the forcibly displaced into the World Bank, who is doing a lot of surveys and who's increasingly uh, paying attention to vulnerable populations out there. So what I'm what I'm trying to add to to this angle is essentially that the, the knowledge transfer is two ways. You're releasing data, but you're also sensitizing to to the protection needs of of populations that are, are particularly vulnerable. Okay. Maybe I stop here, and we can elaborate further on use and and, and the rest. Oh, this was very helpful, Maya. Thank you very much. So we'll go back to Laura. <laughs> um, you talked about the uh, emblem to say, please don't touch this. Um, so question really is, what principles and guidelines shape the ethics of that data collection and security in international setting? And then how does this idea of don't touch this is taking hold, if it is, mm -hmm. and what's the future of it? Gosh, I hope everyone else heard MC Hammer just then. <laughs> Okay, I just dated some of us, but there's some blank faces in this room, and that's frightening. Um, okay, so I mentioned that the ICRC has a data protection office, and that's because we're old enough that, uh, and we have a particular mandate under the Geneva Conventions, which still apply online, and we think are fit for purpose um, for that. The, when it comes to the laws of war, the Geneva Conventions can be updated when new weapons and new approaches come along. Um, they can be updated by the way, in the way that they are applied and the way they are understood, and then they don't necessarily need an update, we believe, um, to handle things like, autom like um, AI and machine learning and um, automated targeting systems and things like that. That's an aside. Um, but we, so the national data protection or regional data protection legislation that you've heard about, perhaps you've heard of the, the general data protection regulation in, or GDPR in the EU, we have similar legislation coming up here, doesn't actually apply to the ICRC, but we do need to be accountable and we do need to have rules that govern the data that we collect. So we have a, a data protection framework, which you can download and read, it's online. It's governed by a data protection office um, that guides our offices and our delegations around the world on what, and, and our HQ on what to do, make, making these tricky decisions that Maya described um, around how to handle data. And we have an independent commission board that oversees that as well. So you can go and have a look at that. Um, but I think to your point about, you know, um, there's two things I think maybe that I might just say quickly. One is that I think this, where this really lives, where it sings, where it really happens, is not necessarily in the drafting or the application of these regulations. It's in them being understood by the people who have to implement them every day. Um, and I think there, 
you know, I used to think of this as there needs to be a carrot and a stick. So there needs to, there needs to be incentives within organizations and it needs to be in your job description and your performance evaluation that you implemented things like um, data protection rules. Um, and I, I always look at, um, it's not the same, but the example of sexual exploitation and abuse within the humanitarian aid system, there was a big outcry about that a few years ago. Um, some agencies who had offices dedicated to this topic at HQ and they had trainings and they had a system, there was certifications, there was review, there was an ombudsperson, still these things were widespread and there were, it was instructive to see the scale of renewed investment in those areas after the outcry had happened because I think that tells you the scale of institutional investment that needs to happen to make something like um, protection of, of folks from, from sexual exploitation and abuse happen. Same thing with data protection. You can have all the data protection officers you want, but there are multiple things that have to get, happen within an organization. It's not just incentivizing and telling someone to do it. It's a giving them the tools to do that. So that's about capacity. That's about understanding technology. It's about having systems in place and it's not just about digital data either. Um, there's a wonderful scholar called um, Elizabeth Egan who works a lot with uh, Data and Society and the Ford Foundation. And she said to me once that she was doing an interview with someone in a civil society organization in Eastern Europe about data protection and sitting in a room with boxes and boxes of physical paper wondering, you know, what would happen if she just walked out with one of those boxes? Like, what, are this, what is in there? Um, and I think, you know, the same conversation comes up when we're worried about digital data and we're not paying attention to what happens with, you know, what's the, what are the basic systems at work in this organization? And I think we have to also disaggregate, it's not just about data protection, a subset, a very important subset of protecting data and being responsible with data is cybersecurity. And here again is a whole wing of critical infrastructure upgrades that the humanitarian sector needs and, and can't really afford. You might know that the ICRC itself was hacked this year, um, or actually last year, and, and that was discovered in January. Again, if you Google it, you'll be able to read all about it on our website, because we were as transparent as possible, because it's important for people to know that if the Red Cross can be targeted um, to try to access our very sensitive data, so can all the other organizations who, and we've been hearing about all this sensitive data that is collected, and it's a fact that most organizations can't resource the type of cybersecurity operation that would be required to really keep that data safe. Which brings me back to values, which I wanted to talk about in terms of ethics and principles. I think your personal values around this can grow and change. Certainly there is always tension between we must do something and we must do the right things and only the right things. And that's something that we all have to weigh and all organizations have to weigh. With data, the reason to be minimalist about data collection is that you cannot always secure it. And if you, if you know that you cannot take the risk of that data being used or uncovered or taken away or changed, then you shouldn't necessarily collect it. And I think that's a conversation we have to have. And just to, to wrap up, I would say that one of the other challenges and something that Maya maybe made me think about or, or touched on just now, when we're doing these analyses, and this is part of what makes the capacity building so tough. It's not just political science or, or international relations majors that we have to bring together. It's also the computer science people and the lawyers. And these people don't like each other very much and do not understand each other when they speak. But you have to get them in a room and on a working group for months to figure this stuff out. And then they need to be involved in every operational decision you make about these databases or these programs. This is analysis and risk mitigation across multiple specialisms. It's really hard for us to do as humanitarians, or as anyone, arguably. Um, anyway, I think I've gone on for long enough, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Laura. Very, uh, very insightful there. Patrick, we'll uh, close with you before we open it to the audience. Um, you sit at that intersection between kind of the humanitarian and the private sector, so to speak, with Kobo tools. And, you know, you just kind of understand, you straddle both worlds. So the question for you would be, what avenues exist to provide data collection transparency to local organization in crisis affected regions, if such thing exists? And then do Western organizations partner with local digital data collection companies in this humanitarian space, particularly in terms of uh, interventions? About 
three to five minutes for you, and then uh, we can open it to the audience. Thanks. Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, and I, I kind of wish I could revisit some of the past questions, but, uh, but uh, maybe we'll have time after. Um, I have to say this, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an ac accidental entrepreneur. Kobo Toolbox was, was really created because on a very selfish level, we needed more than 10 years ago, we needed a tool that would meet the requirement of the collection and help us go faster from the moment we collect data to the moment we're able to get insight from it. And so it could not be something that relies on internet. It could not be you know, based on complicated tools and analysis. We needed something very simple to use in the field, very robust. And turns out we started, we, we managed to literally take the money from photocopies and data entry to invest that and hire a programmer and, and then found an open source tool, DK, that we could build around and, and so really created something that turned out to work well. Turns out once it existed, people wanted to use it. Turns out once they wanted to use it, they wanted to improve it. And so we created this partner, but the model has remained free and our goal remains free, which is that we need good data. And so we make it simple free for any humanitarian actor to collect and, and have a tool that is quite powerful, but easy to, to, to use. Uh, so, you know, we're not really in the private sector in, in the sense that this is not a private company. So we're not, it's a nonprofit and we, we're just trying to make sure there's good data out there. Now, what's the challenge with that? Is that as you make things simple, as you make data collection simple, you make collecting bad data simple you made the ability to, for organization, frankly, to collect data and create risks for communities. Uh, so along with innovation, along with these tools, there is a need to improve practices, to improve basic digital literacy, to improve, I mean, I know Laura and other people on the call, we all have heard of these in the early days of crowd mapping, we've all heard of digital maps that would show victims of sexual bi uh, and gender-based violence with location or show potential targets on maps for armed groups. I mean, so there are things that are so out there that it sounds ridiculous that someone would do it, but the reality is, you know, we, we all make mistakes. Let's just be clear on that. And, and we need to learn from that. And so one of the key question then is, who is responsible for that? Who is responsible for creating the learning? Because the reality is when we go uh, and ask local organizations to start data collection for us, who spends the time training them on what does it mean to have really meaningful consent? Uh, how should you train your interviewers? How should you protect the data? I mean, there, there are so many basic digital skills and, and hear me out, they are fantastic partners and people who are really knowledgeable uh, at, in, in every country, but they, for every organizations that know what they are doing, there are others who are not as good. Let me give an example of uh, uh, helpline. You ask, do we partner? Well, of course we partner with local actors to collect data all the time. And, and running helpline is a good example. It's not, you know, it's, it's done by local organization, but how, how are they trained? They are certainly trained on potentially an organization wants to use a specific software. So they will be trained on the software, but what about the data protection part? What about uh, safeguarding information? What about how do you respond to requests for government? I gave the example earlier, it's fine for an agency to say, well, the government can ask us data, we won't give it to them. Sure, what about your, your partners who are actually the front line, who are actually collecting the data? And I have that experience in the field where we ask a sub office, well, has the local government ever asked you to share information? And they say, no, never, they know we don't. And then you go to their partner who are actually collecting the data and you ask, has the local government asked you to share information? Oh yes, all the time. So there are so many disconnects, so many aspects on which we need to do a much, much better job. I, I talked about this dichotomy between digital transformation and localization, and that's really where it is. We need to set up those infrastructure, those support network, peer-to-peer -peer networks, make sure that organizations talk to each other um, um, and, and, and build knowledge and experience. And I do want, and I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm out of time, I do want to go back on one thing, which is that 
you know, the data security has become such a cyber security and a technical discussion and firewalls and, and, and this and that. All these are really important. And, and the fact that ICRC was hacked, it was mentioned, uh, should not undermine, yes, you know, in any organization, even if you have the best protection like ICRC, there is a risk. But it shows the importance of having everything else that goes with it, the policies, the enforcement, the accountability, the, uh, uh, and, and, and sorry, I'm randomly, but I do want to give one example of that, is data retention. You know your data may be hacked. You know it may happen. So have a clear policy on how long you're going to keep the data exposed at risk. What's the process? Is it after one year, after two years, after three years? Have a clear decision. I'm not going to tell you what's right or wrong. I'm not going to tell you you need to delete every data after six months. But be very clear and purposeful. Think about this question. Make sure you, Maya shared her example about having to decide how am I navigate, navigating this data request? Well, you have to have very clear assistance on how do you deal with requests? What is reasonable? What is not reasonable? What's the risk? How are you going to assess it? But those are the things that are available in the ICRC and IFRCs and the UN agencies of the world. They are not available to my friends at Echelle in the Central African Republic. They don't know how to do this, to, not to be blunt. And, and they, are, they are fantastic people. They are smart people, but there are things that come with experience with, and, and, and for which we need to, to, to work. Okay. Sorry, I'll stop over. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Patrick. We'll open it to the, <laughs> we'll open it to uh, the audience. Um, so if you want to ask your question, raise your hand, identify yourself, and ask the question, no political speech, and if you want to direct it to a specific panelist, please do so, sir. Uh, Dr. Vic, uh, my question is directed uh, right to you. What my affiliation? Uh, my name is William Cady. I'm an uh, intern at the Osgood Center for International Studies. Uh, my question uh, relates right to what you just started talking about. Uh, where should proper data management uh, compliance training come from? Should that be a governmental response or through NGOs? Uh, because we see these different uh, examples of hacking through uh, different organizations and how do we build that trust with uh, refugees to where they know that their data is going to be safe and they uh, don't have to worry about giving away their data and losing it towards uh, bad compliance. Do you want to direct that to a specific panelist? Uh, Dr. Vink, I guess you could answer that. Okay. Sure, if we, and, and I'm sure my colleagues, uh, you know, Maya Laura may have two things to add, but let's be very clear. I, I'm, I'm lucky, I guess, and, and I, I have an institutional affiliation you do too with a university. We know exactly how it works. We have an IRB, we have questions, we can go to them. That IRB itself is accredited and there's certification and we take classes every, uh, every year on, on those practices. None of this exists, largely. I mean, within organization, you may have specific courses that people have to take, and generally that is not even really tied to specific data access or privilege. It needs to be. You need to kind of work on accreditation. You need to, to work on, on courses and certificates. Uh, and, and those need to be kept to date, up to date. But we talked about resource. Who is going to pay for that? It's, all I know is it needs to be done. And it needs to be done in a way that is not internal. It needs to be publicly available to all organizations working on humanitarian data. So, uh, so in, in short, where should it come from? Governments, of course, have an important role to play. The international community, and frankly, here I would look at the UN, I would look at UNHCR, I would look at the UNHCR of the world. They have a responsibility to make sure that those training, those resources are available, even if it just means contracting a range of things. Look, I would love to do this. I would love for us to build course. In fact, the Federation of the Red Cross, not the ICRC, the IFRC, has built fantastic resource for their affiliates. Let's do more of that. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, Maya, Laura, or Ziad, one about anybody want to quickly add to this? I mean, I can quickly say thank yes, good uh, shout out to the IFRC's data playbook, which just um, just had its public launch. It is indeed fabulous. 
Um, and, you know, the ICRC Data Protection Office also runs trainings periodically um, in different places. We are planning for one in March uh, for those in D.C., and um, we have run them in Dakar. We've run them in, in Latin America. I forget where. But, you know, it's hard for us to fund that also, and then that is a one-week course on data protection that then, you know, is not enough. As you say, these things need to be refreshed and updated, and there needs to be mechanisms. So um, I would just say that. And then I would also just add and tack on that this is, ultimately, this is about power, um, not the training. I mean, sometimes, but that's not good training. But the, <laughs> the issue of how, how much access do we give folks without really testing or ensuring that those people are adequate safeguarders of that data. This is about us not prioritizing it because we don't have to, because we have power. Um, and a little bit of you know loving feedback to the international system that I'm a part of is that the big organizations who are uh, grantors or who then subcontract to smaller partners, it is on us to ensure that those partners have the support they need to do this well. And also to donors, you know, we the, the drivers of good and bad practice in this sector are the institutional policies that we, big organizations and donors have around data retention, data capture, data sharing, including with us. And so there is something of we have to get our own house in order and look to ourselves there. And I'm just gonna make a quick note is, unfortunately, one of the things we always forget is languages. You know, if we're going to do all these kind of trainings, it has to be in as many languages as possible to reach as many people as possible. You know, we do really not a good job even within the basic six languages of the UN. You know, good luck finding a lot of data responsibility resources in Arabic. As an Arabic speaker, I can tell you, they don't really exist out there. They don't come out as often. They're not published as often. And so one of the challenges is not just developing these tools, but make sure they're translated into dozens of languages so that the people who are on the front lines, who people on the ground doing this work, responding, operationalizing all these guidelines, can really learn within the language that they're, they speak and not rely on you know, principles that are made in English or French. Thank you. Uh, Maya, any comment or? Yeah, just just briefly to 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 really uh, echo everything that's been said, and 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 particularly the whole point about roles and responsibilities, even within an organisation. I think that's what we've been been experiencing through the development of the the responsible data access in in UNHCR. How you know how we're getting down to the nitty gritty and more granular uh, uh, approach to to managing data and 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 sharing it. And I think uh, the example with 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 the with UNHCR's microdata library was also what has empowered the Joint Data Center to go external, and and basically say if UNHCR with such a sensitive uh, mandate uh, for such such a sensitive uh, uh, such vulnerable populations can go out and 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 institute all of these things and and share data, surely we can we can work with other stakeholders. And the way to do that, you know, we talked about a convention for data protection, we, talk, we talked about different things. Um, the way to do that seems to be to really open up a pool for, for the various tools and, and guidance that is produced. Because many organizations sit with this in, a, you know, between their four walls and, and, are, and are figuring it out. Whereas there's actually a lot of intel that we can collectively put together and that also goes to trainings and, uh, and develop uh, trainings that puts us, uh, all of us on, on the same standards in terms of you know, the different components of, of, of data protection. I think, I think that's, that's a field that is moving, uh, not just with the Joint Data Center, but also with other partners in the, in, in, in the Interagency Standing Committee and, and, um, and, and also in the development uh, partner world. So just to echo and say that that, that is something that we feel is moving. Uh, thank you very much to uh, all the panelists for your comment. We have about four minutes. Any burning question from our friends in the audience? Question to the point? You're going to address it to a specific panelist? Um, we can shoot it out to everyone. Uh, Hi, I'm Chiara. Um, I'm from the Department of State. So the United States obviously prides ourselves as being one of the biggest humanitarian donors. And I know you just talked about um, larger donors 
kind of working with smaller countries or organizations, what would data support look like for the Department of State or the United States as a whole? Okay, thank you. So we have three minutes to answer this question. server? there's one more question? Later, you sure? Mike. Thank you, Daniel Krieger, University of Washington. Um, a lot of our conversation today has uh, focused over data security, um, but I think there's also relates into the effectiveness and usefulness and how these are operationalized in context. Um, for example, there's a lot of demands for age and gender disaggregation, but in context where I've worked in, that's not necessarily as feasible in context where populations are worried about conscription. I've also seen um, cons questions about gender-based violence and prevalence of uh, underage child marriage being operationalized as in UN products as surveys in public by heads of household. So my question to you all is uh, how can we better align the current data methodologies in the humanitarian sector given the differing context and data security needs? Thank you. Did you say your affiliation? University of Washington. All right, thank you. So, because we have about three minutes, <laughs> we're going to give two of our panelists the bid to your question, and then two to the fellow's question. And please, no more than 45 seconds. <laughs> thank you. In your responses, each. <laughs> I'll go first, and I'll answer the first question. I think when looking at, you know, when asking what the State Department can do to help support communities, I think the first thing is ask them what they need and work with them and engage with them in meaningful conversation so that we don't make assumptions sitting here in Washington about what somebody needs in Beirut, Lebanon, or what organizations need. So it's about opening communication and asking organizations what they need. Thank you. Anybody else among the panelists who want to take 45 minutes for that question? Seconds. I mean, seconds, sorry. Uh, Jake, pardon, 45 seconds. <laughs> Do you want no? me to come in? You want to answer that? Yeah, no, I can, I can quickly just say, well, first of all, I think uh, the, the U.S. State Department is doing a lot because they're, in terms of, of, of supporting uh, uh, data and work around the, the data as, as we're doing in the Joint Data Center, they are one of our main uh, contributors and, and partners in, uh, in this space. And, and they've got a lot of uh, uh, bandwidth for, uh, for the kind of work that, that we're doing, including some of the, the, the explorations that we're doing. So, so just to say, from, from that perspective, there's, there is action from, from, from their side. Um, and, um, and, and perhaps I stop there, but just to say that, that right. that's something that we appreciate highly. All right, thank you very much. Laura or Patrick, do you want to address the second question? Um, I have a suggestion that might, I, this is my suggestion for both questions, which is very ambitious, but. My, the suggestion is this, shorten the feedback loop, because I think one thing I notice about digital and data work full stop across both development and humanitarian aid is that we don't have enough evidence of what happens down the road after our intervention. And in any other, any other field, that would not be okay. Um, if we acknowledge the power and balance that the United States has or that we have as actors, and we are not looking at the outcomes, including looking at the data, and is it problematic, and what's the outcome of selecting the data. And, and if we acknowledge that power and balance, and we need to be actively soliciting the views of the people who are the data subjects, and making sure that they can quickly change what is happening. And they also have, under data protect, most data protection regulation, they have rights, um, which, which we should respect. Um, and so, yeah, that's my suggestion. Shorten the feedback loop, make sure we're actively soliciting feedback from communities and hearing what happens down the road from our intervention. Thank you, Laura. Patrick will give you the last 30 seconds. I, I have a ton to say on both questions, but I will do exactly what Laura just suggested, which is to shorten my feedback loop, and I will leave it there with the fantastic answers from, uh, from my colleagues, but I'm always happy to discuss it. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Those are, those are really important questions. Well, thank, thank you, you for the short for feedback. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to take this opportunity to thank our distinguished panelists for their expertise, for joining us today. 
and thank the audience for a round of applause for our friends. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This concludes our session. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Humanitarian Innovation in Action Conference here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I am not your responsible safety officer. Um, that is someone else who hopefully should have talked to you uh, earlier in the day. Um, is, are you the responsible safety officer, Jake? Jake is the responsible safety officer. Um, I'm really honored to be moderating this panel on uh, humanitarian innovation in responses to displacement. And we've got three really amazing panelists from all over the world uh, joining us today with really unique approaches and unique experiences in this space. Um, this specific panel is, uh, I hope, no pressure panelists, going to consider new ways of thinking about displacement situations the challenge, how we think about these uh, situations. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of what we've heard today and talked about today is just trying to rethink how we deliver assistance to, to people who need it. And I'm hard pressed to think about people who need it more than those in displacement scenarios. Um, and uh, as we know, there are more and more of these displacement scenarios all around the world happening more frequently and lasting longer. And so, uh, anything we can do, any good ideas from the from the panelists, um, I'm sure will be well received. I will mention now, and I'll mention at the end, that uh, this panel, um, even though I know you came to see me sit on a stage here by myself, uh, this, this panel will be followed by um, a panel with David Miliband and do, uh, Dr. Abdi Rizak Yusuf Ahmed at 20 after 4 p.m. here on the East Coast in the United States. Um, so I, I'm going to turn quickly to our panelists, and I'm just going to go uh, one by one, panelists, and, and ask you to um, ask a, a, a broad, answer a broad question um, before we get into the discussion. So I'm going to start with the uh, Deputy Director General for Operations of the International Organization for Migration, the UN Migration Agency, Ogochi Daniels, um, who is, I believe, joining us from Geneva. So, Ugochi, how are you? Good to see you. I'm good, Errol. It's, it's really great to be here. Thank you for having me. And somehow we're managing to stay cool <laughs> in what's a really hot time for Europe. I, I um, myself just came back from Europe yesterday uh, and can attest to the fact that it is, um, you know, there's lots of places in Europe that don't have air conditioning and they may have to be rethinking that uh, shortly. But, um, Ugochi, thanks for again for joining us, and and I'd love to hear your initial thoughts about how you think about innovation in, in displacement scenarios. And, and I know that this is uh, not something that is a, an abstract idea for you. you. You've got a really incredible personal story as well, and so the degree to which you're comfortable sharing with our audience a little bit about how your own personal experiences uh, has sort of formulated your interest in this topic of innovation. Uh, we certainly welcome that, but um, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks again for being here, Ugochi. Thank you, Errol, and good morning, good afternoon to participants in the room, my, my panelists and my fellow panelists, and as well as everyone else on, online. So indeed, Errol, it is deeply personal for me because at a certain time in, in my life, um, I was much younger. It was during the Nigerian Civil War, um, and my, my father had to take his family, I, I was a baby, and leave in the middle of the night. So forced displacement is something that is, is deeply personal for me. It's something I've dedicated over 20 years of my professional life to. And in terms of the way it has shaped me and informs my role in my current role um, at IOM, you know, it's just to think of the fact that at one time in my life, I was forcibly displaced. And at another time in my life, fast forward many, many years later, I'm the Deputy Director General for Operations at IOM. And what made that difference? It's, it's a difference of opportunity. It's a difference of options. 
And so when we begin to talk about innovation in humanitarian settings, and yes, we're going to, to speak about examples and, and, and a lot of that um, is technological or, or technical in nature, but what we really do need to understand that it's about people and that um, what I have seen and experienced, not just experienced myself, but with people who have been or continue to be um, displaced from their homes are highly resilient and want the same things like we do. And therefore, when we talk about innovation and when we get you know, into the weeds of it a bit, what we really need to keep in mind is that at the end of the day, they want, to, they want the same things we do. They want the same things for their family. They have the same aspirations for their children. They want to be productive. They don't want to be dependent on assistance. And they want to have the opportunity to have control over their, their lives, their futures, and be a productive member of, of, their, of their societies, of their communities. So um, I do think it's really, really important that as we talk about displacement, as we talk about giving assistance, as we talk about how we innovate, that we realize that it's, it's about people and that the way we support them means that anybody who is in a vulnerable situation due to displacement today can be anybody else um, in, their, in their future, can be anybody else. And the way that we engage with them, with their communities is a key determinant, can be a key determinant of that if we, if we do it well. So maybe I'll, I'll, hand, um, I'll hand that uh, back to you, Errol. Thanks, thanks, Ugochi, and and thanks for setting the stage and grounding us in that. Um, when we were thinking about this panel, it, it's really easy to think about innovation in the silver bullet context. You know, what's that? What's that technology? What's that uh, app that's going to make life better for for refugees and internally displaced persons and asylum seekers? And Ugochi, I couldn't agree more. You know, a, a lot of this is just figuring out how to deliver better solutions for people who just want to be normal, who just want to be, have their kids in school and, and go about their work and, and make a living. Um, and that might be an app. That might be a, some sort of technology, and that might not be. It just may be a process innovation or um, some sort of way of, of thinking more efficiently and effectively about how we deliver services. So thank you for that, Agochi. And, and speaking of innovating in project design and project implementation, Edwin, if I could turn to you. So Edwin Korea is the Director of Programs for Mercy Corps in Ethiopia. And he's got a lot of experience working uh, in, in the region. Um, he and I have both worked on uh, refugee issues uh, as they relate to South Sudanese people. Um, he's worked in, in Rwanda and Uganda, and uh, they're doing some pretty interesting stuff in Ethiopia. So Edwin, uh, it's a similar question to you. When you think about innovation in uh, these displacement humanitarian situations, what do you think about and what are, what are you guys doing in Ethiopia that is innovative? Uh, th thank you so much, Errol. Uh, good morning, all greetings from Ethiopia. It's a bit late in the, in the night, but uh, we're pushing through. Um, I think for me, innovation is doing things better the next time we do it. And, and then the, that means it's beyond technology and it's finding the most effective and efficient manner of finding solutions that are durable, speaks to the local context, and they are local enough to be sustainable. Looking at our context in Ethiopia where the crisis drivers remain climate-driven climate crisis of cyclic droughts and floods uh, and conflict. 
Um, and when you talk of the conflict, we are looking at figures upwards of 20 million plus uh, in need of humanitarian assistance in 2022 only. And with an involving uh, conflict situation and an expanding drought, uh, drought uh, crisis, you can imagine how those figures will look like in 2023. So top that up with COVID, malaria, measles, and malnutrition, which again affects the proportionately uh, the displaced communities, um, means that you need to be able to have adaptive programs at the design level. Uh, so for Masiko in Ethiopia, we've been here from uh, 2004, uh, working in resilience program, youth programs, financial inclusion, uh, a lot of durable solution programs for our refugee spaces and humanitarian interventions in the sectors of wash, health, um, agricultural, um, multi-purpose cash assistance and livelihoods. So we, you look at the population of concern and you can categorize our context into four. One, we have internally displaced uh, persons. Um, who we are intervening uh, with WASH, non-food item, looking at mobile health clinics and protection program. And we are designing those ones with the private sector. So we are able to do private sector interventions even for water tracking, um, running with voucher programs uh, to ensure that we are sharpening the level of targeting based on the needs. Then you have a category of returnees and for returnees, we are intervening in multi-purpose cash assistance. This is for households that have lost everything uh, during their displacement and whether they were forced returns or voluntary returns. So for households that have lost everything, we are providing multi-purpose cash assistance. For households with productive assets, we are providing uh, agriculture interventions, either seeds or tools or feed fodder to make sure that they can sustain their core breeding uh, uh, stock, which is probably one lactating animal and seven shots of goats, to ensure that their productive livelihoods cycle continues. Then you have the drought affected, displaced, uh, especially for the pastoral communities. And this we are working through some natural resource management activities, building canals, uh, redirecting the water, providing enclosures, regenerating pastures, uh, and improved seeds, um, and providing some agricultural inputs uh, in anticipation of uh, the rains in October. Uh, the final subsect will be the refugees, where we are doing a lot of durable solution programs, looking at a graduation model uh, from poverty, overlaying that with the market systems development approach, uh, through a project that we call DREAMS, which is delivering resilient enterprise and market systems for refugees. So to make sure that we have sustainable micro enterprises at household levels, that especially for refugees who will see upwards of 10 years of displacements, IDP cycles are longer now. We are talking of five years to 10 years, especially if they are um, election related, so until the next election cycle, uh, the, the displacement remains. I want to pause there and hand it over back to you, Errol. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Edwin. And, and uh, there's a lot there. And, and one of the things that I particularly liked about what you said um, was innovation is in, in, in part about tailoring. And it, this is not a one size fits all situation. Um, these are not one size fits all situations. Uh, and I think that part of what we need to be thinking about is um, that sort of uh, bespoke, tailored, um, of course there's all sorts of reasons why that's difficult, but I, I'm uh, excited to hear about that um, level of tailoring and, and sophistication that you're delivering in, in Ethiopia. Um, I'd like to turn to Dr. Megan Benton uh, Megan is the director of the international program at the Migration Policy Institute here in Washington, D.C. Um, she has done a lot of 
really great work at the Migration Policy Institute and beyond. And, and one thing that I'm particularly taken with in her background is this. Uh, she co-founded uh, a few years ago MPI's uh, Europe Integration Futures Working Group, um, which if, she, if she'll indulge us, maybe she'll talk a little bit about. But I think, you know, Megan, you think about innovation not just in the technological sense, but in, um, in, in sort of social innovation and, and uh, other ways. And so I, I would welcome your thoughts on this general idea of what innovation looks like in displacement context. Thanks again for being here, Megan. Thanks, Errol, and thanks so much for reading my bio closely and, and calling out that initiative, which is really close to my heart and I can talk about in a minute. But I first wanted to start a little bit by, by describing kind of how I responded to the, the abstract for this, um, for this exciting meeting and some of the provocative questions that you asked. You know, I was thinking about what does innovation and displacement mean? And like a good recovering academic, I started jotting down a list so there are so many um, innovations in the displacement space, whether it's one-stop shops that deliver access to documentation and services or cash transfer programs and digital wallets and financial inclusion interventions that accept uh, refugee documents instead of government IDs, remote interviews and asylum processing, a really big thing that's come out of the pandemic, private sponsorship programs to allow groups and individuals to sponsor refugees and help them settle in. And, you know, Errol, you alluded to the fact that I've been working and sort of mapping and tracking social and technological innovation in these fields for a while now. But, uh, you know, I was thinking about it and I have to confess, I've become a little bit allergic to the word innovation, which I think is because um, it's, it's had a sort of almost promiscuous use lately in that almost anything can be described as innovative depending on, you know, what your particular lens is. So personally, I've started to prefer more specific terms, whether it's unusual collaborations and partnerships or, or funding models uh, that promote evidence-based practice or uh, creative problem solving or scaling what works or collective intelligence. And then I think the other challenge is, you know, uh, other speakers and, 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 and Errol has alluded to is that I think the word innovation slightly encourages us to focus on the shiny stuff, whether it's new or experimental, even if that means quite small scale programs or interventions. Um, and I think as a result, sometimes we end up kind of focusing on, well, do we have a pretty watering can, but actually we need to be focusing on, is there a robust water supply and some of the kind of big picture questions. So I think if, if we turn the question around, we should be asking things like, well, where is innovation lacking? And where do we still lack solutions to big policy challenges? And where have we tested things at a small scale that have barriers to scale up that are proving um, um, protracted. Um, uh, the Economist ran a feature on innovation a few years ago where they basically said, yeah, the smartphone is great and all, but have we really had anything as groundbreaking as the toilet? And I think <laughs> sometimes it's useful to bear the image of the toilet in mind when we're talking about innovation because it brings to mind the need for scale the need for outcomes, but it also reminds us that innovation doesn't always come with bells and whistles, but can often appear really quite prosaic. Um, the other thing to mention, you presumably many of you have seen the sort of the innovation spiral that's often sort of depicted in the literature, which is this idea that you can start with exploring opportunities and challenges, then you're kind of generating ideas, then you're testing, and it has to be all the way up to scaling or whole systems change. And I think if we're asking about scale, one of the big innovations of the past few years is arguably you know, a policy innovation. It's the expansion of private sponsorship programs in response to uh, Afghan and Ukrainian displacement. You know, Canada has obviously had this well-established private sponsorship program, but other countries had only dipped their toes in this until recently. But now you have quite big numbers. You know, the UK is settling. 60,000 refugees through its Homes for Ukrainian program. The US has uh, got this quite impressive matching portal. It's really been, uh, it's really focused the, focused the mind with some of, these, um, some of these responses. And then I think some of the pragmatic regularization programs in Latin America in response to the Venezuela crisis um, and the temporary protection directive in Europe are also pretty groundbreaking uh, responses to mass displacement because they bypass asylum systems, 
Um, they ensure that people don't end up in a regular status, that they can access labor markets, that you treat integration as a day one affair, that you see displaced populations as a source of labor, which is especially vital when we have these tight labor markets. But I think perhaps most importantly, they also give a sense of individual agency in the sense that we acknowledge that refugees have a choice on where to go and how and when. So it's interesting in the EU that the conversation around secondary mobility of refugees has pretty much disappeared and kind of allowing refugees to move where they want. And it hasn't been the end of the world, even though this has been a real concern in the EU policy space for a while. Um, you know, it really allows people to be seen as, as people rather than through the lens of their vulnerability. So this was just a little pitch for thinking about policy innovation as much as programmatic innovation and, and focusing on whole systems rather than um, just the, the sort of small scale stuff. Yeah, and, and I think when we think about displacement scenarios, uh, a, a lot of times we're thinking about status and, and making sure that people have regular status where whatever their situation is. And, and I, some of that can get really legalistic, some of it can get really complicated. And I think, you know, whether it's using technology or social innovation or, or some other um, ways of thinking about that, I, th I think innovation can um, address some of the, it can clarify some of those issues um, for, for some of those people. I also love my job because I get to talk to people who use terms like provocative, promiscuous, and prosaic when talking about humanitarian innovation in displacement context. So, um, Megan, let's grab coffee when you're, uh, <laughs> when you're feeling better. That's amazing. Um, Agoji, if I can come back to you um, for a second. Uh, I, we've talked about different types of innovation here, and we've uh, obviously we're only touching the service. If I could focus for a second on, on actual technological innovation with you, and things like when you think about things like data analytics and geospatial data and satellite imagery, how, how do you think about that in terms of predicting and, and therefore being able to respond better to future displacement crises? Oh, sorry, I think we uh, mute, yeah. I mean, it's such a bummer, almost three years in and I'm still unable <laughs> to mute and unmute uh, when I'm supposed to. It, it's okay, I'm, I'm sitting on a stage by myself, so it's, it's fine. <laughs> Um, great question, I'll get to it. I just want to pick up on one of the um, points Megan made when she was speaking about the temporary protection directive um, in, in Europe in response to the, um, to the war in Ukraine. And I just want to remind, well, maybe not remind everybody. I know this because I work at IOM and the director general at, um, at IOM in his previous life when he was in the um, EU Commission actually put in place the temporary protection directive for a situation exactly like what we have now, but that's that's well over 10 years ago. And so, you know, when we're talking about innovation, it really drives us to look at opportunities to better anticipate, respond, and prevent displacement. And that's exactly what that temporary protection directive did in that it was anticipating the need for a policy, well, basically for a migratory a tool um, to deal with um, mass displacement um, in Europe. So I think it, it, it's, a, it's a really strong example of the, the different aspects of, of innovation. And as Edwin said um, about us doing, uh, you know, doing things differently, doing things better, being able to better uh, anticipate, respond, um, um, and also uh, uh, as much as possible to prevent displacement um, with a focus on, on, building, uh, on building resilience. Um, but you had specifically asked me about, you know, uh, data analytics, geospatial data, um, in predicting and, and responding. And what we obviously recognize is the role of, of new technology and data in, um, in, in humanitarian settings, and specifically in responding to the needs of those displaced. And we, and we can underestimate 
um, the, the role of new technology, but as I'm saying this, the picture of the toilet is firmly in my, <laughs> in my mind. And maybe that's the, you know, that's the, the litmus test for us. Is it gonna, it, it, is, is the outcome of this going to be as groundbreaking and as um, impactful um, as the toilet has been? So, so let's go for it. So what we have seen is that um, innovation in the field of data has enabled development of, of various tools that help inform strategic planning. Again, uh, anticipating, responding, and preventing um, future displacement. But when it comes to data, what we see is that there's been progress, but a lot more needs to be done for it to be more robust and granular data um, is needed so we can, so that we're better able to detect the drivers and root causes of complex migration patterns. So um, uh, from IOM's perspective, data and evidence have driven, I mean, that's deeply ingrained in our culture, it's part of our DNA, and um, finding solutions to complex challenges requires innovation guided by experience. And what we have seen um, is that tools such as our work in Mozambique and 10 other countries on our solutions and mobility index um, really highlight the immense opportunities of existing data structure um, and tools. And this index is a consolidation of innovative and solutions oriented tools developed at the country level. So here we're getting at the issue of local, um, of localization, of context specific, defined um, from the perspective of the communities that um, we're engaging with in, in, collecting, um, in collecting this data um, so that the solutions themselves are nuanced or granular and work across um, uh, the various settings um, and, 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 and enable the transition to, um, uh, to solutions. In West Africa, we've also seen with our transhumance tracking tool, and this is in partnership with local, national, and civil society. So whole of, whole of government, whole of society approaches, and also the role of partnerships in innovation um, to provide information about mobility trends and patterns. In Haiti, we've um, established early warning systems in areas affected by gang violence using um, displacement data. And um, the early warning system is implemented at the Cartier level and actually helps in identifying new displacement and understanding better the perceptions um, the local perceptions of, of security. And, uh, you know, I had spoken earlier about, you know, partnerships and obviously partnerships and engaging the communities themselves is so, so critically important. Because at the end of the day, and with all of our um, best frameworks and um, um, standards for how we define an innovation, we can only really say it's an innovation if the if those who are displaced see it for themselves as something that has contributed to a solution to their to their um to their displacement so we certainly from um iom also recognize that in this space we are dealing with people that are in highly vulnerable situations I, and, and, and this of course then affects their own um, um, and vulnerability. And we also have to weigh what the risks are with, um, with the technology and the tools that we use. We're very concerned about this. And so we co-created um, with the Yale School of Public Health, the data science and ethics group, which is a data responsibility initiative focused on the best ethical, technical, and contextual data responsibility practices in these areas um, of concern. 
So we're all on board for predictive analytics, but let's also be aware that um, there is there is a that there are risks, and that ultimately it's about not um, not doing harm, and how we use predictive analytics for for future mobility, and we all have a responsibility to mitigate this with with data protection. So. I just want to highlight the power of technology, how we are using the data and these different really contextualized tools um, for, for local solutions, but also balancing that with do no harm, um, ensuring data protection, and ultimately um, um, putting, I mean, I know it's, it's a bit of a, uh, what's the word? It's, it's a bit cliche-ish in terms of putting people at the center, um, nothing with, you know, nothing for them without them. But, you know, again, going back to um, my own personal story and what all our aspirations are for those we seek to assist in displaced settings, it's, criti critical, it's critically important that we continue to ensure that um, what we're, what, what we're working on, how we're working, and, and how we innovate does no harm and enables a solution that they would also define, that they would also define as a solution um, to their displacement. Back to you, Errol. Thanks, Agochi, and thanks for bringing up the risks as well. Um, a few colleagues and I recently published a short piece on Ukrainian refugees and, and how their uh, really not just tech savviness and everybody has a smartphone. Most, most displaced people have smartphones uh, in the world these days, but there's also ubiquitous connectivity that is coupled with um, sort of tech savviness and um, that, that's a double edge. Uh, there's a double edge to that, that technology um, uh, availability. And, and so thanks for bringing up the risks. I want to come back to the risks in a little bit, but um, Edwin, can I ask you a similar question about the, the tech innovation side of this? I mean, you talked about thinking differently about how we program and do work in places like Ethiopia and, and different humanitarian displacement contexts. Um, how are you using data and, and analytics and, and uh, sort of technology more broadly uh, in, in implementing that, and are you thinking about this sort of risk factor at all? Uh, th thank you, and uh, just picking up from where uh, Ogut had left, it at, I, I think we, in Masiko, we are looking at data points for decisions. We are looking at data points to enable us make critical decisions as we design uh, our programs. And, and an example, for Ethiopia, where we have seen a lot of climate-related uh, crisis and climate-related displacements, it means that we it, it's critical that we overlay the satellite imagery, the geospatial data, the meteorological information to be able to one predict where the communities will move to. Um, Linked to pasture regeneration and, and verifying that information from the triangulation of the several data points that overlay uh, in that process. Uh, we also using the same data points to map out available resources in terms of where will the water sources going to be for the displaced populations, where are the energy sources because remember, for every displaced community, there is a host community. So we are using the data points to build social cohesion processes and peace building uh, aspects uh, to make sure that the humanitarian data, the peace data, and the development data is speaking to each other uh, so that we can um, do prioritization of the funding investments that need to go in uh, and ensure that the host communities are not again becoming more affected by just taking in uh, the displaced uh, communities. Uh, a perfect example is we are designing a shock responsive social protection um, in intervention with 
with um, climate data points as the entry point. So looking at communities that will be affected by flooding and injecting some social uh, protection, uh, cash transfers uh, on the early part of, uh, based on meteorological data to make sure that the communities are able to prepare for, uh, move to higher ground, uh, adapt on their livelihoods. Uh, and we've seen uh, some results in terms of the resilience uh, that is built in that process. Um, I think now we are trying to build capabilities and invest in social and behavior change communication processes, because we need to build trust between data, analytics, and the communities that are supposed to absorb and consume the same data, whether you, you're dealing the, looking at it from regional governments or federal governments, and, and especially on the metrological data, we've seen a lot of mistrust and disconnect between listening and believing what the weatherman uh, is putting out there and the anticipatory action and the early action activities that need to happen at the community level. Thank you, Errol, and back to you. I, I'm so glad that you brought up trust because I, I feel like in innovation more broadly, but but especially in technological innovation, the the innovations are only as good as people's willingness to take them up. And and you know, there's lots of mistrust. Uh, I think fairly well placed mistrust about technologies these days. And and uh, you know, my own personal experience with displaced displaced folks in the field is that they're pretty savvy about that. And and so we need to not just be thinking about uh, what those technological innovations are, but um, how do we get people to, to trust them and how do we make sure, most importantly, that they are trustworthy? Um, Megan, similar question to you about the, the technology side of this. I mean, in, in your work, do you think about how data analytics or geospatial data or any other types of technological innovations are, are helping uh, respond to or, or predict uh, what we can do to help out in displacement scenarios. And, 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 you know, if you have any thoughts about this sort of trust or potential negative downside of this, I'd, I'd welcome that as well. Thanks, Errol. Um, I get very excited about predictive analytics, but I just want to maybe continue on the theme that I tried to open up with my first intervention, which was about the kind of more prosaic side of innovation. You know, a colleague of mine just came back from Uganda and he was talking about uh, how poor data becomes a problem. So because most of the refugee population is urban, the data that's available for program responses and planning is just really, really poor. And so city governments who are responsible for service provision and education and health and waste management are just really unable to, to properly plan. And then they have real trouble just getting kind of base and getting into the sort of accurate, basic funding calculations in terms of how funding trickles down from central government. So there's, there's often, you know, really basic data gaps that I think big data can, can fill that are not necessarily to do with prediction and forecasting and analytics, but are just to do with you know, actually providing real time up to the minute data, filling gaps in statistics, helping understand that, you know, there's a lag in the way the bu budgets are being allocated and set. Um, that said, you know, I do think there's huge potential in prediction and forecasting and now casting. Uh, you know, we've been looking at things like how social media data and cell phone data is used to provide updates of fast evolving displacement crises. Um, there's Facebook's displacement maps that estimate where someone displaced by a crisis uh, might be as a result of if their night location has changed. You have the European asylum system that's looking at uh, early warning and forecasting system for the number of um, asylum seekers based on event data and Google search and operational data. Um, so lots to be excited about, but the point that I wanted to make is that, I'm, uh, that they're all quite disparate these innovations and they haven't necessarily been been sort of joined up or broken through to the mainstream and connected with the donor and programmatic response, which is why I think one of the things um, that, that is quite exciting when it comes to disaster response and, and climate, I know Edwin mentioned climate, is the IFRC's forecast-based action 
uh, disaster emergency response because it uses the sort of meteorological forecasts and risk analysis to agree funding for early action that then releases automatically when uh, when thresholds and triggers are met. So I think that's one of the examples of kind of joining things up. Um, but then when it comes to the sort of checking of administrative data, I think there's huge potential there. And that's proving harder than perhaps um, the promise suggested that it would, would be, which I think is because data linkage is often really hard. So definitions of migration and mobility in innovative data sets, they don't always easily map on to more statistical, conventional statistical definitions. And then you also asked me to touch on um, data quality and, and privacy issues. I mean, the basic point is that if you're using smartphone data, even if most displaced people have a smartphone, they do not all have a smartphone. Maybe one family has a smartphone. It's not always individuals. They are offering you whole population data, which is in many ways very rich, but you have to attend to the fact that it's biased data. There will always be people left out. And if you're making policy and programmatic decisions based on that, um, you do have a risk of skewed, uh, skewed decision-making ultimately. Um, and then um, uh, trust, which Errol and Edwin both mentioned, you know, I was uh, reading about that, the, the fiasco with that, that Uber data recently in those academics. And actually the, the study that um, they got into trouble on was, was describing um, that driving an Uber might be a route out of the Bonnier um, in, in, in Paris. And that was actually a study that I cited <laughs> in my research. So it really was a bit of a, a moment for me where I thought, oh, you know, I've been very enthusiastic about big data for some time, but um, do we always know um, if, if it's in particular big tech companies, what their, what their motivations are? Um, so I think this all points to the need for legislative frameworks that enable both non-traditional data for policymaking and traditional statistics um, um, and, and, and also connect to statistical offices, um, but also regulate access to data um, held by the private sector and address that individual privacy piece. This is uh, why I'm hopeful that the robots are not going to take over is because I think data and analytics is a tool uh, to, to help in these scenarios, but it's not the only tool. I mean, you need people, you need, um, uh, you know, interoperability between data systems. You know, Edwin, you talked about the humanitarian development peace nexus. It's hard to think about that nexus without data interoperability. And, and to a certain extent, you can automate some of that and you can create some of that interoperability by code and, and in other ways, but you, you do need people not only to work within the systems, but you need to, to as Megan was saying, sort of think about this, uh, you know, incorporate qualitative ideas in, into this as well and contextual ideas and understand the limitations. You know, your your household, one smartphone per household's point is a really good one. I mean, we, we think about, it, we almost uh, assume that it's one smartphone per, per person, but as you mentioned, Megan, that's, that's most likely not the case in a lot of these scenarios. Um, Ugochi, I, I wanted to follow up on something you said I as well. Um, you know, you talked about how IOM is really prioritizing data and analytics. Can you talk, and you gave a couple examples of this, but I, I was wondering if you could dive a little bit deeper on what do you do with that? What do you, what do, you do with those data? Do you pre-position goods? Do you send staff to places where you know disasters are gonna happen? Or, you know, if you're trying to predict where conflict or climate events are gonna happen, you know, what, what do you do? You're the director, the deputy director general of IOM for operations, which I'm assuming means uh, you know, you're, you're involved in deploying people and stuff. Uh, so how, how do you use technology and innovation in doing that part of your job? Um, thanks, Earl. So there are a whole range of, um, of uses uh, of the data. And one of the things that we really pride ourselves on in IOM, you know, going back to your point about the nexus is that we're what we call it a triple mandated agency in that we work in humanitarian peace and development settings. And really um, that enables us to have the data that is required to work um, 
work across the nexus and bring coherence in our programming um, ultimately for um, for solutions um, for solutions to displacement but also you know we've talked a bit about um, predictive analytics so for instance I spoke about our solutions and mobility index and the way we are using that I you know I mentioned Mozambique but they're also it's we're also using it in 10 other countries. And these are countries with major displacement. So we're looking at Iraq, we're looking at um, Nigeria, we're looking at South Sudan, we're looking at um, Ethiopia. And uh, using this to inform particularly um, our, what we would call transition programming, how we do social cohesion, how we do community-based planning, uh, Involving, um, involving the community, how we identify communities that are ripe um, for solutions, um, so to speak. And then I spoke about our transhuman uh, tracking tool, which we're using in um, in the Sahel in in western in western Central Africa. It's providing information about um, mobility trends. It's allowing us to highlight unusual movements and anticipate the associated potential emergence of possible tension and conflict um, throughout, I mean, through the monitoring of how the pastoralists are moving along the traditional transhumanist channels. And, um, and, and then based on this and forming early warning anticipatory action, but at the community level, I think the, the, the point I want to make, the strong point I want to make about the data and how it's used is that really uh, not, just, not just that it's robust, but that it's granular for these, um, for these local uh, and contextualized uh, uh, solutions. And then um, I had talked about um, uh, early warning systems in Haiti uh, with, uh, with our data um, and enable us to identify in that setting the threats, well, first of all, understanding the community's perceptions of security, how they see threats to security and identifying um, those threats to then inform programming on, programming on um, community-based services. And let's not also forget that, yes, there's a, a lot that we do as um, um, uh, that, that's done by us as IOM working at the community level, but there's also a lot that we use this, um, that we use this data for in our support to governments and the solutions that governments themselves um, have, um, have come up with in dealing with, I mean, in, in coming up with the um, uh, uh, policy, the policy response. So we have examples in, um, in Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Peru, and um, Dominican Republic, where they have used, where they've used the, um, they've used the data for their own um, um, uh, programs and and what's really important here is that when we have um, national governments, now we're also talking about, um, we're talking about innovation, we're talking about data, but we're also talking about, about scale, which is also critically important if we're ever gonna make a dent um, to, the, um, to the displacement uh, that is happening and is at the, you know, at the largest numbers that we have that we've ever seen. And then I think um, the, the, I don't wanna say, <laughs> there's never the final point, but, uh, and, and I just had a, the, a team discussion with colleagues on this, this morning, um, when, we, when we look at the high level, the outcome, well, the, the, the action agenda of the secretary general coming out of the high level panel on internal displacement and looking globally at where is the best shot for 
um, ending, ending displacement and the role that IOM's data um, is playing in that space. We lead in the, in the data and the data working group around this. And right now, this data is helping identify um, populations, communities, government, contexts at the ground, on the ground, where investments um, from the big actors, the, the governments, the um, multilateral banks, the international finance institutions, where they should invest the, significant, the very significant funding um, that they have. So um, the point I'm trying to make here is yes, of course we use the data ourselves to improve our own programming. But if we're really talking about um, um, end, you know, ending displacement, then the partnerships with governments, the partnerships with the other actors, particularly the, 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 the development actors and then <laughs> the the um, and those that can finance um, these solutions uh, and using this data and and that critically important connector role that um, the data enables us as IOM to have. So I'll, let me stop there. No, th thanks, uh, Iguchi. And um, for those in the room, apologies. The the Russians seem to be interfering with our video feeds. Um, uh, Team uh, Humanitarian Agenda, we, we have the ability to do uh, audience questions, is that correct, Jude? Um, so as uh, we uh, raise your hand and, and we'll um, get a microphone to you, I, I wanna go to some audience questions here. Um, but as we're doing that, uh, and, and your staffs may be annoyed with me, panelists, uh, because I did not spring this question before, but one of the things I kept thinking about as you were talking about is, this sort of incremental innovation or, or process innovation, it, it's so fundamentally important. That's one of my main takeaways from this panel. And it's also not sexy. And so one thing, you know, when you think about policymakers who are a lot of times politicians, it's, um, you know, what do we want? Innovation and technology, when do we want it sort of incrementally over time based on evidence and effectiveness. Uh, and it's not always an easy sell to make. So so three of you, maybe Megan and Edwin and then ending with Agochi, just a quick soliloquy on how do we get donors and policymakers excited about things like process innovation? Megan? Yes. You know what else isn't sexy is funding. And that is part of the answer to this question. Uh, we haven't really talked very much about in innovative funding models, but one of the challenges is always that you have a displacement situation, all the donors wanna fund something, they want results on a two year time frame. they don't have any plan for continuing funding beyond that. There's competition and duplication and you know all of the things that all of you in the room know. So I think when it comes to thinking about iterative innovation and that process of establishing what works and then building on it. Um, uh, innovative funding models have to be part of it. And, you know, it's interesting that social impact bonds, development impact bonds was such a kind of, was so in vogue a few years ago, but are still so few and far between when I think that really does bring a kind of a uh, creative way of, of trying to build in really good measurement from the beginning and ensure that there are incentives for implementers to, to be creative and to be experimental and be pursuing, pursuing what works. So for those of you who don't know, this is the idea that you have um, a funder who is um, a private funder usually who is absorbing the risk and then government or other funders pay on results on a kind of incremental time frame. So um, I think there's one that has just recently kicked off, which is called um, the Refugee Le Livelihoods Development Impact Bond in Jordan, which provides four year uh, micro enterprise training and a grants program for refugees and crucially also vulnerable members of the local population, which I think is another real important piece that we haven't really talked about that it's always important to um, make sure that you bring local communities um, um, on, on board with these things rather than creating a division between a sort of beneficiary group and, and others. And in that case, there's, there's investors. So there's the US International Development Finance Corporation, 
Um, then there's, there's another implementing partner called FERD. There's the Near East uh, Foundation um, um, providing upfront financing. And then the IKEA Foundation and a couple of other foundations will pay depending on results um, at the end of it. And I think that, you know, um, um, innovative final instru financial instruments are really a piece of this kind of slightly boring iterative innovation that you were talking about, Errol. Edwin? Uh, thanks. Um, I think two, two quick points. One, I think we should up and improve our ability to coordinate on innovation. Because I think we are all doing our innovative approaches in our corners and we are across, whether it's across the UN agencies or PR, INGOs, local agencies, there is a complete disconnect and we are not sharing the learnings well enough. We are not plugging on existing um, innovations. We are running with innovations that are funded and that's what we are building on as opposed to building a platform where there's joint advocacy after we, we do the proof of context uh, of concept and, and appreciate that what works is extremely important. And as long as it works in the local context, then all of us should, the same way we, we do a lot of talking points for all uh, the round table conversations, we should have um, joint advocacy around innovation to make sure that that's what ends up being policy and that's what ends up being funded what has been locally tested, the proof of, context, uh, of concept has gone through and we are coordinating on those particular aspects. Um, the final piece is, I think too, we need to find local interlocutors and we need to anchor the, the innovation to be able to make sure that it is, it speaks to the regional government's plans, it's linked to the local, uh, council plans, it is a costed action plan behind it, and then that, that's, that's what is, will drive uh, the funding mechanisms. The reality, however, is that the idea is always way, way ahead of our internal processes across any agency. So you, you, the innovation idea is ahead of our paperwork, our processes, our approval process, our approval uh, bureaucratic uh, layers internally that we have to fix and make sure that the idea and innovation is matched by operational uh, funding, that the, ops, the operation platform is funded enough to take on uh, these ideas as they come on. Back to you. Yeah. Thanks for that, and it's not, it's, it's not just about making innovation sexy, it's about making coordination sexy. I like that, I like that you started with that. Um, but no, in all seriousness, it's, uh, I think the messaging and communication aspect of this is, is quite critical um, and certainly can be done, as you mentioned. Um, if there are questions, you can go ahead and raise your hand now. Um, Agochi, I'll go to you with the same question. You know, how do you make this um, interesting uh, especially this, this sort of more uh, slow onset innovation, perhaps, or process innovation. How do you think about that in terms of messaging it to IOM's donors? You've worked across the UN system as well, so feel free to, you know, whether it's UNRWA or UNFPA or, or the others that you worked with, you know, how do you, if, if we're believing this innovation, uh, some of this innovation, the more durable parts perhaps are not shiny toys, but rather um, sort of slow onset or, or, or incremental. How do you how do you make that interesting to people? Um, Errol, um, Megan and Edwin have you know spoken a lot about you know many of the different parts of that um, coordination, communication, flexible um, financing, etc. But in addition to that something I'd, I'd like to highlight and I've and I and I and I've been in I don't want to say I've been in this business but I've, I've been working on this for quite a while now and I think what has become apparent is that if we and if if we continue 
at least up until the World Humanitarian Summit, which was in 2015, it became very clear that if we continued with our approaches and the way we were working, we are never going to be able to meet the huma humanitarian needs, not to talk of ending displacement. And therefore, a different way of working was required. And, you know, one of the things that technological advancement has enabled is the role of the role of tech and tech tools in um, innovation. So I, I, I give all of this background because I don't think we necessarily, I don't think necessarily the challenge is to make it sexy. I think what is um, important is that where we have shown from our experience and from our programming that this works, it's that how do these key lessons learned from innovative, from innovation solutions, how do they, how are they then incentivized to stimulate further um, solutions and, and, and well, uh, innovations um, for solutions. How is it then connecting up with the funding that is available? I mean, there's an ex excellent example of this in the, in the DIV, the Development Innovation Ventures, um, USAID's Open Innovation Program that provides grant funding on a tiered evidence approach that maximizes impact per dollar spent. So again, there's the link with the evidence and then investing based on the evidence. So I think what um, behooves all of us on the programming and operational side is building, is, is making sure that we're, we're building that evidence that we, that we are proving, um, we're proving uh, that we're able to prove that these are bankable um, solutions, that these are smart investments, that they are, and that, um, and that they're having impact and they're having impact at scale. And that then um, enables uh, uh, in recognition that innovation often takes time, is often not sexy, and that we do need multi-year and, and flexible funding. Um, a final point on um, coordination, uh, and, and Edwin, you know, Edwin had, had made this point because it, it's important for all of us in understanding which solutions would work where. Um, and then of course, all of the issues around interoperability, um, comparing new solutions and practices, um, dissemination uh, of the innovation, so I think the, the bit about being sexy, I think we're kind of past, I think we're kind of past that as, as being the challenge. I think more of the challenge is pulling all of this together so that the, the different roles that need to be played, whether it's on coordination, whether it's on implementation, whether it's on design, whether it's on um, funding, whether it's on, um, 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 uh, building evidence. I think what's really important here is how all of that um, comes comes together. And right now, um, certainly for the for for governments and for um, um, uh, uh, the the multilateral banks, and, and not just even the multi even for private investment, what they're looking for is where can they invest um, for impact? I remember being in the Philippines and meeting with the Minister of Finance and Planning, and, and he wasn't asking me um, in my role for assistance. He was asking me, tell me what works that my government can invest in. So I think if we have, if we have these solutions, um, and then you know all of the other other pieces. That's what's that's what's really critical for us to have impact, for us to be for it to be a scale, 
for there to be the partnerships and coordination necessary and ultimately um, about solutions that are durable. Uh, time, time flies when you're learning a lot. Um, I just looked at the clock. Uh, may, we maybe have time for one, uh, maybe two questions if, if the panelists would respond in probably 30 seconds. So are there hands or did we pass out the microphone at all? Uh, yeah, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, super. Thank you, Errol. It's, uh, my name is Brian with, with IOM. It's great to see my big boss on the screen. Uh, and uh, just, it, it, it was a couple of things, and I, I'll make it super brief. It, something innovative about dealing with displacement is it not happening in the first place. Uh, and that's about social cohesion programming or local governments and community programming. And it may be an intervention works. So how, how do we deal with that proving the absence of a negative issue? Because something didn't happen, so we need more money to make sure it continues not to happen. <laughs> right? That, that's a real tough sell. And I, everyone's accountable. If we have funding from aid, they have to go back to Congress. Every, there's all the level of, uh, uh, of accountability. So in fact, I'll just keep it to that one question. And yeah. Something we wrap our heads around. Oh. Yeah, so panelists, uh, I'm going to ask you to prove the counterfactual in 30 seconds or less. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. How, how do you um, think about this idea of, of prevention, which is something that we haven't talked about, so thanks, Brian, for bringing that up. Um, maybe what we can do is go Edwin and then Megan and last word to Igochi before we rewrap. So Edwin? Sure. Just, just a, a quick answer is, um, like in Ethiopia, we're doing a project called Trade for Peace where we're using um, economic empowerment for two potentially warring communities with the premise that if they trade together and find mutual benefits from the business uh, space, then it, it has shown a lot of increase in social cohesion. Uh, and this is for the South Sudanese uh, refugees in Gambela, where it's, it's, mal, it's, it's ethnic conflict that we have found a way that is a more solid connector, which is trade across the two communities. Over to you, Megan. Thanks for that. Megan? Um, Errol, I was really hoping you'd take more than one question because I really think that Brian's question is unanswerable and methodologically <laughs> problematic and gonna bother me. It's gonna keep me up tonight. So thanks so much, Brian, for the sleepless night ahead. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> how you do that. I mean, I think it's a really great question. And I think also relates to what Ugo said about the importance of pulling everything together. You know, we don't do innovation for the sake of it. We do it to achieve a particular goal. But I'm not sure that ending displacement is a viable goal. So even if it would be problematic for, for donors and for proof, I don't think it's realistic. And so maybe instead, we should think about how we define success and what actually we're aiming towards. And I think the answer to that is something like um, maintaining political will for addressing displacement and funding to the scale of need and providing opportunities for IDPs and refugees to become self-reliant as early as possible and also using funding to invest in the broader economic and policy environment to sort of expand um, the pool of economic opportunities for everyone. I mean, I think maybe instead of ending displacement, what's more realistic is that it could become a a non-deal, which is why I started with that point about the pragmatic approaches in Latin America and temporary protection in Europe, um, ways to absorb displaced populations that prevent a backlash and kind of make it a non-deal in the sense that uh, status doesn't become an issue, they have instant access to labor markets, integration can start from day one, and you know, the, the point about sponsorship models is that that helps communities feel bought into displacement as something they're helping to address instead of something that happens to them. So could displacement instead be a non-deal instead of not happen at all as a viable goal? Excellent points. Um, Iguchi, last word to you. Um, well, first of all, it's, it's about being able to measure impact well and there was a time uh you know and the trend was very um was very sexy going back to your sexy term and 
in many of the areas that we're talking where where we where we're dealing with cyclical um, displacement and secondary tertiary displacement. These are trends that have been going on for years. So it is possible to show that we have ended a trend, that we've broken a cycle. And I want to end where I started, and that's with what the populations themselves will define. I was speaking to women at a food distribution in South Sudan. They'd been displaced to, due to flooding, but prior to that, they'd been displaced, um, uh, displaced due to conflict. And what they wanted was not more assistance, but what they wanted was skills in alternative livelihoods so that wherever they were, they would be able to take care of themselves, take care of their children, take care of their family. So we need to be measuring, you know, we need to be able to speak to this in the terms that the, 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 those who are displaced are, um, are speaking about it. And if we are, you know, if, if, and through the work that IOM is doing, and this was in Ventu, at least we know that for this year, that those communities are not going to be displaced because of the preventive action that has been taken to mitigate against the impact of, um, of flooding, of, 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 of climate-induced, uh, uh, the impact of climate change um, on, on displacement. So the counterfactual is hard to prove, of course, but you know, let's keep this um, um, people-centered. Let's look at what the impact is. Let's see how to change the trends that displaced populations have been dealing with. And from all the data we know with regard to the impact of climate change, um, the displacement that will happen in the future, if, if people don't have solutions to stay, solutions to move, and solutions while they are on the move. And back to you, Errol. Uh, Iguchi, Edwin, Megan, I could talk to you about these issues all day, but alas, we have to make room for David Milband, who I just saw entered the building. So thanks to the three of you. This was really informative, really interesting. Audience, please join me in thanking uh, our panelists. And we'll see everyone back in six minutes, 20 after four Eastern time. Thanks again to the panelists. We're gonna get back to, um, uh, to the conference. First of all, um, thank you all. I have to say that this has been a wonderful day for me. I have learned a lot. But I am also amazed that in Washington um, on, a, on a regular warm afternoon in the summer, most, most times conferences have attrition. That's not really the case here. We're really impressed that this group has stayed and stayed to the end, and I think it will be well worth it. We are very pleased to have our final session of the day. Um, we are grateful that David Miliband is joining us in person to talk about innovation in the context of food security and other humanitarian challenges. But prior to his remarks, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Ab Abirdazak Yusuf Ahmed of the government of Somalia, the Ministry of Health, share a few observations about the situation on the ground in Mogadishu. Um, we are having some problems uh, with our cameras up here, so I'm going to invite the audience to turn and face the camera with the doctor. And I just wanted to say that he is a medical doctor who has been managing health services as part of relief and development activities for more than 10 years. Um, Doctor, uh, doctor, we are very grateful for your being here and taking the time um, as part of our innovation conference. We appreciate your joining us at such a late hour, too. So um, we wanted to start off this final panel of the day with asking you to provide a brief description of what you're seeing in hospitals in Mogadishu. And given your extensive experience, if you could speak to what some of the innovations are that you've seen 
or what, you, what your thinking or approaches that you think are required in the context of food security, malnutrition, and the health sectors. And with that, over to you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the organizing of this event. It's a very uh, great opportunity for me uh, to talk and to about the humanitarian situation, especially on malnutrition and uh, cases in Somalia. Uh, my name is Dr. Abdizak Yusuf, and uh, now I'm currently working for the Minister of Health as a team lead for health system advisor, and I'm also a director for a, a well-known public hospital uh, built by Italian government called Di Martino Public Hospital, uh, which is uh, uh, the one of the oldest hospitals in Somalia. Uh, 100 years ago. Uh, as maybe most of you know, uh, Somalia now is dealing with a severe drought. Uh, we are uh, close to have our full uh, 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 in, and this affects more than uh, 3.5 million people in Somalia. That's uh, throatist, uh, throatist and also also more disease and drugs that begin early in, in 2020 and continue with uh, worsening uh, through up to uh, this moment. And uh, this uh, more disease and drugs uh, uh, lead a further deterioration of the food security and nutrition situation across Somalia. Uh, the people in Somalia, they lost uh, their, uh, uh, their goods, especially the various people, the people uh, in the rural areas, they lost whatever they have. Before these droughts, they were rich by having uh, uh, camelous uh, goats, and, uh, uh, and and this is uh, in Somalia. Uh, it is uh, the people that who have uh, these animals are very rich. Unfortunately, uh, they they lost goods that uh, droughts, and most of them they they come to the urbanists and cities and has become an IDBs. Uh, I just want to give you uh, some ob observation about one hospital in Mogadishu, Somalia, the capital city of Somalia. We establish it when we see the increase of the malnutrition cases uh, and the need to have an one stabilization center that treating the patient, especially the malnourished child who was suffering from severe acute malnutrition. The hospital received uh, 721 uh, severe acute malnutrition cases for the last five months, starting uh, from February. Uh, compared to the last year, what we received the whole last year less than 300. So you can uh, uh, see the difference. So the, the cases in malnutrition was double. The cases that come into the hospital, they are not from Mogadishu, most of them. Uh, nearly 85% of them, they come from far regions. Uh, far south Somalia, like the uh, Tuba re region, Gido, by Bakol, and also far some central Somalia, like Gido. So they move it from uh, their area and, and they uh, have this malnutrition situations. Uh, and this also goes uh, if the health system over all the systems of Somalia become a negative impact for them because the health system uh, was not prepared enough for this emergency, for, for, for these droughts. And our secondary and tertiary healthcare uh, was uh, was not enough prepared to handle uh, such malnutrition cases because these uh, people they were suffering long-standing uh, lack of macro and micronutrients. Uh, the mothers they were suffering uh, they were un un undernourished. They were not having uh, micronutrients like iron, uh, vitamins, and they carried babies. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and they delivered a, a malnourished inventories, and this also uh, increased the mortality rates, uh, the mortality uh, issue. Alongside with this uh, malnutrition issues that comes up with droughts, the, uh, the routine primary health care also was a challenge in Somalia. The health sector in Somalia is totally nearly 100% dependent on both donors. The hospitals and primary healthcare facilities in Somalia, they are dependent on projects um, and it's based on programs. And due to COVID-19, provision of essential healthcare services was an issue for the last uh, two years. And 
that issue alongside with the effect of drugs deteriorated uh, uh, the situation of primary health care and the situation of health system in Somalia. Uh, especially this affecting children and also uh, affecting the, the children that have comorbidities. Maybe the children have chronic diseases, the children that have congenital anomalies, the children that may have another uh, diseases, uh, also uh, uh, this malnutrition uh, effect is uh, uh, increasing the, uh, the morbidity and mortality issues. In, Focusing in our hospital, uh, the total pediatric OBD consultation increased enormously, and nearly 10,271 patients uh, uh, come to the hospital, uh, and 1,600 of uh, uh, sorry, 1,579 patients was admitted to the hospital, and, uh, and provision of all their needs was also a great challenge. And the mortality. Of these, of these children, unfortunately, was high. Uh, we calculated as six percent, uh, which is makes the worst situation ever happened uh, in the last uh, uh, six or seven years, starting from 2005. Uh, so now, what we are doing is just uh, ensuring access to the, to the healthcare, ensuring provision of quality uh, uh, secondary health services to the children who have comorbidities and also ensuring and to provide a primary health care, to ensuring to provide a therapeutic feeding program, program and ensuring also to educate mothers how to feed their children um, um, for such situation and, and habits. And uh, compared to the other drugs, uh, we uh, now see that this drug is more serious because it was continuing for the last four seasons and the, now the good season, which is the rainy season, we started uh, March uh, and April and May uh, was less than uh, what we was expecting. The rainy season also uh, did not come adequately uh, and, and deteriorated the, the situation. Uh, and everybody knows that an adequate well-balanced diet is, is the bedrock of child survival. It's the bedrock for child for the health and development of. And I would say that also well nourished children are more, more likely to be healthy, productive, and also uh, be ready to learn. So these children in Somalia, uh, they are uh, uh, lacking uh, opportunity. Malnutrition is also persistent in Somalia, not only for the droughts, also for the ongoing conflicts, long standing conflicts, the collapse of the basic uh, provision of social services collapse of, of the provision of basic primary and secondary healthcare services. Uh, uh, UNICEF said in 2018, more than 1.2 million children of Somalia suffered malnutrition. And, uh, and also saying the more children will suffer in up to 2023 Somalia. Uh, so the ongoing conflict and those also uh, uh, causing uh, malnutrition. Malnutrition also linked directly to the infantis uh, and young child uh, because of the, of the pregnancy. Uh, in, if a pregnant woman uh, is malnourished, the child is more likely uh, to be born unweight, uh, and, uh, underweight, and also uh, to be undernourished, and also to be uh, susceptible for uh, preventable diseases. Um, that's, I think, what I would like to uh, explain the situation in. In Somalia, uh, especially in South and Central Somalia, uh, and uh, we are uh, advocating uh, to the lesson learned, you know, to, to mitigate and manage such situations. Uh, it needs uh, a coordination, effective coordination, and, and also it needs a strategic planning uh, that government is part, the government partners. Uh, civil societies and the people come, to get, come together and have a plan that uh, elaborates the key interventions needed and also elaborates the key uh, 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 preparedness plans that, that needs. Those should include providing uh, uh, essential health care services, providing the routine pri primary health care service, and also providing the therapeutic feeds program to treat 
acute malnourished children, and also to provide the micronutrients such like as vitamins and iron uh, to prevent uh, uh, mo uh, long morbidities and also to prevent uh, immortality. Uh, and, uh, and also to, uh, to increase the awareness of such situation, uh, to advocate to the partners, to, uh, to, uh, the, to most needed population, and also to promote and support uh, 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 this such cooperation, uh, and also to have such a plan on health seeking behaviors with eating mothers and children and teaching them uh, breastfeeding attitudes, and also teaching them also the other feeding attitudes. Uh, that was my intervention, and I am ready to. To answer if you have a few questions. Thank you so much. Dr. Ahmed, I hope you can hear the clapping um, in the room. We really very much appreciate your insights and also Thank for the so incredibly much. critical work that you're doing under very trying circumstances. Thank you so much and for our staying up so late in order to be able to speak with us. Thank you again. So now um, I realized I failed to introduce myself. My name is Sue Eckert. I am a senior fellow here with the Humanitarian Agenda. And we now have our final speaker. Uh, as president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee, David Miliband oversees the agency's humanitarian operations in more than 40 war-affected countries. Uh, and his refugee and the refugee resettlement and assistance programs in over 20 United States cities. Um, I think it was a former president who referred to him as one of the ablest, most creative public servants of our time. Um, and so without uh, further introduction, the right uh, Honorable David Miliband. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for staying here. It wouldn't be the same if I was just standing here talking to Sue. It would have been great talking to Sue, but to have some people here is great, um, and obviously online as well. And uh, Dr. Abdul Razak, we are so honored at the International Rescue Committee to be partnering with you. Uh, I know that some of my colleagues have come to visit your clinic, which we're supporting in Mogadishu uh, recently, and we're completely inspired by the work that you're uh, doing. Um, and I thought it was really important before I spoke about our perspective on innovation and the food security crisis to hear from the front line about what's actually happening on the ground, because all of the experienced humanitarian aid workers that we employ in Somalia, in Kenya, and in Ethiopia are saying that the most fundamental lessons of the last decade about how innovation should be deployed to prevent and then to respond to crisis are not being used effectively at the moment. And so, uh, as well as thanking CSAS and uh, obviously USAID as well for sponsoring this uh, event, I want to, in a way, uh, turn upside down the way in which you've been discussing innovation today. If I, as I looked at the agenda, I thought you had a very broad agenda, looking at the private sector, looking at uh, how uh, gender perspectives should be brought into innovation, looking at the role of technology, and then thinking about different problems that it could address. What I want to do is take one very acute set of problems around the food security crisis, uh, in East Africa and ask how should innovation be applied to address it. And I think that the starting point has to be to try and take some of the statistics that the doctor has just given you and apply them at a rather larger level. And I just want you to think about this. The three countries, Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya, they represent 2% of the global population and they represent 70% of extreme food insecurity, in other words, IPC level five. Those three countries, or what's happening in those three countries at the moment, also represents a cautionary tale about what happens when we fail to marry innovation in the humanitarian sector with action by policymakers. And I'm gonna race through my remarks in the next 15 minutes or so to leave time for, for questions. The doctor, it's 11, 40, I think, in Mogadishu at the moment. He's still he's staying up, so maybe we can address questions to him uh, as well. But I think this is a crisis that is a test not just of the humanitarian 
system, the development system, it's also a test of wider international politics. Look, here's the, the essence of the, the problem as I see it. The, the, I mean, food insecurity doesn't really conjure up the depth of the uh, crisis when 20 million people are in l extreme levels of uh, hunger in those three uh, countries, the phrase food insecurity. But, and that's obviously an intolerable uh, burden on the people of Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia. But it's also a stain on the international system because the advances in disaster forecasting, probably everyone here knows about FuseNet and the WFP, the World Food Program Hunger Map. They've given us the tools to preempt and prevent famine, not just react to its declaration. And that's why my call today is for all of us, whether you're from a government donor, whether you're from a think tank, a UN agency, a UN member state, or from an NGO, is to address the threat of famine by looking through the windshield, not through the rear view mirror. Because the truth is, once a famine is declared, it's too late for too many people. And as Dr. Abdi Razak has made clear, we know enough to take action now. When we suggested uh, this session for this conference, we didn't know that Samantha Powell would be at the CISIS yesterday uh, with a very welcome announcement of a $1.2 billion US funding commitment. Um, but we also know that money needs to get into the field. It doesn't just need to be announced. And we also know that other donors need to follow suit and that implementers need to use the best practices on the ground to reach those who are hardest to reach. The announcement of the funds that Samantha Power made yesterday, in other words, is a very important first step, but it can't be the last step. And although I'm based in New York uh, as the CEO of the IRC, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from Brooklyn, um, I'm from the UK, and uh, when I speak about other donors, th this, the following statistic is chilling. The UK contribution to fighting famine in East Africa is one-fifth of what the UK did in 2016-17, and that shows the scale of the international problem, because while US leadership is important, it's not sufficient. You can't expect the US to do everything. What I want to do is just run through this, the current situation in East Africa as we see it, what's caused it, and then what needs to be done. We've been working there as the IRC for over 40 years in those three countries. We know the ebbs and flows of humanitarian uh, challenge. And for the first time ever today, we are putting out a supplement to our annual emergency watch list. This, this document comes out in December. For the first time ever today, we're publishing a supplement because of the gravity of the crisis in East Africa. And it's a supplement that focuses on the issues of food insecurity. It's on our website. I hope people will go and uh, visit, read it at rescue.org. But just some of the statistics that come uh, out of it. There are long-term structural factors that are causing this crisis. Conflict, climate change, most obviously. But these countries have also been disproportionately affected by the Ukraine conflict because they were reliant on Russia and Ukraine for 90% of their wheat imports. Rising prices have made food unaffordable. The reason that the doctor has many more malnourished children coming to his, to his uh, clinic is not just the difficulties of food production in drought-stricken areas. It's also that food that's in the markets is unaffordable. The cost of a food basket has risen by 66% in Ethiopia and 36% in Somalia since last year. According to IRC's clients, prices for staples like sugar, cooking oil, and grains have tripled. And it's worth pointing out that while Ukraine represents 5% of global humanitarian need, it's receiving 20% of global humanitarian need aid. As a result, the number of people going hungry in the region is set to surpass the 20 million figure that I mentioned earlier, double compared to 2021 levels. 12% of people in need worldwide, 12% of the world's malnourished children live in those three countries. And the worst effects are in Somalia. We believe that the current famine could be twice as bad as the 2011 famine, which killed 260,000 people. Our teams on the ground report that people have already started dying from starvation and from the associated diseases, the vulnerabilities that go with it. And hunger is worsening week by week. Since April, 
the number of people facing famine conditions in Somalia has risen 160%. And of course, when famine hits, it's a children's crisis. 7.1 million children in East Africa are acutely malnourished. Nearly half of all children in Somalia at levels three, four, and five on the IPC index. Now, in 2011, the UN declaration of famine came months too late. At least half of all the deaths during the famine had occurred by the time the famine was declared. It was clear that there needed to be earlier action, and that was the innovation that took place. It was meant to ensure that we would, not see, that we would see these famines coming and preempt them. Since 2020, the innovation part of the system has actually worked. Early warning systems have accurately identified deteriorating conditions across East Africa. Improvements in climate tracking and drought prediction have helped us see this crisis coming miles away. But the innovation we've seen in climate data and predictive analysis has, has not prevented the crisis because the alarm bells that should have been ringing have not catalyzed action. There are three aspects to the failure, and I think it's really important to be clear about it. The first is a failure of prevention because social safety nets weren't scaled up, disaster preparedness and resilience building initiatives have not been at scale, and anticipatory action has been limited. Second, there's been a failure of mitigation and response. The international systems that are meant to respond to crises like these have failed to mobilize at the speed and size required. And part of this is about funding. I mean, the World Food Program has been forced to suspend malnutrition programs in Somalia and cut in half food rations for refugees in Ethiopia and Kenya. That's a funding question that's forced those impossible decisions. But it's also been a failure of political will. While the US has made significant funding commitments, including almost half of the $4.4 billion that was pledged by the G7 in June, we haven't seen the sort of coordinated global response that's necessary. And that's why today I want to put on the table four essential and urgent actions that are needed, and I think pick up some of the themes of this conference, although obviously can't do justice to all of them. The first is that we need to see an activation of the humanitarian system. I mean, it seems ridiculous to say that that hasn't happened, but there hasn't been that full-scale activation yet. What does that require? It requires the declaration of a system-wide scale-up to mobilize resources and capacity for an emergency response. It requires a humanitarian contact group to assess progress and allocate resources so that we act as a proper system, not just a sector of disparate organizations working in their own way. We need donor coordination mechanisms with NGOs, not separate from them, clarification of leadership and lines of accountability for response delivery, and the adoption and scale-up of proven solutions such as cash assistance and expanded safety net mechanisms. What's the innovation part of it? I think the innovation part of that is that accountability needs to flow downwards to clients, not just upwards to donors. Partnering, I think you've discussed this earlier today, partnering with women-led civil society organizations is critical to this, particularly because a food security crisis is one where women and girls are disproportionately affected by them and yet are uniquely placed also to respond to them. In all of our programs, we say it's very important to take account of the inequalities that face women and girls and then to design programs in ways that seek to mitigate them. So we need to activate the humanitarian response system. Second, we need a no regrets approach to funding. This doesn't just mean fund it, fully funding the $4.4 billion of appeal. It means rapidly dispersing funding to national, international, and local responders, and critically ensuring funding is flexible and not bureaucratic, including by providing top-ups to current implementing partners doing other projects that they could uh, pivot towards the food crisis. I was really pleased yesterday to see or to hear, or to read, in fact, uh, Samantha Power emphasizing that while food aid is vital, it must be matched with urgent support for life-saving health, water and sanitation, and related activities. Because, of course, it's not just malnutrition that kills you, it's the associated diseases that go with it. 
And what's the innovation in this area? Well, last uh, week, the uh, funding caucus that was put together to support the grand bargain that was supposed to come out of the 2016 World Humanitarian Summit uh, committed a range of players in the humanitarian system, donors, UN agencies, and implementers, to scale up multi-year funding. Why is that important and how does that relate to this? We're proud at the IRC to be the largest impact evaluation agency in the humanitarian sector. And one of the things that we've studied is how much greater is the effectiveness in a multi-year funding program than in a short-term funding program. Listen to this. An analysis of two IRC cash programs in Somalia found that the longer-term programming, one that was more than two years compared to one that was six months, cost 44% less in delivery for every dollar transferred. In other words, there's 44% more money to reach more people. Multi-year financing is ensuring that, can ensure that more money ends up in the hands of more Somalis or more Kenyans or more Ethiopians. And that difference might be, and that gain might be the difference between being able to feed your family or not. Third, the doctor explained that he uh, works for the, for the government. But we also know that there are people who, are, who, who live outside the remit of governments. That's why the very difficult issue of access negotiations with opposition and armed groups needs to be taken on by our community because we are not political, we are independent, we are neutral, we are non-partisan. And that means that wherever you live, if you're in humanitarian need, you have a right to have your needs met. Last year, there was agreement to set up a UN special advisor on humanitarian access, but the post hasn't been funded because member states blocked it during the UN budget committee negotiations. These kind of roles to work for access are absolutely critical at, at times like this in countries like those that I am discussing. This, it's also important that the Security Council and member states, including the US, carefully weigh the humanitarian fallout of any new counter-terrorism designations. We know that the US designation of al-Shabaab in 2011 created serious obstacles to the famine response in that year. We can avoid repeating those mistakes with clearer humanitarian exemptions. Fourth and, and finally, we need to address the global trade challenges stemming from the war in Ukraine. And there is active diplomacy uh, on this to try to address the consequences of the Russian uh, blockade of the ports of Odessa uh, of the port of Odessa in southern Ukraine. But we also need to look at other avenues as well, which will never be as large as the impact of opening up the waterways. But frankly, train and overland exports via Poland or restoring river ports on the Danube could also play an important role in getting grain out of silos where they're currently trapped. I just want to finish off in the, in the last few minutes by just saying drawing attention to two things which are not an immediate answer. They're not going to make a difference um, overnight, though actually the first one really, I feel passionately, could make more of a difference. Um, but there are two things that at the International Rescue Committee we're working on and which begin to address the structural issues that I referenced at the beginning and didn't have time to uh, talk about. The first is about climate, actually it's the second that I think is shorter term, the first is longer term, and that's to do with climate resilient agriculture. Um, we need more investment and innovation to support the resilience of agro-pastoralist livelihoods. I mean, it's one of the cruelest, it's not an irony, it's, a, it's almost a crime. The people in the world who've contributed the least to the climate crisis are most exposed to its consequences and least supported in adapting to, the, to its to its uh, impact. At the IRC, we're pioneering some new innovations in seed security, information access, and disaster risk reduction. Our aim in these shifts is to reduce poverty and food insecurity by enabling people and institutions to absorb, adapt, and respond to shocks. One dollar spent on early response and resilience saves, according to our studies, three dollars in income and livestock losses. You discussed the private sector earlier today, and that has an important role to play in some of these marginalized and vulnerable communities. For example, in Cote d'Ivoire, 
we're partnering with a cotton sourcing company to work with young farmers to integrate them into the company's cotton supply chain and meaningfully invest in their skills and in their businesses. The project has allowed us to negotiate improved access for them to productive land. Critically, the private sector supports the youth participants with technical training and access to quality inputs on a credit basis, followed by ongoing support through farmers' groups and markets. That is cr climate resilience programming, and we need more of it. The second, and the doctor referred to severe acute malnutrition, but we've piloted and pioneered an approach that combines the assessment and the protocols for severe acute malnutrition with those for moderate acute malnutrition. It's the same disease. Moderate acute malnutrition and severe acute malnutrition are the same disease but different degrees of severity. And we've also shown how empowering carers, parents and carers in their communities are a way of diagnosing and treating acute malnutrition because you don't need to get to a health center to do the diagnosis of a malnourished child. I would say that no innovation is more essential now than our call for a combined simplified protocol for malnutrition treatment. And why? Because in the system that is split between severe acute malnutrition and moderate acute malnutrition, 80%, 80% of acutely malnourished kids under the age of five get no help at all from the mainstream system. A growing body of evidence led by our research shows that a simplified combined protocol alongside family diagnosis and treatment delivery by community health workers are as effective as the intensive healthcare center or hospital-based approaches in diagnosing and treating both moderate and se severe acute malnutrition. And obviously because they're in the community, they're much more efficient and effective at reaching people. Those are structural solutions that will take time, and I think it's important to put them on the table. For now, we need action, not planning. Given the system failure that we've seen, that would in itself be an innovation, because at the moment, we're wasting the innovations that have taken place. Thank you very much indeed. Do you want me to, shall I do the questions, or do you want yeah. to? Um, I think we, we are running over time, um, but I, he, we're gracious uh, to have questions for our two panelists. So um, we do have, where are the mics? Great, right over here, please. And I think we ha can have one more, um, and then we'll have to bring it to a close. Okay, yeah. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Abdul Razak and Mr. Maliban for uh, the introduction. Uh, my name is Yasmin Higo, I'm German-Ethiopian and I work at the World Bank a couple of blocks away on food and nutrition security. And my question is, so you talked about the reliance of many African countries on, for example, Ukrainian wheat. Um, one could make the case that there needs to be an increase in intra-African trade um, so that these reliances um, uh, do not occur again. So you talked a bit about structural or like long-term um, interventions such as uh, investing in agri-food innovations, but my question is, do you, like, would you also agree that um, increase in intra-African trade um, is a way out to prevent this? And how would, how, like, how would um, NGOs or like, how would you approach it from an NGO perspective um, to, to also support in that? Thank you. First of all, it's a, it's a very important point, and I, I completely agree with you. Obviously, we are treating the victims or the symptoms of a failed system, and you're trying to build um, a stronger and more sustainable system. And it must be right that dependence for 90% of Somalia or Ethiopia or Kenya's grain on Ukraine makes no sense at all, given the potential across the African continent to be a source of its own um, uh, of its own crops. Now. On the macroeconomics, you've got a much bigger role to play than the NGOs, I, I would respectfully say. But on the, at the micro level, I do think trusted NGOs, an NGO like ours, we may be headquartered in New York, but 99% of the people we employ are local people. Uh, they're trusted in the communities in which they uh, work. And some of the partnering we've done, for example, with the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, um, or that we're, we're, we're now uh, rolling out actually in, in, in Jordan is about making sure that NGOs play their role in building community trust, making sure that community consultation means something. Uh, but obviously that doesn't substitute for the macroeconomics. 
And when it comes to intra-African trade, that's going to have to be negotiated between uh, the governments. But I think it's, it's a structural point and a very good point. I'm keen to get a question for the doctor because he's stayed up and it's now past midnight. So I hope the next uh, question can be for the doctor. The question is about the famine. Famine has become a political case. In other words, it's like the genocide. It takes so much to declare it that by the time we declare it, I think it's so obvious. Is that part of the problems that we're facing? And if so, how do we mitigate that? Well, you probably know that Amartya Sen wrote the book about famine I think in 50 years ago, and he made the point that famines are, are political, famines are not natural, they are man-made. Um, and obviously famine is IPC level five. Um, food insecurity, that rather um, inadequate word, applies to th levels three, four, and five. And I thought when Samantha Power spoke here yesterday, she sp spoke about crisis being level three, emergency being level four, and catastrophe being level Five. And I think that um, the rhetoric around famine has been uh, politicized, uh, but I, I, I do think that there is, a, um, there is a way out of this, which is that your point that there's politics sits alongside the point that famine is restricted to IPC level five, but my point was we shouldn't wait for IPC level five to be declared before taking the action that's necessary. And that's why triggering the humanitarian response at level three and four is so essential. By the time level five is declared, it's too late. And the doctor may want to uh, speak to the human misery that he's uh, seeing, because he, also, he, he pointed out people are traveling into Mogadishu from outside. I mean, there's displacement associated with it. But certainly from, uh, from our perspective, waiting for famine before you take action makes no sense at all. And that's, I think, the job of... Uh, uh, politics, really, to, to, to blow the whistle earlier um, and, and call for responsibility to be fulfilled. Doctor, do you want to come in on that? <clears throat> Thank you so much. I just want to say uh, one thing. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the medical perspective. Uh, now we are really in the consequence of, in the consequence of what's uh, already happening because of the people, especially the children, they are not taking enough food, both in terms of quantity and variety and skills uh, that we are dealing with. But we realize that there should be actions done before we come to the situation, uh, uh, in terms of security, in terms of finance and economic. This situation is, is more or less linked to the poverty or enhancing to the SDGs uh, dealing with poverty and enhancement of the economics, uh, 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 the, the trades may be may come to to the portion of the prevention as, uh, as I think. But uh, I really agree with that when we declare the famine, that situation and the crisis is it's not un it's uncontrollable as we are now facing, uh, and the mortality case of the effective man is high. Imagine at the beginning of this uh, center that's supporting IRC and I, I, and we are so much grateful partnering with IRC, they are supporting us not only in this hospital and also some other parts in Somalia. Before that, the mortality rate was reached more than 15%. Uh, you know, so such intervention is, is uh, uh, become a life saving. Suppose what if we do some actions before? the famine come, before the, the drought starts, uh, we could maybe save more lives. That was my, my. Dr. Abdir Dazak, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. I wanted to say a special thank you for David Miliband for being here, um, and I want you all to join me in thanking them for their leadership, both of them, and passionate advocacy on behalf of the world's uprooted and poor people in need.
it is, it is time to close the conference today, and so I just wanted to make a few thank yous to, first of all, the uh, panelists uh, who gave so much of their time, the moderators, but particularly the participants and the great questions that we've had from the floor today. Um, it was a really interesting and informative event, and I hope that it is the beginning of the dialogue which we can continue. We also want to thank the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance at Aid for their support. But um, I also just want to take a moment and acknowledge that our leader and the, the person who conceived of this idea and put it into effect is Jake Kurtzer, the director of the humanitarian agenda here at CSIS. And while he is not going to be physically here in Washington much longer, he is, as you heard, going to Dar es Salaam very shortly. Um, some of us think it's just going to be CSIS Dar es Salaam, but um, I would think that we deserve just a special thanks to Jake for his leadership on these issues for over the years. And Jake, if you want to say a few words, um, please come up. But thank you to Jake. sir for your comments and thank you all for being here I don't I don't want to say a few words I think we've heard a lot um, from a lot of people today and I'm um, I just want to say I say this at the end of every single event we have private or public we want to hear from you um, we at CSIS uh, I think have a great privilege that we have a reputation and a capacity as a convening space um, and we take that seriously and I think that for the humanitarian agenda um, as Sue said we want to hear from you um, about the ideas, the things that came up today, um, how we can work together, what we can do better to help move the needle on this conversation, on financial access, which we work on quite extensively, on US policy, on the global humanitarian policy. So please be in touch with us. Um, and uh, let's give a, another round for uh, Mr. Miliband and for all of our panelists today.